One Shot by James Blish. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. One Shot by James Blish. On the day that the Polish freighter Ludmilla laid an egg in New York Harbor, Abner Longman's One Shot Brown was in the city going about his normal business which was making another million dollars. As we found out later, almost nothing else was normal about that particular weekend for Brown. For one thing, he had brought his family with him, a complete departure from routine, reflecting the unprecedentedly legitimate nature of the deals he was trying to make. From every point of view, it was a bag weekend for the CIA to mix into his affairs, but nobody had explained that to the master of the Ludmilla. I had better add here that we knew nothing about this until afterward. From the point of view of the storyteller, an organization like Civilian Intelligence Associates gets to all its facts backwards. Entering the tale at the payoff, working back to the hook, and winding up with a sheaf of background facts to feed into the computer for next time. It's rough on the various people who've tried to fictionalize what we do, particularly for the lazy examples of the breed, who come to us expecting that their plotting has already been done for them. But it's inherent in the way we operate, and there it is. Certainly nobody at CRA so much as thought of Brown when the news first came through. Harry Anderton, the Harbor Defense Chief, called us at 0830 Friday to take on the job of identifying the egg. This was when our records show us officially entering the affair, but of course, Anderton had been keeping the wires to Washington steaming for an hour before that, getting authorization to spend some of his money on us. Our clearance status was then and is now C and R, clean and routine. I was in the central office when the call came through and had some difficulty in making out precisely what Anderton wanted of us. Slow down, Colonel Anderton, please, I begged him. Two or three seconds won't make that much difference. How did you find out about this egg in the first place? The automatic compartment bulkheads on the Ludmilla were defective, he said. It seems that this egg was buried among a lot of other crates in the dump cell of the hold. What's a dump cell? It's a sea lock for getting rid of dangerous cargo. The bottom of it opens right to Davy Jones. Standard fitting for ships carrying explosives, radioactives, anything that might act up unexpectedly. All right, I said, go ahead. Well, there was a timer on the dump cell floor, set to drop the egg when the ship came up the river. That worked fine, but the automatic bulkheads that are supposed to keep the rest of the ship from being flooded while the cells open didn't. At least they didn't do a thorough job. The Ludmilla began to list, and the captain yelled for help. When the harbor patrol found the dump cell open, they called us in. I see, I thought about it a moment. In other words... You don't know whether the Ludmilla really laid an egg or not. That's what I keep trying to explain to you, Dr. Harris. We don't know what she dropped, and we haven't any way of finding out. It could be a bomb. It could be anything. We're sweating everybody on board the ship now, but it's my guess that none of them know anything. The whole procedure was designed to be automatic. All right. We'll take it, I said. You've got divers down? Sure, but... We'll worry about the butts from here on. Get us a direct line from your barge to the big board here, so we can direct the work. Better get on over here yourself. Right. He sounded relieved. Official people have a lot of confidence in the CIA. Too much, in my estimation. Some day the job will come along that we can't handle, and then Washington will be kicking itself, or, more likely, some scapegoat, for having failed to develop a comparable government department. Not that there was much prospect of Washington's doing that. Official thinking had been running in the other direction for years. The precedent was the Associated Universities Organization, which ran Brookhaven. CIA had been started the same way, by a loose corporation of universities and industries, all of which had wanted to own an Ultimac, and no one of which had had the money to buy one for itself. The Eisenhower administration with its emphasis on private enterprise and concomitant reluctance to sink federal funds into products of such size, had turned the two examples into a nice fat trend, which Ultimac herself said wasn't going to be reversed 
within the practicable lifetime of CIA. I buzzed for two staffers, and in five minutes got Clark Cheney and Joan Hadamard, CIA's business manager and social science division chief, respectively. The titles were almost solely for the benefit of the T.O. That is, Clark and Joan do serve in those capacities, but said service takes about 2% of their capacities and their time. I shot them a couple of sentences of explanation, trusting them to pick up whatever else they needed from the tape, and checked the line to the diver's barge. It was already open. Anderton had gone to work quickly and with decision once he was sure we were taking on the major question. The television screen lit, but nothing showed on but murky light, striped with streamers of darkness slowly rising and falling. The audio went crunk, oing, oing, bonk, oing. Underwater noises, shapeless and characterless. Hello out there in the harbor, this is CIA, Harris calling. Come in, please. Monarch here, the audio said. Boink, boing, boing. Got anything yet? Not a thing, Dr. Harris, Monog said. You can't see three inches in front of your face down here. It's too silty. We've bumped into a couple of crates, but so far no egg. Keep trying. Cheney, looking even more like a bulldog than usual, was sending his stopwatch by one of the eight clocks on Ultimax's face. Want me to take the divers, he said. No, Clark, not yet. I'd rather have Jane do it for the moment. I passed the mic to her. You'd better run a probability series first. Check. He began feeding tape into the integrator's mouth. What's your angle, Peter? The ship. I want to see how heavily shielded that dump cell is. It isn't shielded at all, Anderton's voice said behind me. I hadn't heard him come in. But that doesn't prove anything. The egg might have carried sufficient shielding in itself. Or maybe the commies didn't care whether the crew was exposed or not. Or maybe there isn't any egg. All that's possible, I admitted, but I want to see it anyhow. Have you taken blood tests? Joan asked Anderton. Yes. Get the reports through to me then. I want white cell counts, differentials, platelet counts, hematocrit, and sed rates on every man. Anderton picked up the phone, and I took a firm hold on the doorknob. Hey, Anderson said, putting the phone down again. Are you going to duck out just like that? Remember, Dr. Harris, we've got to evacuate the city first of all. No matter whether it's a real egg or not, we can't take the chance on its not being an egg. Don't move a man until you get a go-ahead from CIA, I said. For all we know now, evacuating the city may be just what the enemy wants us to do, so they can grab it unharmed. Or they may want to start a panic for some other reason, any one of 50 possible reasons. You can't take such a gamble, he said grimly. There are eight and a half million lives riding on it. I can't let you do it. You passed your authority to us when you hired us, I pointed out. If you want to evacuate without our okay, you'll have to fire us first. It'll take another hour to get that cleared from Washington, so you might as well give us the hour. He stared at me for a moment, his lips thinned. Then he picked up the phone again to order Joan's blood count, and I got out the door fast. A reasonable man would have said that I found nothing useful on the Ludmilla except negative information. But the fact is that anything I found would have been a surprise to me. I went down looking for surprises. I found nothing but a faint trail to Abner Longman's Brown, most of which was 15 years cold. There had been a time when I'd known Brown, briefly and to no profit to either of us, as an undergraduate majoring in social sciences. I'd taken on a term paper on the old International Longshoremen's Association, a racket-ridden union now formally extinct, although anyone who knew the signs could still pick up some traces on the docks. In those days, Brown had been the business manager of an insurance firm, the sole visible function of which had been to write policies for the ILA and its individual dock wallopers. For some reason, he had been amused by the brash youngster who had barged in on him and demanded the lowdown, and had shown me considerable lengths of ropes not normally in view of the public, nothing incriminating, but enough to give me a better insight into how the union operated than I had had any right to expect, or even suspect. Hence, I was surprised to hear somebody on the docks remark that Brown was in the city over the weekend. 
It would never have occurred to me that he still interested himself in the waterfront, for he'd gone respectable with a vengeance. He was still a professional gambler, and according to what he had told the Congressional Investigating Committee last year, took in thirty to fifty thousand dollars a year at it. But his gambles were no longer concentrated on horses, the numbers, or shady insurance deals. Nowadays, what he did was called investment, mostly in real estate. Realtors knew him well as the man who had almost bought the Empire State Building. The almost in the equation stands for the moment when the shoestring broke. Joan had been following his career, too, not because she had ever met him, but because for her, he was a type study and the evolution of what she called the extra-legal ego. With personalities like that, respectability is a disease, she told me. There's always an almost open conflict between the desire to be powerful and the desire to be accepted. Your ordinary criminal is a moral imbecile, but people like Brown are damned with a conscience, and sooner or later they crack trying to appease it. I'd sooner try to crack a Timken bearing, I said. Brown's ten points steal all the way through. Don't you believe it. The symptoms are showing all over him. Now he's backing Broadway plays, sponsoring beginning actresses, joining playwrights groups, He's the only member of Bushkin and Brush who's never written a play, acted in one, or so much as pulled the rope to raise the curtain. That's investment, I said. That's his business. Peter, you're only looking at the surface. His real investments almost never fail, but the plays he backs always do. They have to. He's sinking money in them to appease his conscience, and if they were to succeed, it would double his guilt instead of salving it. It's the same way with the young actresses. He's not sexually interested in them. His type never is, because living a rigidly orthodox family life is part of the effort towards respectability. He's backing them to pay his debt to society. In other words, they're talismans to keep him out of jail. It doesn't seem like a very satisfactory substitute. Of course it isn't, Joan had said. The next thing he'll do is go in for direct public service, giving money to hospitals or something like that. You watch. She had been right. Within the year, Brown had announced the founding of an association for clearing the Detroit slum area where he had been born, the plainest kind of symbolic suicide. Let's not have any more Abner Longman's Browns born down here. It depressed me to see it happen, for next on Joan's agenda for Brown was an entry into politics as a fighting liberal, a new dealer 20 years too late. Since I'm mildly liberal myself when I'm off duty, I hated to think what Brown's career might tell me about my own motives, if I'd let it. All of which had nothing to do with why I was prowling around the Ludmilla. Or did it? I kept remembering Anderton's challenge. You can't take such a gamble. There are eight and a half million lives riding on it. That put it up into Brown's normal operating area, all right. The connection was still hazy but on the grounds that any link might be useful, I phoned him. He remembered me instantly. Like most uneducated, power-driven men, he had a memory as good as any machine's. You never did send me that paper you are going to write, he said. His voice seemed absolutely unchanged, although he was in his seventies now. You promised you would. Kids don't keep the promises as well as they should, I said. But I've still got copies, and I'll see to it that you get one this time. Right now I need another favor. Something right up your alley. CIA business? Yes. I didn't know you knew I was with CIA. Brown chuckled. I still know a thing or two, he said. What's the angle? That I can't tell you over the phone, but it's the biggest gamble there ever was, and I think we need an expert. Can you come down to CIA's central headquarters right away? Yeah, if it's that big. If it ain't, I got a lot of business here, Andy, and I ain't going to be in town long. You sure it's top stuff? My word on it. He was silent a moment. Then he said, Andy, send me your paper. The paper, sure, but then I got it. I'd given him my word. You'll get it, I said. Thanks, Mr. Brown. I called headquarters and sent a messenger to my apartment to look for one of those long, dusty blue folders with the legal length sheets inside them, with orders to scorch it over to Brown without stopping to breathe more than once. Then I went back myself. 
The atmosphere had changed. Anderton was sitting by the big desk, clenching his fists and sweating. His whole posture telegraphed his controlled helplessness. Chaney was bent over a seismograph, echo sounding for the egg through the river bottom. If that even had a prayer of working, I knew, he'd have had the trains of the Hudson and Manhattan stopped. The rumbling course through their tubes would have blanked out any possible echo pip from the egg. Wild goose chase, Joan said, scanning my face. Not quite. I've got something. If I can just figure out what it is. Remember One Shot Brown? Yes. What's he got to do with it? Nothing, I said. But I want to bring him in. I don't think we'll lick this project before deadline without him. What good is a professional gambler on a job like this? He'll just get in the way. I looked toward the television screen, which now showed an amorphous black mass jutting up from a foundation of even deeper black. Is that operation getting you anywhere? Nothing's gotten us anywhere, Anderton interjected harshly. We don't even know if that's the egg. The whole area is littered with crates. Harris, you've got to let me get that alert out. Clark, how's the time going? Cheney consulted the stopwatch. Deadline in 29 minutes, he said. All right, let's use those minutes. I'm beginning to see this thing a little clearer. Joan, what we've got here is a one-shot gamble, right? In effect, she said cautiously, and it's my guess that we're never going to get the answer by diving for it. Not in time, anyhow. Remember when the Navy lost a barge load of shells in the harbor back in 52? They scrabbled for them for a year and never pulled up a one. They finally had to warn the public that if it found anything funny-looking along the shore, it shouldn't bang said object or shake it either. We're better equipped than the Navy was then, but we're working against a deadline. If you'd admitted that earlier, Anderton said hoarsely, we'd have half a million people out of the city by now, maybe even a million. We haven't given up, Colonel. The point is this, Joan. What we need is an inspired guess. Get anything from the prob series, Clark? I thought not. On a one-shot gamble of this kind, the laws of chance are no good at all. For that matter, the so-called ESP experiments showed us long ago that even the way we construct random tables is full of holes and that a man with a feeling for the essence of a gamble can make a monkey out of chance almost at will. And if there ever was such a man, brown is it. That's why I asked him to come down here. I wanted to look at that lump on the screen and play a hunch. You're out of your mind, Anderton said. A decorous knock spared me the trouble of having to deny, affirm, or ignore the judgment. It was brown. The messenger had been fast, and the gambler hadn't bothered to read what a college student had thought of him fifteen years ago. He came forward and held out his hand while the others looked him over frankly. He was impressive, all right. It would have been hard for a stranger to believe that he was aiming at respectability. To the eye, he was already there. He was tall and spare, and walked perfectly erect, not without spring despite his age. His clothing was as far from that of a gambler as you could have taken it by design. A black double-breasted suit with a thin vertical stripe, a gray silk tie with a pearl stick pin just barely large enough to be visible at all, a black Hamburg, all perfectly fitted, all worn with proper casualness, one might almost say a formal casualness. It was only when he opened his mouth that one shot brown was in the suit with him. I come over as soon as your runner got to me, he said. What's the pitch, Andy? Mr. Brown, this is Joan Hadamard, Clark Cheney, Colonel Anderton. I'll be quick because we need speed now. A Polish ship has dropped something out in the harbor. We don't know what it is. It may be a hell bomb or it may be just somebody's old laundry. Obviously, we've got to find out which, and we want you to tell us. Brown's aristocratic eyebrows went up. Me? Hell, Andy, I don't know anything about things like that. I'm surprised with you. I thought CIA had all the brains it needed. Ain't you got machines to tell you answers like that? I pointed silently to Joan, who had gone back to work the moment the interdictions were over. She was still on the mic to the divers. She was saying, What does it look like? It's just a lump of something, Dr. Hadamard. Can't even tell its shape. It's buried too deeply in the mud. Clunk. Oing. Oing. Try the Geiger. We did. Nothing but background. Scintillation counter? Nothing, Dr. Hadamard. Could be it's shielded. 
Let us do the guessing, Monig. All right, maybe it's got a clockwork fuse that didn't break with the impact, or a gyroscopic fuse. Stick a stethoscope on it and see if you pick up a ticking or anything that sounds like a motor running. There was a lag, and I turned back to Brown. As you can see, we're stymied. This is a long shot, Mr. Brown. One throw of the dice. One showdown hand. We've got to have an expert call it for us. Somebody with a record of hits on long shots. That's why I called you. It's no good, he said. He took off the Hamburg, took his handkerchief from his breast pocket, and wiped the hat band. I, I can't do it. Why not? It ain't my kind of thing, he said. Look, I never in my life run odds on anything that made any difference. But this makes a difference. If I guess wrong, then we're all dead ducks. But why should you guess wrong? Your hunches have been working for 60 years now. Brown wiped his face. No, you don't get it. I wish you'd listen to me. Look, my wife and my kids are in the city. It ain't only my life, it's theirs too. That's what I care about. That's why it's no good. On things that matter to me, my hunches don't work. I was stunned, and so I could see were Joan and Chaney. I suppose I should have guessed it, but it had never occurred to me. Ten minutes, Chaney said. I looked up at Brown. He was frightened, and again I was surprised without having any right to be. I tried to keep at least my voice calm. Please try it anyhow, Mr. Brown, as a favor. It's already too late to do it any other way, and if you guess wrong, the outcome won't be any worse than if you don't try at all. My kids, he whispered. I don't think he knew that he was speaking aloud. I waited. Then his eyes seemed to come back to the present. All right, he said. I told you the truth, Andy. Remember that. So, is it a bomb or ain't it? That's what's up for grabs, right? I nodded. He closed his eyes. An unexpected stab of pure fright went down my back. Without the eyes, Brown's face was a death mask. The water sounds and the irregular ticking of a Geiger counter seemed to spring out from the audio speaker, four times as loud as before. I could even hear the pen of the seismograph scribbling away until I looked at the instrument and saw that Clark had stopped it probably long ago. Droplets of sweat began to form along Brown's forehead and his upper lip. The handkerchief remained crushed in his hand. Anderton said, Of all the fool... Hush, Jones said quietly. Slowly, Brown opened his eyes. All right, he said. You guys wanted it this way? I say it's a bomb. He stared at us for a moment more, and then, all at once, the Timken bearing burst. Words poured out of it. Now you guys do something. Do your job like I did mine. Get my wife and kids out of there. Empty the city. Do something. Do something. Anderton was already grabbing for the phone. You're right, Mr. Brown, if it isn't already too late. Cheney shot out a hand and caught Anderton's telephone arm by the wrist. Wait a minute, he said. What do you mean, wait a minute? Haven't you already shot enough time? Cheney did not let go. Instead, he looked inquiringly at Joan and said, One minute, Joan. You might as well go ahead. She nodded and spoke into the mic. Monig, unscrew the cap. Unscrew the cap? The audio squawked. But, Dr. Hadamard, if that sets it off, it won't go off. That's the one thing you can be sure it won't do. What is this? Anderton demanded. And what's this deadline stuff, anyhow? The cap's off, Monag reported. We're getting plenty of radiation now. Just a minute. Yeah, Dr. Hadamard, it's a bum, all right. But it hasn't got a fuse. Now how could they have made a fool mistake like that? In other words, it's a dud, Joan said. That's right, a dud. Now at last, Brown wiped his face, which was quite gray. I told you the truth, he said grimly. My hunches don't work on stuff like this. But they do, I said. I'm sorry we put you through the ringer, and you too, Colonel, but we couldn't let an opportunity like this slip. It was too good a chance for us to test how our facilities would stand up in a real bomb drop. A real drop, Anderton said. Are you trying to say that CIA staged this? You ought to be shot, the whole pack of you. 
No, not exactly, I said. The enemy's responsible for the drop, all right. We got word last month from our man in Gdynia that they were going to do it and that the bomb would be on board the Ludmilla. As I say, it was too good an opportunity to miss. We wanted to find out just how long it would take us to figure out the nature of the bomb, which we didn't know in detail after it was dropped here. So we had our people in Gdynia defuse the thing after it was put on board the ship, but otherwise leave it entirely alone. Actually, you see, your hunch was right on the button as far as it went. We didn't ask you whether or not that object was a live bomb. We asked whether it was a bomb or not. You said it was, and you were right. The expression on Brown's face was exactly like the one he had worn while he had been searching for his decision, except that, since his eyes were open, I could see that it was directed at me. If this was the old days, he said in an ice-cold voice, I might have made the colonel's idea come true. I don't go for tricks like this, Andy. It was more than a trick, Clark put in. You'll remember we had a deadline on the test, Mr. Brown. Obviously, in a real drop, we wouldn't have all the time in the world to figure out what kind of a thing had been dropped. If we had still failed to establish that when the deadline ran out, we would have had to allow evacuation of the city, with all the attendant risk that that was exactly what the enemy wanted us to do. So? So we failed the test, I said. At one minute short of the deadline, Joan had the divers unscrew the cap. In a real drop, that would have resulted in a detonation if the bomb was real. We'd never risk it. That we did it in the test was a concession of failure, an admission that our usual methods didn't come through for us in time. And that means that you were the only person who did come through, Mr. Brown. If a real bomb drop ever comes, we're going to have to have you here as an active part of our investigation. Your intuition for the one-shot gamble was the one thing that bailed us out this time. Next time it may save eight million lives. There was quite a long silence. All of us, Anderton included, watched Brown intently, but his impassive face failed to show any trace of how his thoughts were running. When he did speak at last, what he said must have seemed insanely irrelevant to Anderton, and maybe to Cheney too, and perhaps it meant nothing more to Joan than the final clinical note in a case history. It's funny, he said. I was thinking of running for Congress next year, from my district, but maybe this is more important. It was, I believe, the sigh of a man at peace with himself. End of One Shot by James Blish Got a problem? Just pick up the phone. It solved them all and all the same way. To be or not to be. By Kurt Vonnegut Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Broderick Lesher. To be or not to be. By Kurt Vonnegut Jr. Everything was perfectly swell. There were no prisons, no slums, no insane asylums, no cripples, no poverty, no wars. All diseases were conquered, so was old age. Death, barring accidents, was an adventure for volunteers. The population of the United States was stabilized at 40 million souls. One bright morning, in the Chicago Lying In Hospital, a man named Edward K. Welling, Jr. waited for his wife to give birth. He was the only man waiting. Not many people were born a day any more. Welling was 56, a mere stripling in a population whose average age was 129. X-rays had revealed that his wife was going to have triplets. The children would be his first. Young Welling was hunched in his chair, his head in his hand. He was so rumpled, so still and colorless as to be virtually invisible. His camouflage was perfect, since the waiting room had a disorderly and demoralized air, too. Chairs and ashtrays had been moved away from the walls. The floor was paved with spattered drop cloths. The room was being redecorated. It was being redecorated as a memorial to a man who had volunteered to die. A sardonic old man, about 200 years old, sat on a stepladder, painting a mural he did not like. 
Back in the days when people aged visibly, his age would have been guessed at 35 or so. Aging had touched him that much before the cure for aging was found. The mural he was working on depicted a very neat garden. Men and women in white, doctors and nurses, turned the soil, planted seedlings, sprayed bugs, spread fertilizer. Men and women in purple uniforms pulled up weeds, cut down plants that were old and sickly, raked leaves, carried refuse to trash burners. Never, 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 not even in medieval Holland nor old Japan, had a garden been more formal, been better tended. Every plant had all the loam, light, water, air, and nourishment it could use. A hospital orderly came down the corridor, singing under his breath a popular song. If you don't like my kisses, honey, here's what I will do. I'll go see a girl in purple, kiss this sad world toodaloo. If you don't want my lovin', why should I take up all this space? I'll get off this old planet, let some sweet baby have my place. The orderly looked in at the mural and the muralist. Looks so real, he said. I can practically imagine I'm standing in the middle of it. What makes you think you're not in it? said the painter. He gave a satiric smile. It's called the Happy Garden of Life, you know. That's good of Dr. Hitz, said the orderly. He was referring to one of the male figures in white, whose head was a portrait of Dr. Benjamin Hitz, the hospital's chief obstetrician. Hitz was a blindingly handsome man. Lots of faces to still fill in, said the orderly. He meant that the faces of many of the figures in the mural were still blank. All blanks were to be filled with portraits of important people, on either the hospital staff or from the Chicago office of the Federal Bureau of Termination. Must be nice to be able to make pictures that look like something, said the orderly. The painter's face curled with scorn. You think I'm proud of this daub, he said. You think this is my idea of what life really looks like? What's your idea of what life looks like? said the orderly. The painter gestured at a foul drop cloth. There's a good picture of it, he said. Frame that, and you'll have a picture a damn sight more honest than this one. You're a gloomy old duck, aren't you? said the orderly. Is that a crime? said the painter. The orderly shrugged. If you don't like it here, Grandpa, he said, and he finished the thought with the trick telephone number that people who didn't want to live any more were supposed to call. The zero in the telephone number he pronounced not. The number was 2BR02B. The telephone number of an institution whose fanciful sobriquets included Automat, Birdland, Cannery, Catbox, De Louser, Easy Go, Goodbye Mother, Happy Hooligan, Kiss Me Quick, Lucky Pierre, Sheep Dip, Warring Blender, Weep No More, and Why Worry. To be or not to be was the telephone number of the municipal gas chambers of the Federal Bureau of Termination. The painter thumbed his nose at the orderly. When I decide it's time to go, he said. It won't be at the sheep dip. A do-it-yourselfer, eh? said the orderly. Messy business, Grandpa. Why don't you have a little consideration for the people who have to clean up after you? The painter expressed, with an obscenity, his lack of concern for the tribulations of his survivors. The world could do with a good deal more mess, if you ask me, he said. The orderly laughed and moved on. Welling, the waiting father, mumbled something without raising his head, and then he fell silent again. A coarse, formidable woman strode into the waiting room on spike heels. Her shoes, stockings, trench coat, bag, and overseas cap were all purple. The purple, the painter called, the color of grapes on Judgment Day. The medallion on her purple musette bag was the seal of the Service Division of the Federal Bureau of Termination, an eagle perched on a turnstile. 
the woman had a lot of facial hair. An unmistakable mustache, in fact. A curious thing about the gas chamber hostesses was that, no matter how lovely and feminine they were when recruited, they all sprouted mustaches within five years or so. Is this where I'm supposed to come? she said to the painter. A lot would depend on what your business was, he said. You aren't about to have a baby, are you? They told me I was supposed to pose for some picture, she said. My name's Leora Duncan, she waited. And you dunk people, he said. What? she said. Skip it, he said. That sure is a beautiful picture, she said. Looks just like heaven or something. Or something, said the painter. He took a list of names from his smock pocket. Duncan, 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 he said, scanning the list. Yes, here you are. You're entitled to be immortalized. See any faceless body here you'd like me to stick your head on? We've got a few choice ones left. She studied the mural bleakly. Gee, she said. They're all the same to me. I, I don't know anything about art. A body's a body, eh? he said. All righty. As a master of fine art, I recommend this body here. He indicated a faceless figure of a woman who was carrying dried stalks to a trash burner. Well, said Leor Duncan, that's more the disposal people, isn't it? I mean, I'm in service. I don't do any disposing. The painter clapped his hands in mock delight. You say you don't know anything about art, and then you prove in the next breath that you know more about it than I do. Of course, the sheave carrier is wrong for a hostess. A snipper, a pruner, that's more your line. He pointed to a figure in purple who was sawing a dead branch from an apple tree. How about her, he said. You like her at all? Gosh, she said, and she blushed and became humble. That, that puts me right next to Dr. Hitz. That upsets you, he said. Good gravy, no, she said. It's, it's just such an honor. Ah, you, you admire him, eh? He said. Who doesn't admire him, she said, worshipping the portrait of Dr. Hitz. It was the portrait of a tanned, white-haired, omnipotent Zeus, 240 years old. Who doesn't admire him, she said again. He was responsible for setting up the very first gas chamber in Chicago. Nothing would please me more, said the painter, than to put you next to him for all time. Sawing off a limb, that strikes you as appropriate? That is kind of like what I do, she said. She was demure about what she did. What she did was make people comfortable while she killed them. And, while Leora Duncan was posing for her portrait, into the waiting room bounded Dr. Hitz himself. He was seven feet tall, and he boomed with importance, accomplishments, and the joy of living. Well, Miss Duncan, Miss Duncan, he said, and he made a joke. What are you doing here, he said. This isn't where the people leave. This is where they come in. We're going to be in the same picture together, she said shyly. Good, said Dr. Hitz heartily. And, say, isn't that some picture? I sure am honored to be in it with you, she said. Let me tell you, he said. I'm honored to be in it with you. Without women like you, this wonderful world we've got wouldn't be possible. He saluted her and moved toward the door that led to the delivery rooms. Guess what was just born, he said. I can't, she said. Triplets, he said. Triplets, she said. She was exclaiming over the legal implications of triplets. The law said that no newborn child could survive unless the parents of the child could find someone who would volunteer to die. Triplets, if they were all to live, called for three volunteers. Do the parents have three volunteers? said Leon Duncan. Last I heard, said Dr. Hitz, they had one, and were trying to scrape together another two up. I don't think they made it, she said. Nobody made three appointments with us. Nothing but singles going through today, unless somebody called in after I left. What's the name? Welling, said the waiting father, 
sitting up, red-eyed and frowsy. Edward K. Welling, Jr. is the name of the happy father-to-be. He raised his right hand and looked at a spot on the wall, gave a hoarsely wretched chuckle. Present, he said. Oh, Mr. Welling, said Dr. Hitz, I didn't see you. The invisible man, said Welling. They just phoned me that your triplets have been born, said Dr. Hitz. They're all fine, and so is the mother. I'm on my way to see them now. Hooray, said Welling emptily. You don't sound very happy, said Dr. Hitz. What man in my shoes wouldn't be happy, said Welling. He gestured with his hands to symbolize carefree simplicity. All I have to do is pick out which of the triplets is going to live, then deliver my maternal grandfather to the happy hooligan and come back here with a receipt. Dr. Hitz became rather severe with Welling, towered over him. You don't believe in population control, Mr. Welling? He said. I think it's perfectly keen, said Welling tautly. Would you like to go back to the good old days, when the population of the Earth was 20 billion, about to become 40 billion, then 80 billion, then 160 billion? Do you know what a druplet is, Mr. Welling? said Hitz. Nope, said Welling sulkily. A druplet, Mr. Welling, is one of the little knobs, one of the little pulpy grains of a blackberry, said Dr. Hitz, without population control. Human beings would now be packed on the surface of this old planet like droplets on a blackberry. Think of it. Welling continued to stare at the same spot on the wall. In the year 2000, said Dr. Hitz, before scientists stepped in and laid down the law, there wasn't enough drinking water to go around, and nothing to eat but seaweed. And still, people insisted on their right to reproduce like jackrabbits, and their right, if possible, to live forever. I want those kids, said Welling quietly. I want all three of them. Of course you do, said Dr. Hitz. That's only human. I don't want my grandfather to die either, said Welling. Nobody's really happy about taking a close relative to the cat box, said Dr. Hitz, gently and sympathetically. I wish people wouldn't call it that, said Leor Duncan. What? said Dr. Hitz. I wish people wouldn't call it the cat box and things like that, she said. It gives people the wrong impression. You're absolutely right, said Dr. Hitz. Forgive me. He corrected himself, gave the municipal gas chambers their official title, a title no one ever used in conversation. I should have said Ethical Suicide Studios, he said. That sounds so much better, said Leora Duncan. This child of yours, whichever one you decide to keep, Mr. Welling, said Dr. Hitz, he or she is going to live on a happy, roomy, clean, rich planet, thanks to population control, in a garden like that mural there. He shook his head. Two centuries ago, when I was a young man, it was a hell that nobody thought could last another twenty years. Now centuries of peace and plenty stretch before us as far as the imagination cares to travel. He smiled luminously. The smile faded as he saw that Welling had just drawn a revolver. Welling shot Dr. Hitz in the head. There's room for one. A great big one, he said. And then he shot Leora Duncan. It's only death, he said to her as she fell. There, room for two. And then he shot himself, making room for all three of his children. Nobody came running. Nobody, seemingly, heard the shots. The painter sat on the top of his stepladder, looking down reflectively on the sorry scene. The painter pondered the mournful puzzle of life demanding to be born and, once born, demanding to be fruitful, to multiply and to live as long as possible, to do all that on a very small planet that would have to last forever. All the answers that the painter could think of were grim, even grimmer, surely, than a cat box, a happy hooligan, an easy go. He thought of war. He thought of plague. He thought of starvation. 
he knew that he would never paint again. He let his paintbrush fall to the dropcloths below. And then he decided he had had about enough of life in the happy garden of life too, and he came slowly down from the ladder. He took Welling's pistol, really intending to shoot himself, but he didn't have the nerve. And then he saw the telephone booth in the corner of the room. He went to it, dialed the well-remembered number, to be or not to be. Federal Bureau of Termination, said the very warm voice of a hostess. How soon could I get an appointment, he asked, speaking very carefully. We could probably fit you in late this afternoon, sir, she said. It might even be earlier if we get a cancellation. All right said the painter. Fit me in, if you please. And he gave her his name, spelling it out. Thank you, sir, said the hostess. Your city thanks you, your country thanks you, your planet thanks you. But the deepest thanks of all is from future generations. The End End of To Be or Not To Be by Kurt Vonnegut, Jr. Recorded by Broderick Lesher Easy Does It by E. G. Von Wald. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Easy Does It by E. G. Von Wald. Hal Weber leaned back in the soft form air executive seat. Although he twisted and shifted his position restlessly, he received the same sensation of perfect, comfortable support, no matter which way he sat in it, which was only natural, of course. Form air was the best suspend field furniture manufactured. As he squirmed about, he had a faint, puzzled frown on his face, and in his stomach he felt a lurking sensation of unaccustomed tension. Hal simply could not understand it. There was a faint humming sound as the door panel slid back. His father entered the office. Well, Hal, the old man murmured softly with a placid smile of satisfaction. We've done it. Done what? Oh, you mean the new coloration process? Yes, it will quintuple the net value of the family fortune within a year. We may be the richest people in the world then. That's nice, Hal said mildly. His father flicked a finger across a sensitive spot on the front of the desk and relaxed as a perfect form air attendant's chair sprang into existence to fit his gross, soft body. Yes, indeed, he said with a mild sigh. It's been a long, long time that we've been working for that. Worked mighty hard, too. That's right, murmured Hal, a little more forcefully than necessary. Splendid. His father's eyebrows rose at the unusual emphasis, but he was much too cultured to question the point. He continued along the lines of the conversation already started. We'll have to do something for Bruckner. He has been of tremendous assistance on that project. Did it practically all by himself. He is a very intelligent man, even if he is an outlander. Bruckner, said Howe with mild irritation. All I hear around here lately is Bruckner. What is he anyway? Nothing but a savage. Eh? said his father softly, raising his eyebrows again in polite inquiry. If Bruckner is such a brilliant fellow, why doesn't he take the treatment and become civilized? I sometimes get a little tired of an employee who tells me I'm wrong all the time. But he is almost always right when he makes such statements, Hal, Weber pointed out mildly. For instance, just the other day, I asked him about the color range to be used with the new process on the Form Air Sky Dome. He stated flatly that blue was a normal color for sky, just like that. I was a little startled, of course, at his lack of courtesy, but after I thought of it a while, blue did seem to be a nice color for sky. Ah, blue, Hal muttered. What's wrong with the green we've always used in the past? Mr. Weber sighed and squirmed a little to get the chair into a more comfortable fit. Attendance chairs were not quite as comfortable as the executive type even if they were form air. Then he cocked an eyebrow and looked at his son with mild concern. How, my boy, what's the trouble? 
I've never seen you so completely upset in all my life. I feel funny, murmured Hal. As a matter of fact, I feel awful. Maybe there's some connection. Ill? The old man nodded agreeably. Yes, I thought you looked at when I came in here. Something in the set of your mouth. Tight, sort of. With an expression of mild surprise, Hal reached up and tentatively felt around his mouth with a cleanly manicured forefinger. Son, Weber murmured, how long has it been since you had your last CC treatment? Eight years, Hal admitted. It's a little overdue, I suppose, but surely, his voice trailed off softly as his mind seized upon the possibility. That's probably what it is, Weber replied. That was a pretty definite statement for someone to make about another's sensations, but anyone could see that the old man was concerned over his son. Five years is the standard period at your age. Why haven't you taken it? Well, you know, Hal whispered, it's that new thing they have in it now. Ah, said his father with comprehension. That's right. I forgot all about that. A change. But you won't mind. Really, you won't. You just think you will. Perhaps so, Hal said, and hastily changed the subject of conversation to a less depressing topic. The new coloration process is a real success, you say? Absolutely. We can now provide flexible hue and chroma for the complete form air line. Air chair, air cab, and air dome. We'll be the only one who has it. And since every proprietor on the planet will want our new equipment as fast as we turn it out, we'll put every other firm completely out of the business. I've already worked out a method so that we can convert to export goods, too, without waiting for the economic balance to be readjusted. Of course, the colonies will have to curtail a little, but we don't have to concern ourselves with them. Yes, agreed Hal. Bruckner has been very useful to us on it, the old man repeated again. We'll have to show him we appreciate it. Hal's mouth tightened just perceptibly at the mention of the redoubtable engineer, but he said nothing. His father continued in his soft, mild voice. We must make him a present of something. Should it be money? Can't give him property, of course, because he isn't a citizen. I don't like the idea of giving an outlander money. They get their allotments, and that's enough wealth. If you give them money, they will be able to buy more than their allotment. And that could very easily upset our own economic balance, you know. Quite true, Weber agreed. Then he smiled with placid inspiration. I know. We'll give him fame. We'll name the process after him. Well, Hal said doubtfully, I guess that would do it. I think so. He's been a great help. As a matter of fact, though, most of the outlanders are helpful. A pity they won't take the treatments and become citizens. It seems sort of sad the way their emotions cut them up at times like old Tannen last month. Why, up to then he was almost like a civilized man, even without the treatments. I know, Hal said tonelessly. It was his son, wasn't it? Yes, curious that the old man should be so concerned over that little unpleasantness. So his son did get a little excited and kill a proprietor and was executed himself. No reason for his father to carry on so about it, is there? I tried to get him to take the treatment then, but, well, after all, you can hardly expect an uncivilized outlander to appreciate the advantages, can you? No, Hal did not refer to the fact that the new element recently put into the standard CC treatment was causing him to postpone taking it himself, but his father seemed to sense his thought. You won't mind it, son, really, you won't. The treatment will take care of the whole thing. It's perfectly obvious that you are suffering from the effects of the delay right at this moment. Oh, chaos, Hal swore softly. Why did they have to go and put that element in anyway? Now, Hal, you know better than that, his father chided him gently. It was either include a marital inclination or else go in for a complete program of artificial insemination. The women have a vote too, you know, and they wouldn't hear of it. They don't object to carrying a child for a few months. That's always been in their conditioning for some reason or another but they insisted that if they had to be mothers, the men would have to be fathers, 
and they insisted on a standard civilized marriage contract to cover the situation. I know, I know, I've heard all the arguments. Racial suicide and all. Nonsense. We can always import outlanders and force them to take the treatment. Outlanders, he pointed out with suitable, mild, cultured disgust, breed like animals. No, son, that wouldn't do the job. We have to keep the bloodline. Outlanders don't have it, you know. If they did, they would have permitted themselves to be civilized long ago. Hal's fingers drummed nervously on the desktop, and his father again raised an eyebrow in mild concern. He shook his head thoughtfully. Guiltily, Hal stopped his fingers from their satisfying tattoo. He bunched them into a fist instead, and then gazed at it with mild unbelief. All right, he finally whispered. This is simply awful, and it looks as if, in order to be cured, I'll have to get me a wife along with it. A pity, though. Everything was perfectly mild without one. You will be mild with a wife, Hal, his father assured him softly. You don't like the prospect now, because it means change. Change, of course, is always unpleasant, but the treatment will take care of it all right. I know that I didn't expect things to work out so mildly with the wife. It was optional back in those days, and if it hadn't been for your mother's family money, I never would have married. Particularly her, with her family history of fecundity, as witnessed by the children we produced, you and your sister. But Formair needed the money, and I was the only available man in the Weber clan. When I agreed to make the sacrifice, they made me president of the firm, because it isn't often that a man will do so much for his own family. Shows real character. It's in the cultured family blood, naturally. Hal had heard all this many, many times before, but he listened without irritation, or at least with only the mild irritation that was the result of his present unstable condition. Yes, indeed, his father went on in his mild, comfortable voice. Hardly knew she was around the house, though, once the treatment was over with. It was just as if she had been around all my life. Marvelous process. All right, Hal murmured. I'll take it. Be a good idea to pick out a wife first. Sometimes there are a few minor adjustments to make because of outstanding individual characteristics. You get an absolutely perfect fit that way, you know. He stood up and walked toward the door, the flabby muscles of his body easily supporting the two pounds relative of his weight. The Anzermet family has a female available, I believe, he murmured as he walked. Excellent choice, but you better have the probability checked anyway. I know about her, Hal replied thoughtfully. But what's she like? Have you ever met her? His father smiled benignly back at him as he practically floated through the doorway. That doesn't matter a bit, he said mildly. It doesn't make any difference at all what either of you are like. The treatment will bring you both back to absolute statistical normal, and you will both be a perfect fit for each other, quite pleasantly civilized. The door hummed shut behind him. Well, Hal announced loud to himself, guess that's it. He ordered the automatic secretary to make all suitable arrangements, and then stood up. He walked to the elevator, where a soft hissing breeze conveyed his temporary one-tenth pound relative gently up the tube to the roof. There his weight returned to its normal two pounds relative, and he spoke to the robot attendant. My cab. His form air air cab was promptly and quietly delivered, and Hal stepped inside. Destination? A voice inquired softly from the control bank. Take me to the nearest available civilization conditioning treatment center. At once the cab took off. It was a silent and comfortable motion. Hal had always liked flying. The automatic pilot was speaking to him gently. Central authority advises that the nearest available CCT center at this time is in the metropolis of Knoxville. This requires traversing interurban wilderness. Hal frowned just slightly. He had never seen the interurban wilderness, of course, and had not the slightest desire to do so. That was chaos. He inquired, How soon can the local center take me? Three days, seven hours, twenty minutes from reference time. Mark time. Mark, the robot announced the temporal point of reference. Too long, Hal replied wearily. Let's go to Knoxville and shut off all outside views. 
I do not wish to see the chaos. The air cab obediently turned and transposed through the suspend field of the York Metropolis Aerodome. It was an effortless passing since the field that constituted the wall structure of the air cab was exactly in phase with that of the Aerodome field. Both were form air manufacturer, of course. The pleasant, silent, effortless motion of the air cab soon produced its usual somnolent effect on him, and he dozed comfortably off. He slept the entire trip. At Knoxville, he spoke to the center technician briefly, advising the master robot of the possibility of his altered economic status, and the matter was thoroughly checked by the computer at Central Authority. Every conceivable source of psychosomatic tension and internal conflict was studied, and suitable alterations on Hal's master curve plotted. The process took ten minutes, while Hal dozed under the soothing warmth of the examination cap. There was a crackling buzz. And it was over. He awoke immediately and felt wonderful. No tension, no irritation, not the slightest bit of his recent restlessness. Hal was delighted. On the way out of the cubicle, he encountered another proprietor and smiled at him with a perfect, civilized mildness. York, he ordered his air cab. Once again, the sleek button shaped vehicle soared up through the air dome and out over the interurban wilderness. Hal contentedly went to sleep right in the middle of the pilot's automatic rundown of flight data. He was jolted awake by a raucous rattle from the control bank. Blinking his eyes sleepily, he said, Please stop all that noise. What is the trouble? A very unpleasant and notably ungentle voice replied, Apologies, sir. We are out of control. Air crash has occurred. Air crash? an almost unheard of thing that sometimes happened to people who used inferior equipment like that produced by firms other than form air. People were even known to be killed by it. Report, he said quietly, then flinched a little at the raucous scratching of the speech mechanism. Reference point, Mark. Altitude, 11,371 feet. Velocity reduced to 209.9 miles per hour. Locus. 700.8 miles from nearest civilized metropolis, which is York. The voice continued, but became unintelligible as the mangled circuits faltered. 700 miles from civilization? Wilderness? Chaos? That settled it, of course. Hal smiled gently as he realized that he was about to die. A civilized man obviously could not be expected to survive in chaos. He observed that he was breathing more strenuously and realized that it was the result of the rapid failure of the anti-gravity field. Never in his life had Hal been under the full force of the Earth's mass field, but he knew the symptoms. Once he had been exposed to one-half G for a few hours. Very unpleasant, he recalled. The automatic pilot's unintelligible speech suddenly stopped altogether. There was a heavy, awkward lurch that threw Hal forward against the front panel. But before he struck it, the field generator failed completely. The panel ceased to exist, and Hal was flying through the air. He shut his eyes and placidly waited for death. A moment later, he hit the ground sharply, rolled over and over, and lay still. He sighed heavily. Death? He had always fancied that death would be a complete absence of sensation and no consciousness of effort whatever. Instead, his breath was coming in deep, heavy sighs, his head hurt, his arm was aching, and something was tickling his nose. Come on, wake up, a voice said briskly. Hal opened his eyes and looked up at a golden framed face. It was the face that had been speaking, and the pleasingly shaped lips now moved again. You aren't hurt, you know, just a little shaken up. Hal continued to stare at the woman for a moment, then muttered oomph, and struggled to a sitting posture. It was a great effort in the unaccustomed full earth gravitational field. The woman was an outlander, no doubt about it. That was evident from her highly spirited tone of voice. But as Howe looked around at the strange picture of undisturbed interurban wilderness, he found that, most astonishingly, he did not mind it. As a matter of fact, he rather liked her tone of voice. It was all very puzzling. What happened, he muttered heavily. 
his eyes moving back to the landscape and the small metal boxes which housed the now defunct suspend field generators. There must have been something wrong with your air cab, she replied. You crashed, the same way I did a couple days ago. The woman walked over to the generator boxes, picked them up, and brought them back to where he was still sitting on the grass. We'll need these, she explained. There are emergency supplies inside them. Hal didn't move. She waited a moment, then said lightly, tossing her golden hair. Come along now. We're way out in the wilderness, you know, and there aren't any robots to bring us our dinner. Wilderness, Hal murmured. That's right. Well, I guess we'll die here. Oh, nonsense, she stamped her foot with impatience. This would have to happen to me. Of all people to be stranded with in the wilderness, I have to get one of you insipid, gutless proprietors. Oh, yes, Hal said with unconscious anger, lurching to his feet. Who's insipid and gutless? I'm considerably more civilized than you are. Quick surprise across her face as she listened. Hal continued his angry speech. Why is it that all you savages always think you know how to live better than your superiors? If you're so clever, why aren't you civilized? Well, listen to him. You sound almost human. She was laughing at him. Damn savage, he growled. He turned and strode purposefully away from her across the soft matting of grass. Where do you think you're going, she called. Away from here, he replied. But the rapid pace and the unaccustomed gravity was very quickly taking his energy. His breath came in deep, labored gasps already, and he could scarcely move his feet. He stopped abruptly and looked at the distant horizon. There was nothing in sight that indicated civilization. These regions had not been inhabited for two hundred and fifty years, ever since the severance of the planetary colonies from political control by the motherland and the settling of the proprietors into their well-separated civilized cities. The land was all owned by the proprietors, but was unnecessary, and hence not used. He felt a light touch on his arm. I'm sorry, she apologized softly. I can understand you a little, but you're so completely under the influence of your horrible personality conditioning methods that you can't possibly understand me. Who's under what influence? Hal said, in a valiant attempt to express his irritation, but his voice held the obvious weakness of fatigue. You poor boy, she sympathized. You don't sound very much influenced by it right now. At her words, Hal suddenly became aware of the unaccustomed vigor of his own emotions, and he was puzzled by it, but it seemed oddly unimportant for some reason. How come you can handle this awful weight so easily, he asked her. Her laughter was light and delightful. We spend most of our lives under natural conditions, not under an anti-gravity machine. I've only been on Earth for a few months, visiting my father, but a lot of that time was spent out here in this beautiful wilderness. Horrible chaos, he muttered. He glanced up and observed a mild blue, cloud-studded sky. Why, it is blue after all, isn't it? What's blue? The sky dome. She glanced up thoughtfully. Of course it's blue. And this is not one of your artificial skies. This is the real thing. There's no artificial weather control out here, you know. You get natural sunlight, natural winds, storms, rain, oh, lots of things. Gah, said Hal. What makes you surprised at finding that the sky is blue? Probably because I never saw it before. The only time I ever heard of it being anything other than green was when an engineer we have working for us at the factory said it was blue. Well, never mind the sky. Let's find some place where we can get a little shelter for the night. She began to lead him slowly along an animal trail to a cluster of trees on a nearby stream. She walked with the obviously delayed pace one takes with invalids, but Howe had a difficult time keeping up. Finally, she said, Here's a pretty good place. Sit down next to that tree. You must be worn out. Ooh, he groaned, reclining back against a broad, rough oak trunk, then stiffening painfully away from it again. It doesn't fit, he mourned plaintively. Now you're sounding silly again, she scolded. Go on, lean back. There aren't any suspend field lounges out here for you, so you take what you get. Obediently, he relaxed against the rough, twisting bark. He was very, very tired. On second thought, even this rugged seat was comfortable. He sighed heavily and then looked pensively around again. Oh, well, what does it matter? We'll be dead soon. Don't talk like that, she snapped with annoyance. 
Why? he inquired listlessly. Everybody knows a civilized human being can't possibly survive in the wilderness. That's why no one ever comes here. And I'd just as soon die right now if you have anything suitable for killing. The woman stared at him with a tight frown between her eyebrows. Then she shook her head with wonder. How you people can call yourselves civilized is beyond me. You yourself don't seem so bad, except that you don't have any guts. They've trained it all out by now. Please, begged Hal, you sound like that uncouth engineer that works for us. Impertinent. That what engineer? she demanded spiritedly. Who are you, anyway? I'm Weber. Hal Weber. The engineer's a savage. Oh, sorry, he smiled weakly. You're a savage, too. Guess you outlanders don't regard yourself as a such. No, we don't, she snapped. And if it weren't for us, you silly fools here on earth would have died out long ago. Outlanders are noted for their misplaced pride, of course, Hal commented, with a mildness that was impelled by fatigue rather than civilized conditioning. Oh, are we now, she said angrily, standing up and bending over him. And who do you think you are, Lord Proprietor? Some humble god, perhaps. Let me tell you something, Hal Weber. I've heard about you. You know who I am? My name is Lois Bruckner. That uncouth engineer you just referred to happens to be my father. Hal was puzzled. What on earth is the matter, he asked. Why are you so excited? You called my father uncouth. Why get excited about that? After all, Hal gestured weakly, trying to reason with her. It's only your father. I didn't say you were uncouth. Funny thing is, I like you. Suppose I call your father names, she demanded, her lower lip protruding belligerently. You can call him anything you like as far as I'm concerned. Lois Bruckner stood there a moment, her mouth open in astonishment. Then she sat down beside him again quietly. That's right, she murmured. They even educate love out of you. Hal sighed heavily and slid away from the tree onto the rough, rocky ground. It was painful, but he was so tired. His breath came in regular, deep sighs as he went to sleep. By the time he woke, Lois had constructed a kind of primitive lean-to shelter over him. Hal was amazed. The sheltering purpose of the structure was evident to him, and he was startled that she should have been able to design such a thing on the spur of the moment. She heard him stir and looked up from the fire she had built in front of the lean-to. Hungry, she asked. He was ravenous but his muscles ached in every fiber. His wonder at her cleverness disappeared abruptly when he tried to move. He rolled over, groaning and helpless. Immediately she was at his side, pushing him back onto the bed of dry, fragrant grass she had put him on. Now don't try to move around, she admonished. Just a few days and you'll be all right. Oh, Hal groaned. This is awful. There, there, she murmured solicitously. I've made you some soup. You'll like it. Soup, he groaned. I want food. Good solid syntho meat. Don't you have any food? Solid food in your stomach so soon in this heavy gravity would kill you. She went away and returned quickly with a little cup and spoon and proceeded to empty the container into his lax mouth a few drops at a time. After a while he ceased his protesting. It was less painful to swallow the slop than to fight it. Very soon afterward, he lost consciousness. Later, he was again aware of his surroundings. He felt tremendously better, and observed with a peculiar satisfaction that it was morning. Funny sounds were in the air, which he eventually recognized as the cries of wild birds and insects. Insects? He blinked his eyes and struggled to his sitting position, and looked worriedly around. Insects can carry disease, he remembered, and wild animals were reported to be carnivorous. His clumsy emotions awakened Lois, who had been sleeping beside him. Hal looked down at her with a vague wonder. Such a nice-looking savage, he thought, as she popped it open her eyes. She smiled a pleased morning smile at him and lazily stretched. Hi, she said. How do you feel? Quite mild, Hal admitted with wonder. Odd, too. That junk you fed me last night must have some very efficient drug in it. Junk I fed you last night? Lois echoed, sitting up. Then she laughed her amusement. Oh, you mean that soup? That wasn't last night, Hal Weber. That was last week. But I just woke up, he protested. 
Yes, she smiled at him, reaching up and patting his cheek affectionately. You've been a little delirious. Gravity trauma, very common. You get used to it fast, but that's one thing they didn't condition you to, I guess. And your conscience promptly rejected the possibility. Sudden remembrance came to how the agony it had been to move the last time he remembered trying it. Cautiously, he lifted an arm and flexed it. He glanced back at Lois, who was watching him with amusement. It feels all right now, heavy and clumsy, but no pain. Good. She stood up and brushed her unruly hair away from her forehead. I'll fix your breakfast just as soon as I take my bath, all right, she said. Hal nodded absently. The stream was twenty yards away, and Lois walked quickly over to it. There she pulled her jumper over her head and dove into the crystal water. Ah, it's cold, she shrieked, her vigorous splashing through sharp brilliance in the early morning sunlight. After a few minutes, she came out, letting the water dry in her soft golden skin. Hal was watching her in open-mouthed admiration. It was a most remarkable sensation, this pleasure at seeing her move in that lithe, supple way. He had never before experienced such a thing. As she came up on the grassy bank, she noticed his rapt gaze and quickly snatched up her single garment and held it in front of her. All right, she told him briskly. You too. You're much too big for me to handle effectively, so you haven't had a decent bath since we got here, and it's pretty hot during the day. Obediently, as if in a Vic spell, Hal stood up and walked to the water's edge, keeping his eyes on her. Look what you're doing, she said sharply, and he shook his head dazedly. He slowly removed his clothing, dropped it on the ground, and jumped into the water. That was the end of the spell. The water was like ice. He howled like a wounded animal and tried to jump out again, but the gravity made him clumsy, and he fell back with a great splash. He rose again, gasping and sputtering, making wild, awkward movements in a frenzy to get out of the excruciating coldness. Finally, he was lying on the grass, panting and exhausted. Lois was standing over him, her pale blue eyes dancing with delight. What a spectacle, she bubbled merrily. You should have seen yourself. I sure wish I had a vicograph with me. Such performances should be preserved. Unaccountably, Hal found himself gurgling like a delighted baby, and then laughing with her in loud, uncivilized guffaws. After a few minutes, they were both worn out with hilarity. Lois sighed. She gave him a brimming smile and went on back to the lean-to. Get your clothes on, she said. I'll have some breakfast for you in a few minutes. It was food, Hal agreed, but it was not very good. It had come out of the standard emergency ration from the air cab master units, and no power on earth could have made it very palatable, and the supply was nearly gone. I don't know how we can get back, she said thoughtfully as she chewed on a wafer. Plenty of air cabs go by. I've seen a dozen or so during the past week, but nobody ever looks out of them except outlanders, and there aren't many of us around, so there isn't any point in building a signal fire. Hal did not reply. He lay back on the grass, his belly full with unaccustomed satisfaction, staring at the blue sky. He decided that he still preferred green. It's sort of a washed-out color, he murmured. What? The sky. It's sort of pallid and weak-looking. That's haze. But spoken like a big, strong man, she said lightly, and then wistfully added, A pity they always take it out of you. Hal frowned and looked down from the sky to the wind-blown dampness of her golden hair. What do you mean by that? he inquired. Nothing. Her gaze returned modestly to her wafer, and she continued the former subject. We are talking about getting back to what you call civilization, remember? Or do you prefer we become the new Adam and Eve lost in the wilderness, she asked, her eyes dancing. We could start a new primitive dynasty of plain savages. Oh, Hal's mind came back to the immediate problem. Oh, yes, that's right. We have to get back. He frowned a moment. Well, now, let's see. There are a number of emergency stations spotted around the interurban wilderness. Can't just remember where I learned about them. Must have been treatment information. He thoughtfully picked up a stick and began drawing diagrams of maps in the loose soil. There, he pointed with the stick. One of them should be about 200 miles north of where we are now, provided the automatic pilot of my air cab was accurate in its final position fix. Lois was looking at the crude map when he glanced back up at her. There seemed to be a sadness in her expression. She nodded her head at the map. 
from that it looks like those emasculating treatments do some good after all. Don't talk like that, he reproved her. The civilization conditioning treatment is the basis of our culture. She started to speak, hesitated, and then blurted out, What precisely does it do for you? Don't you know? Hal asked astonished, and then answered his own question. Oh, of course. Outlanders would hardly know much about civilized history. Well, before interplanetary exploration was started, there weren't any areas at all like this wilderness. The planet was much too crowded. The people lived in huge, contiguous cities and were incessantly battling with each other for economic survival, social survival, and animal survival. The vast majority of the population couldn't stand it. They developed all kinds of psychogenic illnesses. The impact of the uncontrolled inclinations of individuals meeting the absolute self-control required by civilization was killing them. Then, gradually, the civilization conditioning process was developed. What happened then was just what you would expect. The people who took the treatments were so much better adapted to civilized living conditions that the others simply didn't have a chance. Just as soon as planetary colonies were opened up, the savages were all shipped off. There were a lot of riots and small-scale wars for a while, but eventually the superior conditioning of the civilized people won out. After things had stabilized again, anyone who wanted to was permitted to become an Earth citizen, but he had to take the treatment and keep it up. But by that time, most savages had a lot of peculiar prejudices against it, so the population of Earth has remained very small. The robotic defenses of the proprietors protected the planet from further invasion, and now the robotic police maintain order everywhere in the system. Of course, the planets are extremely poor natural resources, so we supply the basic material, even though we relinquished political control long ago. The colonies pay us by sending unusually gifted technicians, like your father, to work for us. Naturally, outlanders have no rights whatsoever here, not even the right to life or freedom or payment of the material allotment, but unless they commit a crime, or otherwise interfere with the proprietors, there is not the slightest danger of being molested by any citizen, because citizens are civilized. Hal stopped his history lecture and looked back up at her. The treatment is responsible for the entire rational order of our culture, as you probably know. But look how insipid it makes you all, she burst out. You're so weak and wishy-washy. There isn't a noble or even a strong sentiment in your entire society. That is how the process works. It is nothing but a series of checks and balances artificially installed in the subconscious which make strong sentiments unnecessary and which prevent unstable activity. The result is a perfectly smooth existence with no ups or downs and a perfect cooperation between civilized people. Lois thought this over for a moment. Then she asked curiously, How do you account for the fact that you, after the, all the treatments you have taken, are so different from other proprietors? You, well, she stumbled, blushing a little, you seem perfectly normal in your reactions. Hal shook his head. I don't know. Maybe my last treatment had an error in it, but he shook his head again at the idea, because the computer at Central Authority never made mistakes. It is strange. I think it's wonderful, she smiled at him with quick radiance. Hal grinned happily back at her, feeling an alien surge of joy as he looked at the smile and at her. Well, whatever it is, for the next few months or so, it looks like we'll be savages, in fact. They were, and they took a long time walking north to their destination. It was a remarkably satisfying experience for Hal, and it was for Lois, too, as she pointed out to him the night after they found the emergency station. There was a small form-air shelter at the place, and a simple automatic distress transmitter which was set in operation by one push of a button. Symbols marked on the case of the transmitter assured them that assistance would be forthcoming within twelve hours. It was their first night in a civilized shelter, and their last night together in the wilderness. Early the next morning, an authority air cab came humming swiftly down to the meadow where they were waiting. Once inside the air cab, Hal became taciturn and thoughtful, but Lois was not disturbed. She talked enough for both of them. Hal luxuriated in the pleasant, reawakened rapport with the things of civilization. Back at the city, they went to Bruckner's residence, and Lois's father rushed outside to greet them. 
Lois ran happily to him, embracing him, and volubly explaining how wonderful Hal was, how he had saved her from being gobbled up by a lot of wild animals, and how strong he was, and sundry other affectionately innocuous exaggerations. Hal looked curiously on for a few minutes in idle wonder at the strange attachments of outlanders. Then Lois proudly pulled him over next to her. Isn't he wonderful? And we're in love. Oh, so much in love. Lois, Bruckner mumbled unhappily. There are some things you have to be told. I should have told you before. You don't have to tell me anything, she bubbled happily. You can say all you want to about the proprietors, but this one is different. He's, he's real. Hal laughed diffidently and moved a little further away from her. He gazed round at the city, recognizing it with thirsty familiarity, happily part of it again. The experience of the past three months already seemed far away. How? Lois murmured, suddenly aware of his rapidly growing coolness. How, darling, what's wrong? Why, nothing at all, uh, Lois. He looked at her uncomfortably for a moment and backed a step further. It's just, well, you know. Oh, no, you don't, she cried, rushing up to him and grabbing his arm. Where are you going? Dad? Please, Miss Bruckner, Hal murmured mildly, disengaging his arm from her. He gazed hungrily around him again the moment she let go, and looked back at her only when he was startled by a sudden choking sob. Lois was staring at him, her fist to her mouth, the pale blue eyes brimming. Oh, no, she cried tremulously. Lois, Bruckner said, his voice sounding harsh with repressed emotions. Come in here. You've got to know what the situation is. He put his arm around her trembling shoulders and led her off, glaring at Hal in helpless fury. The moment they were out of sight, Hal turned and stepped back into the air cab. He ordered it to take him home. His parents were there watching a Vic entertainment, which Hal promptly turned off. Who did that? his father mumbled, coming immediately out of the trance. Hal? That wasn't a very nice thing to do, son. Why, Hal? his mother sighed mildly. You're not dead after all. How nice. Don't pay any attention to your father. It wasn't a very interesting Vic anyway. Shouldn't turn it off like that, though. Um, sorry, Hal apologized gently. He relaxed into the comfortable, perfect fit of a form air lounge. Just thought I'd let you know I'm still alive. Well, we're glad, his mother murmured absently. Must have been pretty awful. That's the funny thing about it, though. I didn't mind it a bit at the time. Very curious. I had an outlander woman with me, Bruckner's daughter, as a matter of fact. Oh, dear, Mrs. Weber sighed. Poor Hal. Well, like I say, it wasn't exactly mild, but it was quite tolerable somehow. He frowned just slightly and shook his head at the puzzling incongruity. He recalled his three months of association with the uncivilized woman, somewhat wistfully, contemplating strong, overpowering sentiments in a chaotic wilderness. Anyway, he said at last, I'm home again, and it's all over. I won't have to have anything to do with her now. Yes, Mrs. Weber murmured. Odd that you should have survived, though, isn't it? I thought a civilized man in the wilderness would die almost at once. Weber gave the cultured equivalent of a mild snort. Of course he could survive. Oh, and he laughed softly in apology. That's right. I forgot to tell you about that. The eyes of his wife politely turned to him, and he explained. A couple of weeks after our son here apparently had been killed, I happened to run into an authority physician. I mentioned it to him just in passing. He told me that there was a factor in the CC treatment that provided for such things. It seems that the civilization conditioning they give you is only designed to enable a man to survive in a city. In order for the conditioning to function, you have to have that civilized urban environment. Once the environment is removed, the conditioned complex has nothing to react against, and the man immediately becomes almost, but not quite, as savage as a typical outlander. That way, a civilized man can always manage to live in the wilderness, given half a chance. Once he gets back into a city again, the proper civilized environment is returned, the conditioning starts functioning immediately, and presto, the man is civilized again. Well now, that's nice, Mrs. Weber said placidly. Wouldn't like to see my boy dead. Yes, her husband mused. The physician told me that right after we decided Hal was dead. I was going to mention it to you, but it slipped my mind somehow. Well, you're just a tiny bit forgetful at times, dear. 
Mrs. Weber sighed softly and turned to her son. How, dear, it's awfully nice to see you back again. Would you be kind enough to switch the Vic back on? Contentedly, Hal complied, and was himself immediately carried away by the vicarious entertainment, pleased to put the disturbing dream of the past three months comfortably behind him. End of Easy Does It by E. G. Von Wald The Customs Lounge by E. A. Poole. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Ryan Loner. There were usually a few customs inspectors in the lounge waiting to begin their shifts, hanging around, trading news and incidents, and drinking the bad lukewarm casser that was a standing joke in the Immigration's Customs Service. Old Gregg was telling for perhaps the 80th time of the success of his when he was young in the service. They had the small box of sticky, squashy sweets with them. The young one was eating one. Many another inspector would have passed them through, but I thought the young one chewed too much and too loud. So I said, mind if I have one. Wah, says they together, it would set you on edge, noble wise inspector. It is the taste of another world. They was venusers, and they started shifting and hopping around and humming their national anthem. You know how they used to do back in the old days. I made quite a nice little find, almost a half scree of chamfer in each one of those sweets. I got a promotion out of that, and the venusers got a six-year closeout. Inspector Flint blew one of his noses loudly. Eh, that's nothing. I recall back when we first opened up for immigration and a whole shipload of earthers came in. They were crammed in like tigs in a nest, and as usual, they didn't know one word of the language. They didn't have any idea of where to go or how to do anything, and they'd got separated from their controller. They just stood around, huddled together and jabbering at each other. Well, I checked out about twenty of them, and then there comes up this big, ugly female. Well, I jacks the elevator up some more, and I looks down at her. Name, I call. Gladys Cracklegill or some other weird earth name, she screams at me. Too much name, I say. You've got enough name there for five of you. Which will you choose, Glad, Is, Crack, L, or Gill? Well, it took me a while to make her understand me. My earth accent wasn't too good then, and she was slow-headed, having only one like all earthers. But I finally made her understand what I wanted to know, and then by Clegg, what a ramping frost she did make. It was a while she was screeching at me that I noticed her teeth were pretty big, even for such a huge beast as she was. So I secretly turned on the dentist's fire right into her jaws, and what a sight on the view screen. Each of those big teeth was false and filled to the top with earth seed she was trying to smuggle. Earthers, exploded young Nask, they make me sick. I'm with you, Nask, said Inspector Sprim, and I don't understand why they still keep routing earthers through immigration anyway. They claim they're a borderline case, but when you've seen as many as I have, you know what side of the border they're on. Nask went off to the caster dispenser, and his place was taken by Briff, the head inspector who had been listening. On it just self-sprim, smiled Briff, contracting one of his heads. I have good news, rare news, and fine news. The four council decision just came down to us. Earthers are now to be routed through livestock instead of immigration beginning very soon. A cheer went up from the little group of customs and immigration officials. The one livestock inspector in the lounge groaned in despair. Old Inspector Flimp seemed bothered. They've made themselves a mistake, he sputtered. Earthers can be clever and tricky even after they're altered. Why, I've seen them pull every trick in the book coming through here. Did I ever tell you about the stunted one with an artificial head who tried to pass himself off as a rest park planner? Well, it seems that... Two young but large inspectors sneaked away from the group when they saw Old Flimp was launching to one of his dull yarns again. Outside the lounge, after a quick look up and down the hall, they ducked into the robot cleaner storage closet. Boy, gasped the shorter inspector, I had to get out of there. Besides the torture of listening to that two-headed monster babble on and on about how he outwitted others when he was still able to move around, this miserable thing has started to come loose again. He gave an impatient wrench to his left head, and it wobbled enough to expose some of the delicate wires that the earth robotic engineer had labored over so many hours. The other began tightening straps and buckles for him. There, he said finally, you look like one of the boys again. Laughing together, the Earthers went back into the Customs Lounge. End of the Customs Lounge by E. A. Pruel. Recorded by Ryan Loner.
A Guest of Ganymede by C. C. McCapp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Guest of Ganymede by C. C. McCapp. His employer had paid enormously to have the small ship camouflaged as a chunk of asteroid belt rock, and Gil Murdoch had successfully maneuvered it past the quarantine. Now it lay snugly melted into the ice, and if above them enough water had boiled into space to leave a scar, that was nothing unique on Ganymede's battered surface. In any case, the Terran patrols weren't likely to come in close. Murdoch applied heat forward and moved the ship gingerly ahead. What are you doing now? Waverill demanded. Murdoch glanced at the blind man. Trying to find a clear spot, sir, so I can see into the place. What for? Why don't you just contact them? Just being careful, sir. After all, we don't know much about them. Murdoch kept the annoyance out of his voice. He had his own reasons for wanting a preliminary look at the place, though the aliens had undoubtedly picked them up thousands of miles out and knew exactly where they were now. Something solid, possibly a rock embedded in the ice, bumped along the hull. Murdoch stopped the ship, then moved on more slowly. The view screens brightened. He stopped the drive, then turned off the heat forward. Water, milky with vapor bubbles, swirled around them, gradually clearing. In a few minutes, it froze solid again, and he could see. They were not more than ten feet from the clear area carved out of the ice. Murdoch had the viewpoint of a fish in murky water, looking into an immersed glass jar. The place was apparently a perfect cylinder, walled by a force field or whatever held back the ice. He could see the dark translucency of the opposite wall, about fifty yards away, and extending down eighty or ninety feet from the surface. He'd only lowered the ship a third that far, so that from here he looked down upon the plain, one-story building, and the neat lawns and hedges around it. The building and greenery occupied only one half of the area, the half near Murdoch being paved entirely with gravel and unplanted. That, he presumed, was where they'd land. The building was fitted to the shape of its half-circle and occupied most of it, like a half-cake set in a round box with a little space around it. A gravel walkway, bordered by grass, ran along the straight front of the building and around the back curve of it. The hedges surrounded the half-circle at the outside. There was an inconspicuous closed door in the middle of the building. There were no windows in the flat gray wall. The plants looked Terran, and apparently were rooted in soil, though there must be miles of ice beneath. Artificial sunlight poured on the whole area from the top. Murdoch had heard, and now was sure, that something held an atmosphere in the place. What are we waiting for, Waverell wanted to know. Murdoch reached for a switch and said simply, Hello. The voice that answered was precise and uninflected. Who are you? My employer is Frederick Waverill. He has an appointment. And you? Gilbert Murdoch. There was a pause, then. Gilbert Andrew Murdoch, age 34, born in the state called Illinois. Murdoch, startled, hesitated then realized he'd probably been asked a question. Uh, that's right. There was a price on your head, Murdoch. Murdoch hesitated again, then said, There'd be a price on your own if Earth dared to put it there. Waverell gripped the arms of his seat and stood up, too vigorously for the light gravity. Never mind all that, I hired this man because he could make the contact and get me here. Can you give me back my eyes? We can. But first of all, I must warn both of you against trying to steal anything from us or prying into our methods. Several Terrans have tried, but none have escaped alive. Waverill made an impatient gesture. I've already got more money than I can count. I've spent a lot of it, a very great lot, on the metal you wanted, and I have it here in the ship. We have already perceived it, and we do not care what it has cost you. We are not altruists. That, thought Murdoch, could be believed. He felt clammy. If they knew so much about him, 
that he might also be aware of the years he'd spent sifting and assessing the rumors about them that circulated around the tenuous outlaw community of space. Still, he'd been as discreet as was humanly possible. He wondered if Waverill knew more than he pretended. He thought not. Murdoch's own knowledge was largely meticulous deduction. This much Murdoch knew with enough certainty to gamble his life on it. The treatments here involved a strange virus-like thing which multiplied in one's veins and for presumably selfish or instinctive reasons helped the body to repair and maintain itself. He knew for dead certain that the aliens always carefully destroyed the virus in a patient's veins before letting him go. He thought he knew why. The problem was to smuggle out any viable amount of the virus. Even a few cells, he thought, would be enough if he could get away from here and get them into his own blood, for it would multiply. And what would be the going price for a drop of one's blood, for a thousandth of a drop, if it carried virtual immortality? A man could very nearly buy earth. The voice was speaking again. Move straight ahead. The field will be open for you. Murdoch got the ship moving. He was blanked out again by the melting ice until they popped free into air, with an odd hesitation and then a rush. The ship was borne clear on some sort of a beam. You could hear water cascading outside the hull for a second. Then it was quiet. He glanced at the aft viewer and could see the tunnel where they'd come out, with a little water still in the bottom, confined by the force field again. The water that had escaped was running off along a ditch that circled the clearing. They were lowered slowly to the graveled area. Leave the ship, the voice directed, and walk to the doorway you see. Murdoch helped Waverell through the inner and outer hatches and led him toward the building. His information was that a force barrier sliced off this half the circle from the other, and he could see that the hedges along the diameter pressed against some invisible plane surface. He hesitated as they came to it, and the voice said, Walk straight ahead to the door. The field will be opened for you. He guided Waverill in the right direction. As they passed the midpoint, he felt an odd reluctance, a tingle, and a slight resistance. Waverill grunted at it, but said nothing. The door slid open, and they were in a plain room with doors at the left and right. The outer door closed behind them. The door on the right opened, and Murdoch took Waverill through it. They were in a second room of the same size, bare except for a bench along one wall. The voice said, Remove your clothing and pile it on the floor. Waverill complied without protest, and after a second Murdoch did too. Step back, the voice said. They did. The clothing dropped through the floor sluggishly in the light gravity. Murdoch grunted. There were weapons built into his clothes, and he felt uneasy without them. At the end of the room, away from the middle of the building, was another door like the one they'd come through. It opened, and a robot walked in. It was humanoid in shape, flesh-colored, but without animal details. The head had several features other than the eyes, but none of them was nose, mouth, or ears. It stood looking at them for a minute, then said in the familiar voice, Do not be alarmed if you feel something now. There was a tingling, then a warmth, then a vibration, and some other sensations not easy to classify. Murdoch couldn't tell whether they came from the robot or not. It was obvious, though, that the robot was scanning them. He resisted an urge to move his hands more behind them. He'd been well satisfied with the delicate surgery, but now he imagined it awkward and obvious. The robot didn't seem to notice anything. After a minute, the robot said, through the door where I entered, you will find a bedroom and a bath, and a place to cook. It is best you retire now and rest. Murdoch offered his arm to Waverill, who grumbled a little, but came along. The voice went on, seeming now to come from the ceiling. Treatment will begin tomorrow. During convalescence, Murdoch will care for Waverill. Sight will be restored within four days, and you will be here one day after that. Then you may return to your ship. You will be protected from each other while you are here. If you keep your bargain, you will be of no concern to us after you leave. Murdoch watched Waverill's face 
but it showed nothing. He was sure the billionaire already had arrangements to shut him up permanently as soon as he was no longer needed, and he didn't intend, of course, to let those arrangements work out. It developed that when the robot spoke of days, it meant a 24-hour cycle of light and dark, with temperatures to suit. Under other circumstances, the place would have been comfortable. The pantry was stocked with earthside food that didn't help Murdoch's confidence any, since it was further evidence of the alien's contacts with men. He cooked eggs and bacon, helped Waverell eat, then washed up the dishes. He felt uneasy without his clothes, the more because the weapons in them, through years of habit, were almost part of himself. He thought, I'm getting too jumpy too soon. My nerves have to last a long time yet. While he was putting the dishes to drain, the robot walked into the room and watched him for a moment. Then it said to Waverill, Keep your hand on my shoulder and walk behind me. It reached for Waverill's right hand and placed it on its own right shoulder, revealing in the process that its arm was double-jointed. Then it simply walked through the wall. The blind man, without flinching, and perhaps without being aware, passed through the seemingly firm substance. When they were gone, Murdoch went quickly to the wall and passed his hands over it. Solid. The voice came from the ceiling. You cannot penetrate the walls except when told to. Any place you can reach in this half of the grounds is open to you. The half where your ship is will remain cut off. You may amuse yourself as you wish, so long as you do not willfully damage anything. We have gone to great effort to make this place comfortable for Terrans. Do not impair it for those who may come later. Murdoch smiled inwardly. He'd known the walls would be solid. He'd only wanted to check the alien's watchfulness. Now he knew that there was more to it than just the robot, and that the voice was standard wherever it came from. Not that the information helped any. He walked back to the middle of the building and went through the door across the lobby. In that half of the building were a library, a gymnasium, and what was evidently a solar system museum. There was nothing new to him in the museum. Though there were useful tables and data in the library, he was too tense to study. The gymnasium he'd use later. He went outside, walking gingerly on the gravel. The rear of the building was a featureless semicircle, the lawns and hedges unvaried. He took deep breaths of the air perfumed by flowers. He jumped at a sudden buzz near his elbow. A bee circled up from a blossom and headed for the top of the building to disappear over the edge. Murdoch considered jumping for a hold and hauling himself up to the top of the building to see if there were hives there but decided not to risk the alien's displeasure. He realized now that he'd been hearing the bees all the time without recognizing it, and was annoyed at himself for not being more alert. He paid more attention now, and saw that there were other insects too, ants and a variety of beetles. There were no birds, mammals, or reptiles that he could see. He parted the hedge and leaned close to the clear wall, shading the surface with his hands to see into the ice. There were a few rocks in sight, he found one neatly sliced in two by the force field, or whatever it was, showing a trail of striations in the ice above it where it had slowly settled. On Ganymede, the rate of sink of a cool rock would be very slow in the ice. Far back in the dimness, he could see a few vague objects that might have been large rocks or ships. There were some other things with vaguely suggestive shapes, like long eroded artifacts. Nothing that couldn't have been the norm normal fall-in from space. He went to the front of the building again, and stood for a while, looking at the graveled other half of the place. He couldn't see any insects there, and not a blade of grass. He approached the barrier and leaned against it to see how it felt. It was rigid, but didn't feel glass-hard. Rather, it had a very slight surface softness, so he could press a fingernail in a fraction of a millimeter. He remembered that on Earth, bees would blunder into a glass pane and looked around to see if they had hit the barrier. They didn't. An inch or so from it, they turned in the air and avoided it. Neither could he see any insects crawling on the invisible surface. 
He pressed his face closer and noticed again the odd reluctance he'd felt when crossing on the way in. At ground level, a dark line not more than a quarter of an inch thick marked where the barrier split the soil, gravel heaped up against it on both sides. He looked again toward the ship. If things went according to plan, the ship's proximity alarm would go off sometime within the next two days. He didn't think the aliens would let him go to the ship, but he expected the diversion to help him check out something he'd heard about the barrier. He flexed his thumbs, feeling the small lumps implanted in the web of flesh between the thumb and finger on each hand. He'd practiced getting the tiny instruments in and out until he could do it without thinking, but now the whole project seemed ridiculously optimistic. He felt annoyed at himself again. It's the aliens, he thought, that are getting my nerves. I've pulled plenty of jobs as intricate as this without fretting this way. He began another circuit around the building, and was at the rear when the voice said, almost at his shoulder, Murdoch, Waverill wants you. His employer lay on his cot, looking drowsy. He scowled at Murdoch's footsteps. Where you been? I want a drink. Murdoch involuntarily glanced around. Will they let you have it, sir? The voice came from the ceiling this time. One ounce of one hundred proof liquor every four hours. Is there any here? Murdoch asked. Tell us where to find it, and we will get it from your ship. Murdoch told them where the ship's supply of beverages was stowed, and headed for the front of the building. The robot was already in the lobby. It allowed him to follow outside, but said, Stand back from the barrier. Murdoch leaned against the building, trying not to show his eagerness. This was an unexpected break. He watched the ground level as the robot passed through the barrier. The dark line in the ground didn't change. The gravel stayed in place on both sides. Neither did the plants to the sides move. Evidently, the barrier only opened at one spot to let things through. The robot had no trouble with the hatches and came out quickly with a bottle in one hand. Murdoch worried again whether it had discovered that the ship's alarm was set. If so, it didn't say anything as it drew near. It handed Murdoch the bottle and disappeared into the building. After a few moments, Murdoch followed. He found Waverill asleep, but at his footsteps the older man stirred. Murdoch, where's that drink? Right away, sir, Murdoch got ice from the alien's pantry, put it in a glass with a little water, and poured in about a jigger of rye. He handed it to Waverill, then poured himself a straight shot. Rye wasn't his favorite, but it might ease his nerves a little. Mmm, said Waverill. It's better. Murdoch couldn't see any marks on him. Did they stick any needles into you, sir? I'm not paying you to be nosy. Of course not, sir. I only wanted to know so I wouldn't touch you in a sore spot. There are no sore spots, Waverill said. I want to sleep a couple of hours, so go away. Then I'll want a steak and a baked potato. Surely, sir. Murdoch went outside again and toward the grounds without seeing anything new. He went to the barrier and stared at the ship for a while. Then, to work off tension, he went into the gymnasium and took a workout. He had a shower, looked in on Waverill and found him still asleep, then went back to the library. The books and tapes were all Terran, with no clues about the aliens. The museum was no more helpful. It was a relief when he heard Waverill calling. There were steaks in the larder and potatoes. Waverell grumbled at the weight while Murdoch cooked. The older man still acted a little drowsy, but had a good appetite. After eating, he wanted to rest again. Murdoch wondered some more, then forced himself to sit down in the library and pretend to study. He went over his plans again and again. They were tenuous enough. He had to get a drop of Waverell's blood sometime within the next day or two and get it past the barrier. Then he had to get it into the ship and, once away from Ganymede, inoculate himself. The problem of Waverill didn't worry him. The drowsiness would have to be coped with, but based on the timetable Waverill's symptoms would give him, he should be able to set up a flight plan which would allow him to nap. The time dragged agonizingly. He had two more drinks during the afternoon, took another workout and a couple of turns around the building, and finally saw the sun lamps dimming. After that, there was a time of lying on his bunk, trying to force himself to relax. Finally, he did sleep.
He was awake again with the first light, got up and wandered restlessly into the pantry. In a few minutes, he heard Waverell stirring. Murdoch, came the older man's voice. Murdoch went to him. Yes, sir, I was just going to get breakfast. I can see the light. You, that's wonderful, sir. I can see the light. Damn it, where are you? Take me outside. It's no brighter out there, sir, Murdoch was dismayed. He'd counted on another day before Weaverell's sight began to return, with a chance to arrange a broken drinking glass, a knife in Weaverell's way, something to bring blood in an apparent accident. Now, take me outside. Yes, sir. Murdoch, his mind spinning, guided the older man. The door slid open for them, and Weaverell crowded through. As he stepped on the gravel with his bare feet, he said, Ouch! Damn it! Step lightly, sir, and it won't hurt. Merlock had a sudden wild hope that Waverell would cut his feet on a sharp pebble. But there were no sharp pebbles. They were all rounded, and the light gravity made it even more unlikely. Waverell raised his head and swung it to the side. I can see spots of light up there. The sun lamps, sir, they're getting brighter. I can see where they are. The older man's voice was shaky. He looked toward Murdoch. I can't see you, though. It'll come back gradually, sir. Why don't you have breakfast now? Weaverell told him what to do with breakfast. I want to stay out here. How bright is it now? Is it like full daylight yet? No, sir. It'll be a while yet. You'll be able to feel it on your skin. Murdoch was clammy with the fear that the other's sight would improve too fast. He looked around for some sharp corner, some twig he could maneuver the man into. He didn't see anything. What's that sweet smell? Weaverell wanted to know. Flowers, sir. There's a blossoming hedge around the walkways. I'll be able to see flowers again. I'll... The older man caught himself as if ashamed. Tell me what this place looks like. Murdoch described the grounds, meanwhile guiding Waverell slowly around the curved path. Somewhere, he thought, there'll be something sharp I can bump him into. He had a wild thought of running the man into a wall, but a bloody nose would be too obvious. I can feel the warmth now, Waverell said, and I can tell that they're brighter. He was swiveling his head and squinting, experimenting with his new traces of vision. Murdoch carried on a conversation with half his attention while his mind churned. He thought, I'll have to resist the feeling that it's safer here in back of the building. They'll be watching everywhere. He wished he, he could get the man inside, under the cover of serving breakfast, he could improvise something. I'm sweating, he thought. I can just begin to feel the lamps, but I'm wet all over. I've got to... He drew in his breath sharply. From somewhere, he heard the buzz of a bee. His mind leaped upon the sound. He stopped walking, and Ra Waverell said, What's wrong with you? Nothing. I, I stepped on a big pebble. They all feel big to me. Damned outrage. Taking away a man's... Waverell's voice trailed off as he started experimenting with his eyes again. There were more bees now, and presently Murdoch saw one loop over the edge of the building and search along the hedge. The first of them, he thought. There'll be more. He looked along the hedge. Most of the blossoms hadn't really closed for the night, though the petals were drawn together. He walked as slowly as he dared. The buzzing moved tantalizingly closer, then away. A second buzz added itself. He heard the insect move past them, then caught it in the corner of his eye. Waverell stopped. Is that a bee? Here? I guess they keep them to fertilize the plant, sir. They bother me. I can't tell where they are. I'll watch out for them, sir. He could see the insects plainly now and thought, I have an excuse to watch it. The buzz changed pitch as the bee started to settle, then changed again as it moved on a few feet. Murdoch clamped his teeth in frustration. He tried to wipe his free hand where trousers should have been and discovered that his thigh was sweaty, too. He thought, surely, Waverell must feel how sweaty my arm is. The bee flirted with another flower, then settled on a petal. Tense, Murdoch subtly moved Waverell toward the spot. He could see every move of the insect's legs as it crawled into the bell of the flower. You can smell the blossoms more now, sir, he said. His throat felt dry, and he thought his voice sounded odd. It's warming up and bringing out the smell, I guess. He halted and tried not to let his arm tense or tremble. 
This is a light blue blossom. Can you see it? I'm not sure. I can see a bright spot a little above my head and right in front of me. That's a reflection off the ice, sir. The flower's down here. Holding his breath, he took Waverell's hand and moved it toward the flower. He found himself gritting his teeth and wincing as Waverell's fingers explored delicately around the flower. The bee crawled out, apparently not aware of anything unusual, and moved away a few inches. It settled on a leaf and began working its legs together. Murdoch felt like screaming. Waverell's fingers stopped their exploration, then, as the bee was silent, began again. Waverell bent over to bring his eyes closer to his hand. Shaking with anxiety now, Murdoch executed the small movements of his right hand that forced the tiny instrument out from between his thumb and forefinger. He felt a panicky desire to hurry and forced himself to move slowly. He transferred the tiny syringe to his left hand, which was nearer Waverell. Waverell was about to pluck the blossom. Murdoch moved his right hand forward, trying, in case the aliens could see, though he had his body in the way, to make the move casual. He flicked a finger near the bee. The bee leaped into the air, its buzz high-pitched and loud. Waverell tensed. Murdoch cried, Look out, sir, and grabbed at Waverell's hand. He jabbed the miniature syringe into the fleshy part of the hand at the outside, just below the wrist. Damn you, Waverell bellowed, slapping at his right hand with his left. He jerked away from Murdoch. Here, sir, let me help you. Get away from me, you clumsy fool. Please, sir, let me get the stinger out. You'll squeeze more poison into your skin. Waverell faced him, a hand raised as if to strike. Then he lowered it. All right, damn you, and be careful about it. Shakily, Murdoch took Waverell's hand. The syringe, dangling from the skin, held a trace of red in its minute plastic bulb. Murdoch gasped her for breath and fought to make his fingers behave. He got hold of the syringe and drew it out. Pretending to drop it, he hid it in the junction of the third and fourth fingers of his left hand. He kept his body between them and the building and tried to make his actions convincing. There, it's out, sir. Waverell was still cursing in a low voice. Presently he stopped, but his face was still hard with anger. Take me inside. Yes, sir, Murdoch was weak with reaction. He drew a painful breath, gave the older man his left arm, and led him back. The tiny thing between his fingers felt as large and as conspicuous as a handgun. Murdoch felt as if the entire place was lined with eyes, all focused on his left hand. The act of theft clearly begun, his life in the balance, he felt now the icy nausea of fear, a feeling familiar enough, in which he knew how to control, but which he still didn't like. Fear. It's a strange thing, he thought. A peculiar thing. If you analyzed it, you could resolve it into the physical sick feeling and the wish in your mind, a very fervent wish, that you were somewhere else. Sometimes, if it caught you tightly enough, it was almost paralyzing so that your limbs and even your lungs seemed to be on strike. When fear gripped him, he always remembered back to that turning point, that act that had made him an outlaw and an exile from Earth. He'd been a pilot in the Space Force, young, just out of the Academy, and the bribe had seemed very large and the treason very small. It seemed incredibly naive now that he should not have understood that a double cross was necessarily a part of the arrangement. It was in escaping at all, against odds beyond calculating, that he had learned that he thought faster and deeper than other men, and that he had guts. Having guts turned out to be a different thing than he had imagined. It didn't mean that you stood grinning and calm while others went mad with fear. It meant you suffered all the panic, all the actual physical agony they did, but that you somehow stuck to the gun took the buffeting and still had in a corner of your being enough wit to throw the counterpunch or think through to the way out. And that's what he had to do now, endure the fear and keep his wits. The robot had responded to Waverell's loud demand. It barely glanced at Waverell's hand, said, it will heal quickly, and left. So far as Murdoch could tell, it didn't look at him. As soon as he dared, he went and took a shower. 
In the process of lathering, he inserted the syringe into the slit between thumb and forefinger of his left hand. In that hiding place was a small plastic sphere holding a substance which ought to be nutrient to the virus. It was delicate work, but he practiced well, and his fingers were under control now, and he got the point of the syringe into the sphere and squeezed. He relaxed the squeeze, felt the bulb return slowly to shape as it drew out some of the gummy stuff. He squeezed it back in, let the shower rinse the syringe, and got that back into the pouch in his right hand. He didn't dare discard it. There was always the possibility of failure and a second try, though the timing made it very remote. If the surgery was right, the pouches in his hand were lined with something impervious so that none of the virus would get into his blood too soon. He lathered very thoroughly and rinsed off, then let a blast of warm air dry him. He felt neither fear nor elation now. Rather, there was a letdown, and a weary apprehension at the trials ahead. The next big step was to get the small sphere past the barrier ahead of the time of leaving. He was pretty sure that he couldn't smuggle it out on his person. The alien's final examination and sterilization would prevent that. Now there came the agony of waiting for the next step. He hadn't been able to rig things tightly enough to predict within several hours when it would come. It might be in one hour or in ten. A derelict was drifting in. He'd arranged that, but it might be late or it might be intercepted. He prepared a meal for Waverill and himself, sweated out the interval, and cooked another. He wandered from library to gymnasium to out of doors and fought endlessly the desire to stand at the barrier and stare at the ship. The robot examined Waverill and revealed only that things were going well. Waverill spent most of his time bringing objects before his eyes, squinting and twisting his face, swallowed up in the ecstasy of his slowly returning vision. When darkness came, the older man slept. Murdoch lay twisting on his own couch or dozed fitfully, beset with twisted dreams. When the ship's alarm went off, he didn't know at first whether it was real or another of the dreams. His mind was sluggish and clearing, and when he sat up, you could hear sounds at the front of the building. Suddenly, in a fright that it would be too late, he jumped up and ran that way. The robot was already out of the building. It turned toward him with a suggestion of haste. What is this? Murdoch tried to act startled. The ship's alarm. There's something headed in. Maybe Earth Patrol. Why did you leave the alarm on? We, I guess, I forgot in the excitement. That was dangerous stupidity. How is the alarm powered? It's self-powered, rechargeable batteries. You are fortunate that it is only a dead hole drifting by. Otherwise, we would have to dispose of you at once. Stay here. I will shut it off. Murdoch pretended to protest mildly, then stood watching the robot go. His hands were moving in what he hoped looked like a gesture of futility. He got the plastic sphere out of his hiding place and thumbed it like a marble. He held his breath. The robot crossed the barrier. Murdoch flipped the sphere after it. He saw it arc across the line and bound once. Then he lost it in the gravel. In the dim light from Jupiter, low on the horizon, he could not find it again. Desperately, he memorized the place in relation to the hedge. When he and Waverill left, there would be scant time to look for it. The robot didn't take long to solve the ship's hatches, go in through the lock, and locate the alarm. The siren chopped off in mid-scream. The robot came back out and started toward him. Involuntarily, he backed up against the building, wondering what the robot, or its masters, might deduce with alien senses, and whether swift punishment might strike him the next instant. But the robot passed him silently and disappeared indoors. After a while, he followed it inside, lay down on his couch, and resumed the fitful wait. The next morning, Waverell's eyes followed him as he fixed breakfast. There was life in them now, and purpose. The man looked younger, more vigorous, too. Murdoch, trying not to sound nervous, asked, Can you see more now, sir? A little. Sit me so the light falls on my plate. Murdoch watched the other's attempts to eat by sight rather than feel, adding mentally to his own timetable of the older man's recovery. Apparently, Waverell could see his plate, but no details of the food on it. 
There was no more drowsiness, though. The movements were deft, except that they didn't correlate with the eyes. The eyes seemed to have a little trouble matching up, too, sometimes. No doubt it would take a while to restore the reflexes lost over the years. Waverell walked the ground alone in mid-morning. Murdoch, following far enough behind not to draw a rebuff, took the opportunity to spot his small treasure in the gravel beyond the barrier. Once found, it was dismayingly visible. But there was nothing he could do now. He was sweating again, and hoped with a sort of half-prayer to fortune that his nerves wouldn't start to shatter once more. He made lunch, then set himself the job of waiting out the afternoon. Ages later, he cooked dinner. He managed to eat most of his steak, envying Waverill the wolfish appetite that made quick work of the meal. The long night somehow wore through, and he embraced eagerly the small respite of breakfast. He felt unreal when the alien voice said, Do not bother to wash the dishes. Lie down on your bunks for your final examination. When you awake, you may leave. The fear spread through him again as he moved slowly to his couch. He thought, If they've caught me, this is when they'll kill me. He was afraid, no doubt of that. All the old symptoms were there, but oddly, there was a trace of perverse comfort in the thought. Maybe I've lost. Maybe I'll just never wake up. Then dizziness hit him. He was aware of a brief, feeble effort to resist it. Then he slid into darkness. He came awake, still dizzy, and with a drugged feeling. His mouth was dry. Breath came hard at first. He tried to open his eyes, but his lids were too stiff. He spent a few minutes just getting his breath to working, then he was able to open his eyes a little. When he sat up, there was a wash of nausea. He sat on the edge of the bunk, head hung, until it lessened. Gradually, he felt stronger. Waverell was sitting up, too, looking no better than Murdoch felt. He seemed to recover faster, though, Murdoch thought. Healthier than I am now. I hope he hasn't become a superman. The voice from the ceiling said, Your clothes are in the next room. Dress and leave at once. The barriers will be opened for you. Murdoch got to his feet and headed for the other room. He paused to let Waverell go ahead and noticed that Waverell had no trouble finding the door. The older man wasn't talking this morning, and the jubilation he must feel at seeing again was confined, outwardly, to a tight grin. They dressed quickly, Murdoch noting in the process that his clothes had been gone over carefully and all weapons removed. It didn't matter, but it did matter that he had to collect his prize on the way to the ship, and the sweaty anxiety was with him. As they went out the door, Waverell stopped and let his eyes sweep about the grounds. What a cool character he is, Murdoch thought. Not a word. Not a sign of emotion. Waverell turned and started toward the ship. Murdoch let him get a step ahead. His own eyes were searching the gravel. For a moment, he had the panicky notion that it was gone. Then he spotted it. He wouldn't have to alter his course to reach it. He saw Waverell flinch a little as they crossed the barrier, and he too felt the odd sensation. He kept going trying to bring his left foot down on the capsule. He managed to do it. Taut with anxiety, he paused and half-turned as if for a last look back at the place. He could feel the sphere give a little, or maybe it was a pebble sinking into the ground. He twisted his foot. He thought he could feel something crush. He hesitated, in the agony of trying to decide whether to go on or to make more sure by dropping something and pretending to pick it up. He didn't have anything to drop. He thought, I've got to go on or they'll suspect. He turned. Waverell had stopped and was looking back at him keenly. Murdoch gripped himself, kept his face straight, and went on. Waverell had to grope a little getting into the ship, as though his hands still didn't correlate with his eyes, but it was clear that he could see all right, even in the ship's dim interior. Murdoch said, Your eyes seem to be completely well, sir. Weaverell was playing it cool, too. They don't match up very well yet, and I have to experiment to focus. It'll come back, though. He went casually to his seat and lowered himself into it. Murdoch got into the pilot's seat. Better strap in, sir. He didn't have long to wonder how they'd be sent off. The ship lifted and simply passed through whatever served as a ceiling. 
There was no restraint when Murdoch turned on the graves and took over. He moved off toward Ganymede's North Pole, gaining altitude slowly, watching his screens, listening to the various hums and whines as the ship came alive. The radar would have to stay off until they were away from Ganymede, but the optical system showed nothing threatening. He moved farther from the satellite, keeping it between him and Jupiter. Hold it here, Waverell said. Letting the ship move ahead on automatic, Murdoch turned in pretended surprise. What? Waverell had a heat gun trained steadily on him. I'll give you the course. Murdoch casually reached down beside the pilot's chair. A compartment opened under his fingers, and he lifted a gun of his own. Waverell's mouth went tight as he squeezed the trigger. Nothing happened. Waverell glanced at the weapon. Rage moved across his face. He hoisted the gun as if to throw it, then stopped as Murdoch lifted his own gun a little higher. You got to them, Waverell said flatly. The ones that did the remodeling job on this crate and hid that gun for you? Of course. Did you think you were playing with an idiot? I could have sworn they were beyond reach. I reached them. Murdoch got unstrapped and stood up. He had the ship's acceleration just as he wanted it. And naturally, I went over the ship while you were blind. Get into your suit now, Averill. Why? I'm giving you a better break than you were going to give me. I'm putting you where the patrol will pick you up. You won't make it, you son of a bitch. I've got some cards left. I know where you plan to rendezvous. By the time you buy your way out of jail, I'll be out of your reach. You never will. Talk hard enough, and I may decide to kill you right now. Weaverill studied his face for a moment, then slowly got to his feet. He went to the suit locker, got out his suit, and squirmed into it. Murdoch grinned as he saw the disappointment on the other's face. The weapons were gone from the suit, too. He said, zip up and get the helmet on, and get into the lock. Weaverill, face contorted with hate, complied slowly. Murdoch secured the inner hatch behind the man, then got on the ship's intercom. Now, Waverill, you'll notice it's too far for a jump back to Ganymede. I'm going to spend about 40 minutes getting into an orbit that'll give you a good chance. When I say shove off, you can either do it or stay where you are. If you stay, we'll be headed a different direction, and I'll have to kill you for my own safety. He left the circuit open and activated a spy cell so he could see into the lock. Waverill was leaning against the inner hatch, conserving what heat he could. Murdoch set up a quick flight program, waited a minute to get farther from Ganymede and the aliens, then turned on a radar search and set the alarm. He unzipped his left shoe, got it off, and stood staring at it for a moment, almost afraid to turn it over. Then he turned it slowly. There was a sticky spot on the sole. The muscles around his middle got so taut they ached. He hurried to the ship's med cabinet, chose a certain package of bandages, and tore it open with unsteady fingers. There was a small vial hidden there. He unstoppered it and poured the contents onto the shoe sole. He let it soak while he checked the pilot panel, then hurried back. With a probe, he molded the liquid around on the shoe sole and waited a minute longer. Then he scraped all he could back into the vial and looked at it. There were a few bits of shoe sole in it, but none big enough to worry him. He got out a hypodermic and drew some of the fluid into it. The needle plugged. He swore, ejected a little to clear it, and drew in some more. When he had his left sleeve pushed up, he looked at the vein in the bend of his elbow for a little while, then he took a deep breath and plunged the needle in. He hit it the first time. He was very careful not to get any air into the vein. He sighed, put the rest of the fluid back in the vial, and stoppered it and cleaned out the needle. Then he put a small bandage on his arm and went back to the pilot's seat. He felt tired now that it was done. The scan showed nothing dangerous. Waverill hadn't moved. Murdoch opened his mouth to speak to him, then decided not to. He flexed his arm and found it barely sore, then went over his flight program again. He made a small adjustment. The acceleration was just over 1G, and it made him a little dizzy. He wondered if he could risk a drink. It hadn't hurt Waverill. He went to the small sink and cabinet that served as a galley, poured out a stiff shot into a glass, and mixed it with condensed milk. 
he took it back to the pilot's seat, not bothering with the free-fall cap, and drank it slowly. It was nearly time to unload Waverill. He checked course again, then thumbed the mic. All right, Waverill, get going. You should be picked up within nine or ten hours. Waverill didn't answer, but the panel lights showed the outer hatch activated. Through the spy cell, Murdoch could see the stars as the hatch slowly opened. Waverill jumped off without hesitating. Murdoch liked the tough old man's guts and hoped he'd make it all right. He closed the hatch and fed new data into the autopilot. He sagged into the seat as the ship strained into a new course, then it eased off to a steady forward acceleration. He was ready to loop around another of Jupiter's moons, then around the giant planet itself on a course that should defy pursuit unless it was previously known. He flexed his arm. It was a little sore now. He wondered when the drowsiness would hit him. He didn't want to trust the autopilot until he was safely past Jupiter. If a meteor or a derelict got in the way, it might take human wits to set up a new course safely. He had all the radar units on now. The conic sweep forward showed the great bulge of Jupiter at one side. No blips in space. The three plan position screens, revolving through cross-sections of the sphere of space around him, winked and faded with blips, but none near the center. He thought, I've made it. I've gotten away with it, and I ought to feel excited. Instead, he was only tired. He thought, I'll get up and fill a thermos with coffee. Then I can sit here. He unstrapped and began to rise. Then his eyes returned to one of the scopes. This particular one was seldom used in space. It was for planet landings. It scanned ahead in a narrow horizontal band like a sea vessel's surface sweep. He planned only to use it as he transited Jupiter to cut his course in near to the atmosphere. It was only a habit that had made him glance at it. The bright green line showed no peaks, but at the middle, and for a little way to each side, it was very slightly uneven. He thought, it's just something in the system, out of adjustment. He looked at the forward sweep. There were no blips dead ahead. He moved the adjustments of the horizontal sweep, blurred the line, then brought it back to sharpness, except in the middle. The blurriness there remained. He opened the panel and punched automatic cross-checks, got a report that the instrument was in perfect order. He looked at the scope again. The blurred length had grown to either side. Clammy sweat began to form on his skin. He punched at the computers, set up a program that would curve the ship off its path, punched for safety verification, and activated the autopilot. He heard the drive's whine move higher, but felt no answering lateral acceleration. He punched for 3G deceleration, worked frantically to get strapped in. The drive shrieked, but there was no tug at his body. The blurred part of the green line was spreading. He realized he was pressing against the side of his seat. That meant the ship was finally swerving, but he'd erased that program. And now, abruptly, deceleration hit him. He sagged forward against his straps, gasping for air. He heard a new whine as his seat automatically began to turn, pulling in the straps on one side as it maneuvered to face him away from the deceleration. He was crushed sideways for a while. Then the seat locked, and he pressed hard against the back of it. This he could take, though he judged it was five or six Gs. He labored for breath. The deceleration cut off, and he was in free fall. His screens and scopes were dark. The drive no longer whined. He thought, something's got me. Something that can hide from radar and control a ship from a distance like a fish on the end of a spear. He tore at the straps, got free and leaped for the suit locker. He dressed in frantic haste, cycled the airlock, and found himself on the surface of a planet. He had been returned to Ganymede. Panicked, he fled. Then abruptly, where nothing had been, there was something solid in his path. He turned his face to avoid the impact and tried to get his arms in front of him. He crashed into something that did not yield. His arms slid around something, and without opening his eyes, he knew the robot had him. He tried to fight, but his strength was pitiful. He relaxed and tried to think. In his suit helmet radio, the voice of the robot said, We will put you to sleep now. He fought frantically to break loose. His mind screamed, No. If you go to sleep now, you will never... He was wrong. His first waking sensation was delicious comfort. 
he felt good all over. He came a little more awake, and his spaceman's mind began to reason. There's light gravity, and I'm supported by the armpits. No acceleration. I'm breathing something heavier than air, but it feels good in my lungs, and tastes good. His eyelids unlocked themselves, and the shock of seeing was like a knife in his middle. He was buried in the ice, looking out at the place where he and Waverell had stayed. He was far into the ice he could only see distortedly. Between him and the open were various things, rocks, eroded artifacts. At the edge of his vision on the right was a vaguely animal shape. Terror made him struggle to turn his head. He couldn't. He was encased in something just tight enough to hold him. His nose and mouth were free, and a draft of the cloying atmosphere moved past them so that he could breathe. There was enough space before his eyes for him to see the stuff swirling like a heavy fog. He thought, I'm being fed by what I breathe. I don't feel hungry. In horror, he forced the stuff out of his lungs. It was hard to exhale. He resisted taking any back in, but eventually he had to give up and then he fought to get it in. He tried to cry out, but the sound was a muffled nothing. He yielded to panic and struggled for a while without accomplishing anything, except that he found that his casing did yield very slowly if he applied pressure long enough. That brought a little sanity, and he relaxed again until the exhaustion wore off. There was movement in the vague shape at his right, and he felt a compulsion to see it more plainly. Even after it was in vision, horrified fascination kept him straining until his head was turned toward it. It was alive, obscenely alive, a caricature of parts of a man. There was no proper skin, but an ugly translucent membrane covered it. The whole was encased as Murdoch himself must be, and from the casing several pipes stretched back into the dark ice. The legs were entirely gone, and only stubs of arms remained sufficient for the thing to hang from in, in its casing. Bloated lungs pulsed slowly, breathing in and out a misty something like what Murdoch breathed. The stomach was shrunken to a small repugnant sack, hanging at the bottom with what might be things evolved from liver and kidneys. Blood moved from the lungs through the loathsome mess, pumped by an overgrown heart that protruded from between the lungs. A little blood circulated up to what had once been the head, the skull was gone. The nose and mouth were one round hole where the nutrient vapor puffed in and out. The brain showed horrible and shrunk through the membrane. A pair of lidless idiot eyes stared unmovingly in Bert Murdoch's direction. The whole jawless head was the size of Murdoch's two fists doubled up, if you could judge the size through the distortion of the ice. Sick but unable to vomit, Murdoch forced his eyes away from the thing, now the alien spoke to him from somewhere. Pretty, isn't he, Murdoch? He makes a good bank for the virus. You are right, you know. It does offer great longevity, but it has its own ideas of what a host should be. Murdoch produced a garbled sound, and the aliens spoke again. Your words are indistinct, but perhaps you are asking how long it took him to become this way. He was one of our first visitors, the very first who tried to steal from us. His plan was not as clever as your own, which we found diverting, though of course you had no chance against our science, which is beyond your understanding. And in answer to his moan, they said, Do not be unphilosophical, Murdoch. You will find many thoughts to occupy your time. I will go mad, he thought. That's the way out. But he doubted that even the escape of madness would be allowed. End of A Guest of Ganymede by C. C. McCap. No Pets Allowed by M. A. Cummings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Craig Franklin. No Pets Allowed. By M. A. Cummings. I can't tell anyone about it. In the first place, they'd never believe me, and if they did, I'd probably be punished for having her, because we aren't allowed to have pets of any kind. 
It wouldn't have happened if they hadn't sent me way out there to work. But you see, there are so many things I can't do. I remember the day the chief of vacation took me before the council. I've tried him on a dozen things, he reported. People always talk about me as if I can't understand what they mean, but I'm really not that dumb. There doesn't seem to be a thing he can do, the chief went on. Actually, his intelligence seems to be no greater than that which we believe our ancestors had back in the twentieth century. As bad as that, observed one of the council members. You do have a problem. But we must find something for him to do, said another. We can't have an idle person in the state. It's unthinkable. But what? asked the chief. He's utterly incapable of running any of the machines. I've tried to teach him. The only things he can do are already being done much better by robots. There was a long silence, broken at last by one little old council member. I have it, he cried. The very thing will make him guard of the treasure. But there's no need of a guard. No one will touch the treasure without permission. We haven't had a dishonest person in the state for more than three thousand years. Eh, that's it, exactly. There aren't any dishonest people, so there won't be anything for him to do. But we will have solved the problem of his idleness. It might be a solution, said the chief, at least a temporary one. I suppose we will have to find something else later on, but this will give us time to look for something. So I became guard of the treasure, with a badge and nothing to do, unless you count watching the key. The gates were kept locked, just as they were in the old days, but the large key hung beside them. Of course, no one wanted to bother carrying it around. It was too heavy. The only ones who ever used it anyway were members of the council. As the man said, we haven't had a dishonest person in the state for thousands of years. Even I know that much. Of course, this left me with lots of time on my hands. That's how I happened to get her in the first place. I'd always wanted one, but pets are forbidden. Busy people didn't have time for them, so I knew I was breaking the law. But I figured that no one would ever find out. First, I fixed a place for her and made a brush screen so that she couldn't be seen by anyone coming to the gates. Then, one night, I sneaked into the forest and got her. It wasn't so lonely after that. Now I had something to talk to. She was small when I got her. It would be too dangerous to go near a full-grown one, but she grew rapidly. That was because I caught small animals and brought them to her. Not having to depend on what she could catch, she grew almost twice as fast as usual, and was so sleek and pretty. Really, she was a pet to be proud of. I don't know how I could have stood the four months there alone if I hadn't had her to talk to. I don't think she really understood me, but I pretended she did, and that helped. Every three or four weeks, three of the council members came to take part of the treasure, or to add to it, always three of them. That's why I was so surprised one day to see one man coming by himself. It was Grem, the little old member, who had recommended that I be given this job. I was happy to see him, and we talked for a while, mostly about my work and how I liked it. I almost told him about my pet. But I didn't, because he might be angry at me for breaking the law. Finally, he asked me to give him the key. I've been sent to get something from the treasure, he explained. I was unhappy to displease him, but I said, I can't let you have it. There must be three members, you know that. Of course I knew it, but something came up suddenly, so they sent me alone. Now let me have it. I shook my head. That was the one order they had given me, never to give the key to any one person who came alone. Grem became quite angry. You idiot, 
he shouted. Why do you think I had you put out here? It was so I could get in there and help myself to the treasure. But that would be dishonest. And there are no dishonest people in the state. For three thousand years I know. His usually kind face had an ugly look I had never seen before. But I'm going to get part of that treasure, and it won't do you any good to report it, because no one is going to take the word of a fool like you against a respected council member. They'll think you are the dishonest one. Now give me that key. It's a terrible thing to disobey a council member. But if I obeyed him, I would be disobeying all the others, and that would be worse. No! I shouted. He threw himself upon me, for his size and age he was very strong, stronger even than I. I fought as hard as I could, but I knew I wouldn't be able to keep him away from the key for very long, and if he took the treasure I would be blamed. The council would have to think a new punishment for dishonesty. Whatever it was, it would be terrible indeed. He drew back and rushed at me. Just as he hit me, my foot caught upon a root, and I fell. His rush carried him past me, and he crashed through the brush screen beside the path. I heard him scream twice. Then there was silence. I was bruised all over, but I managed to pull myself up and take away what was left of the screen. There was no sign of Grim. But my beautiful pet was waving her pearl-green feelers, as she always did, in thanks for a good meal. That's why I can't tell anyone what happened. No one would believe that Grem would be dishonest, and I can't prove it, because she ate the proof. Even if I did tell them, no one is going to believe that a fly-catching plant, even a big one like mine, would actually be able to eat a man. So they think that Grem disappeared, and I'm still out here, with her. She's grown so much larger now, and more beautiful than ever. But I hope she hasn't developed a taste for human flesh. Lately, when she stretches out her feelers, it seems she's trying to reach me. End of No Pets Allowed by M. A. Cummings Garden of Evil by Margaret St. Clair This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Edith Keserich of Southern Ohio Garden of Evil by Margaret St. Clair Erickson returned to an awareness of his personal identity quite suddenly. He had an impression that it was a long time, months at least, since he had been in a state of normal consciousness. At the back of his mind, a memory of pain had imprinted itself as a signet makes an impression in hot wax. He shied away from it. Where am I? he asked. The green-skinned girl squatting beside him in the coppice looked at him sideways out of her dark jade eyes. Hungry? she asked. But where am... Yes, I am hungry. Yes. Nothal. He knew, somehow, that that was her name. Didn't he remember her from the other side of the gulf in his memory? From the days when he had begged food in the streets of Penhairn? Nothal handed him a nicely roasted basula rib. He ate it avidly. He had always thought the basula was the best of the food animals of Fion. When the bone was gnawed clean, she passed him, in a folded fresh green leaf, a mixed grill consisting of bits of basula liver, kidney, tripe, salivary glands, and eyes. He ate that, too. When his stomach was full, Erickson lay back with his arms under his head and looked at the big, puffy clouds drifting overhead. 
He had no desire to think about himself or the things that had been happening to him in the last three or four months. But the thoughts came anyhow. The chief thing was pain, remorseless, long-continued pain. Nothel had come to him one day when he was sitting on the dock in Penhairn and told him they were going to Lake Tanias. He had got up and gone with her obediently. A byroar addict has little will of his own. The pain had begun after that. There had been a barren island in the middle of the brackish, poisonous waters of the lake, and most of the time, until just latterly, he had been kept bound for fear he would drown himself in them. Nothel had swum over from the mainland to tend him. She had bathed him and kept his body free of sores and vermin, set food before him and tried to coax him to eat. And twice a day she had given him injections of mercapulin with a hypodermic syringe. His arm was pocked with the needle marks. Where had she got the syringe and the drug? She must have stolen them from the big colony hospital in Penhairn. The injections had brought on the pain. Erickson, at the thought, felt sweat break out on his upper lip. What he had endured had been just at the edge of what a man could stand and still live. His ordeal, had he known it, had been very much less than it would have been had he taken the drug cure in the hospital in Penhairn. Nothel, though she had not disdained the help of terrestrial science, knew things about the Fionese flora and its properties that no terrestrial even suspected. Still, the ordeal had been bad enough. Erickson shifted his position and sighed. Nothel had cured him of the Byroar addiction. In return, he had hated her. There had been weeks, he remembered, when his brain had held nothing but horrible pain and the wish to kill Nothel. Once, when she had untied him for exercise, he had shammed sleep until she came close to him. Then he had caught her by the throat. He had come close to killing her then, and no doubt in those long, maniacal days there had been other times. Erickson raised himself on one elbow and looked at her. She was pouring water into a clay pot above the small, workmanlike fire she had built, and was putting in bits of chopped basula meat. Her greenish skin, the skin of a native of the South Polar Continent, glittered slightly as she moved. Nothel, he said. She turned toward him quickly, but did not speak. Nothel, I'm sorry I tried to hurt you on the island. I must have been pretty bad. Nothel almost smiled. No matter, she said. Pretty soon, soup. The incident seemed to be closed. Erickson lay back in the shade again and watched the movements of the cloudscape across the deep turquoise of the sky. His eyes felt as fresh as Adam's. The trees were green with the greenness of living emeralds, and the sun had an ardor and a richness like no sun he had ever known before. The winds blew with caressive, sweet-smelling tendrils over his face, and from the warm soil beneath him he could almost feel strength soaking up again into his body cells. He had visited several planets since he had first left Earth. He had loved none of them as he did Fion. Fion... Arnaldo, the chunky little head of the paleobiology department of Penhairn University, had told him once that terrestrials loved Fion so because the conditions on that planet were like those on Terra during the part of the Cenozoic when man was beginning to become man. Fion, he said, appealed to some deep-seated memory in humanity of what a planet ought to be. Erickson had laughed at him. He was new to Fion then, with a temporary appointment as an ethnographer to the South Polar Ethnographic Commission. Racial memory had seemed to him as outmoded a concept as spontaneous generation. But his temporary appointment had been extended once, and then again, and by the end of the second period he had been wildly, hopelessly in love with Fion. He had hoped to get a permanent appointment, had hoped to stay on Fion for the rest of his life. Erickson sighed again. 
After a while, he raised one hand above his head and looked at it. He could see the bones and the joints of the bones and the movements of the sinews under the pale gold skin. The marks of Nothel's hypodermic needle were faintly red. He ran his fingers down his body, surprised at the largeness and hardness of the rib cage and the prominence of the sockets of his hips. His body felt attenuated and worn. But it was his body, no longer the property of Byroar and the Byroar emptiness. He held up his hand once more and looked at it against the light. He was beginning to realize that he was alive. He drifted off into sleep. When he woke, Nothel was holding out a steaming bowl to him. Soup, she said. They stayed for some eight days in the coppice, while Erickson nodded his memories back together. Byroar and the need for it were sinking back with the passage of each successive day into the status of things unalterably in the past. Nothel set snares and hunted. She would not allow him to move a hand, and Erickson watched her almost incuriously. He felt a little more conscious every hour how good it was to be alive. On the ninth day, Nothel poured water on the cooking fire. She nested the cooking pots together, slung them deftly over her shoulder, and contrived a belt of twisted vines for her hunting knife. Go now, she announced. Erickson got up obediently. Are we going back to Penhairn? he asked. The corners of Nothel's mouth twitched. No, she said. Way on up. On in. In Trierdehad. She pointed with her thumb. Erickson stared at her. Trierdehad, he said. He'd heard the name before. It was... Now wait. Yes, it was the name the natives applied to the heart of the almost unknown South Polar Minor Continent. I can't go there. I gotta get back to Penhairn now that I'm well. I have three years of bi roar addiction to make up. Nothel's eyes narrowed. Trier to had, she repeated stubbornly. But listen, Nothel, I'm terribly grateful to you for what you've done for me. I can never thank you enough. But I can't go to Trier to had now, wherever it is. I'd need equipment. Cameras, notebooks, guns, a tent. Right now, I've got to go back to Penhairn, see about getting a job. All sorts of things to see, Nothel said. She edged up to him. You like, you like good. There was a prick in his arm. Nothel had made other things in her cooking pots the last few days besides soup. Erickson felt a peculiar glassy lethargy creeping over him. The sensation was not entirely unpleasant. It was as if he looked at his limbs and his body through a sheet of perfectly transparent crystal. He could see his actions and his movements with absolute clarity, but he had nothing to do with them. You like sea, Drear to had, Manothel said. All sorts of things for eth... ethnog... For a man like you to look at. Come on, you like good. She started along a shadowy, green-roofed trail. While Erickson watched with resentful detachment, his body began obediently to follow her. Speech as well as volition had deserted him, and all he could do was move silently in her steps. As mile succeeded silent mile, Memory and common sense came to his aid. There had been a time, nearly three years ago, when he had set out to explore the periphery of the minor polar continent by himself. His temporary appointment had expired, and he had been moving heaven and earth to get it made permanent. The one-man expedition had been part of the general heaven and earth moving process. It had occurred to him that the Ethnographic Commission might be inclined to view his application more favorably if he could offer the Commission a piece of original ethnographic research, such as a report on the natives in the periphery would be. His attempt had been a miserable failure. Indeed, he owed his former Byroar addiction to it. 
His supplies had been eaten by animals. He had poisoned himself with tainted chornous liver. Fever had attacked him. In his fits of feverish delirium, he had thrown away nearly everything, even his hunting knife. In order to get back to Penharen at all, he had had to resort to chewing the leaves of the byroar plant. The leaves contain a remarkable stimulant. Erickson had been able to get his fever-racked body back to civilization alive, but it had been at the cost of slavish addiction to the drug. And now Nothel, bless her greenish skin and queer flat eyes, was offering him a journey to the mysterious heart of the minor polar continent, offering it to him on a silver platter, a piece of original ethnographic research. He had been ungrateful and a fool. You like good, she had said. Well, she ought to know. The effects of the drug she had pricked his arm with must be wearing off. Erickson found he could smile. Where are we going to drear to hat, Nothel? He asked a little later. Nothel shook her sleek green head without even turning around to him. No, she said. The trip into Dredahad was a seduction, an enchantment, a bliss. Erickson's strength came flooding back to him. His sick pallor was turning to rich gold. On the second day he whittled, under Nothel's guidance, a spear and a throwing stick for it, and on the third and fourth she taught him to set snares and kindle fires with the sliver of onchine. The country grew wilder and more beautiful the trees taller, the sky a deeper blue, the waterfalls more loud. He tried to question the girl, but she never answered anything except, no, and after a little while, in his happiness, he gave up asking questions. What did it matter, after all? He was learning from day to day secrets that any geographer or ethnographer would have given the best years of his life to learn. The piece of original ethnographic research was becoming a reality, and who, except a fool, questions someone who has not only restored him to life but is giving him his heart's desire. On the eighteenth day, when Erickson's body had filled out and been turned to living gold by the sun, they came across the pyramid. It stood in a swale with purple flowers growing around it, and a small river flowing on one side, and it was so tall that Erickson, looking dizzily up, swore he saw clouds floating around its top. He wanted to stay and look at it, to record it in his mind, but Nothel was not impressed. She let him have two hours, and then she urged him on. But who built it, Nothel? He demanded when he had been pulled reluctantly away. How did it get here? Nothel seemed to be debating whether to answer him. He could never decide whether she was naturally taciturn or whether she really grudged telling him things. My people built it, she said at last. Detrith's long time ago. She motioned vaguely with her hand. Something in the gesture made Erickson see with sudden clarity how deep the abysm of the past, even on this young world with the ardent sun, really was. Fion was young but the Dredis had been living on Fion a long time. Two days later, Erickson, contrary to their usual custom, was in the lead, breaking trail. Nothel caught him suddenly around the waist and pulled him back, but she was not quick enough. The huge, thick-bodied snake with the red brandings lashed out at him and just fell short, but one glistening fang grazed his foot. Nothel, bleached by fear to the color of an inferior grade of jade, killed the snake with a stone. Then she made Erickson sit down on the grass and slashed at his foot with her hunting knife. What is it, Nothel? Erickson asked. The wound was not especially painful, but his heart had already begun to beat slowly and wearily, as if the beating were a burden almost beyond its strength and at the same time it seemed to have grown until it threatened to burst his chest. Outus, Nothel answered briefly. She hesitated for a moment. Bad, she said as if to herself. Very bad. Could kill me, too. 
Then she leaned over and set her lips to the bleeding gash her knife had made. Erickson tried to draw away from her. He was so dizzy that he could hardly see. No, he croaked. Don't. You mustn't suck it, Nothel. I don't want you to risk your life. The green-skinned girl shrugged. No matter. She answered, We'll do. Okay. Erickson tried to push her from him, but he was too weak. The world was receding from him in black waves. She sucked blood and poison from the wound, spat, sucked, spat, and sucked again. He would have liked to protest, to thank her for her sacrifice, but he had no time. His pulse had begun to flutter feebly, and he fainted. For the next several days, he was in a stupor most of the time. Whenever he came back to consciousness, he saw Nothel lying exhausted in the grass near him and he knew without being told that the poison she had sucked from his wound was moving sluggishly and with slow malignity through her veins. Nevertheless, the wound on his foot was always cleanly dressed and plastered with fresh herbs, and from time to time she opened it with her knife and let the pus escape. When they were finally on the road to Dridahad again, he tried to thank her for what she had done. Anything I can do for you, Nothel? He wound up with some embarrassment. It is difficult to thank someone who refuses to look at you. Anything I could do for you. Why, you let me know. I could have died there without ever getting my permanent appointment or seeing Dridahad. We're friends, aren't we, Nothel? Friends. He took her hand. Nothel nodded curtly. Okay, she said. She pulled her fingers from his. The Didreths, Erickson thought not for the first time, were an impassive, unemotional folk. It took them nearly a month to get to Dridahad. On the way, they had to ford two swollen rivers and beat off the attack of a must-maddened bull Rodops. Neither of these incidents had any consequences. On the 66th day after their departure from Lake Tanias, they came to the foot of Dreardahad. For a week or so, the ground had been rising steadily and the air growing crisp and thin. They had labored uphill, uphill. Dreardahad itself, built on a high plateau, had been visible for three days before they reached it, a silhouette faintly pinkish against the clouds. When they had first caught sight of it, Erickson had felt an almost painful anticipation seize him, and even Nothel, usually so impassive, had shown in her glowing face and quickened breathing how excited she was. The ascent to the plateau itself, along a path so precipitous that Erickson was always having to clutch it with hands as well as feet, was so toilsome that fatigue had dimmed his curiosity a little when they arrived at the top. Earlier that day, Nothel had thrown the cooking pots and the knife contemptuously over the side of the cliff, and now, cupping her hands around her lips and standing almost arrogantly erect, she strode up to the rosy red, eroded battlements. Clarette Loy, she called. Loy, Clarette. So far as Erickson could see, no one at all was listening. But after a moment, the massy doors of the gate began to open outward, ponderously, in the twilight. They went in. Dreardahad, Erickson saw at first glance, was much larger and more populous than he had supposed from below. The low, stepped buildings, all made of the rose-pink stone, seemed to stretch out from mile upon mile, as far as he could see. They made upon him an impression of antiquity so strong that it was almost disturbing. The small, greenish people, like Nothel, were everywhere. In dots, trickles, and rivulets, they were pouring out into the streets. Nothel's eyes fell on a man near her. She spoke to him. Instantly, he bowed profoundly before her and made a second, shallower obeisance to Erickson. Go with him. Nothel said, turning to the ethnographer. Sleep in his house. 
Obediently, Erickson followed his guide. When he looked around toward Nothel, she had already disappeared. The man, his name seemed to be Botor, took Erickson to an airy suite of rooms on the top floor of one of the biggest of the houses of red stone. Attendants waited on him with food and drink and water for bathing. They took away his dirt-encrusted, ragged clothing and brought him a heavy greenish robe. After Erickson had bathed and put it on, he inspected himself in the sheet of polished metal that served for a looking-glass, and decided that the color of the fabric made his curling beard and fair skin look as if they had been cast from yellow gold. He was tired, but far too excited to rest. The chief thing, the indubitable, the incredible thing, was that there was a very old, very populous city, a city whose existence no one had even suspected, in the heart of the South Polar Minor Continent. It was news to inflame an ethnographer to the point of hysteria. When Erickson got back to Penhairn with his report, it was going to revolutionize their whole concept of Fionnese history. One could hardly exaggerate to say that it would be epoch-making news. No doubt there would be a period when they'd consider him the biggest liar since Marco Polo, but after the first skepticism wore off, he'd have a permanent ethnographic appointment almost forced upon him. His report would shake established reputations, found new schools, would... Oh, if only he had something to write on. When the attendant came in again... Erickson made motions of writing in the palm of his hands, but the man's face remained blank, and when he asked from Nothel, the attendant merely shook his head and went out. For want of anything better, the young man hung out of the window, watching the smoky flicker of the lights in the city around him. It was not until the last one had gone out that he went, reluctantly, to bed. Next morning, immediately after breakfast, Nothel came to visit him. He hardly knew her at first. The scanty garments she had worn unconcernedly on their journey to Dreardahad had been replaced by the stiff, hieratic folds of a dull purple robe embroidered in blue. On her head there was a silvery crown of antique workmanship set with luminous purple stones, and she moved with the conscious dignity of a princess or a priest. Her manner toward him, too, had changed. She smiled faintly when she first saw him, and everything about her seemed freer than Erickson had seen it before. She was animated, almost vivacious. He asked her for something to write with. No, she answered, still with that faint smile. No use. Hunt now. They left Botor's house by a side door to avoid the crowd that would appear at once if they were glimpsed in the streets, Erickson surmised, and entered a small, walled court. There, four improbably striped animals, about the size of small ponies, were waiting for them. Erickson mounted one of them, and Nothel, tucking up her skirts, bestrode the other. With two attendants, they rode circuitously through Dreardahad and out into the high plain. The variety and abundance of game were amazing. There seemed to be more animals than there were trees, and they came in all sizes, shapes, and colors, and coats. There was even a big, blue-hued thing that reminded the young man a little of a kangaroo. He enjoyed himself, but he could not help wishing that he knew more about Fionnese zoology than he did, to appreciate all those properly. They got back to the city just before dark. Erickson ate, and then Nothel took him to the temple. It was the tallest building in Dreardahad, a stepped pyramid of unusually reddish stone, and Erickson was to grow fond, later, of the view from its flat top. The Naos itself, however, was a small room skimpily scooped out of one side of the pyramid, and it was very badly lighted. Erickson, who had resolved, in default of paper to write on, to impress all he saw and heard irremovably upon his mind, had to strain his eyes to see anything. Nothel officiated. His first feeling that she was a priestess seemed to be correct. As to the ritual itself, it was highly impressive, especially when one considered that he did not know the language in which it was going on. 
It ended with the sacrifice of an animal like a basula. While two attendants held it, Nothel cut its throat, caught the blood in a cup, and poured it on the altar fire. Then she roasted pieces of meat over the coals and dealt them out among the celebrants of the ceremony, partaking first herself. None of the callops was offered to Erickson, but, then, he could hardly be considered a communicant of the religion of the Didrites, whatever it was. As the days passed, a possible explanation of Nothel's treatment of him began to come to Erickson. He was not a conceited man, or it might have occurred to him earlier, and it bothered him to think she was attracted to him, whereas he had never found her attractive in any way. Still, what other hypothesis could account for the facts? They were together almost constantly, and, except for the attendants, who were always armed with heavy axes, always alone. She hunted with him, showed him the city, rode with him. She even taught him to play a rather childish game, something like the Sicilian Mora, which she always beat him at. Day after day she took him with her to witness religious rites which were obviously of the most hallowed character. Erickson had the impression that the rites were leading, in a series of slight graduations, up to some supreme event, and he tried to note and remember everything. The climax came suddenly. One lovely evening, just as the full moon was rising, Nothel took him with her up the steep sides to the top of the pyramid. The two attendants hovered discreetly in the background. For all practical purposes, he and the girl were alone. Nothel looked at him. There was a glint, warm, glowing, and facile, in her eyes that he had never seen there before. There was a short but rather embarrassing silence. At last, Erickson, feeling like a boar in a curl, took her hand. Nothel, he said, I'm so grateful to you. You've done so much for me, helped me so much. You mean a lot to me, Nothel. That, at least, was true. Nothel pulled her fingers away and regarded him. What you mean? she asked blankly. What you mean? That you... that I... He stopped, too embarrassed to go on. Nothel threw back her head and laughed. It was the first time he had ever heard the sound from her, and there was something strange in it. She motioned to the axeman with her hand. Not like, not hate, she said blandly. Let you see, let you hear, so you tell them all the Tradiths do. You are messenger. Then we eat. For a moment, the words echoed meaninglessly in Erickson's mind. The axemen were forcing him to his knees near a depression in the center of the pyramid. But why, he said, we hear about you the first time you try trip. Nothel said, Everybody know. No other men your color in Fion. His color. Erickson began to understand. Nothel's devotion, her self-sacrificing tenacity, her long kindness to him, everything, had all been nothing but a prelude to a ritual meal in which his rare blonde body was to be the chief support. No doubt a man of his color would be an especially choice offering to the gods. The gleam he had seen in Nothel's eyes had not been love, but a kind of religious gluttony. He began to laugh. Irony had always appealed to him. And besides, he was remembering a sentence in the Ethnographic Commission's preliminary survey. There is no doubt that ritual cannibalism is unknown among the natives of Fion. Okay, Nothel, he said, recalling what he had been saved from, what he had seen and learned. I'm ahead, no matter how you look at it. It's okay. He was still smiling when the axeman on the right struck and Erickson's severed head went rolling along the surface of the pyramid. End of Garden of Evil by Margaret St. Clair
When Whirly Birds Call by Frank Banta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ryan Loner. Those of the city of Featherton on Grimes Planet were with him to a man. Feathertonians cheered and waved from their windows that morning, not daring to come out for fear of the whirlybirds, and admiring five-gun Charles de Crab all the more for riding down the main stem of the town with the bubble of his convertible space coupe slid back, ignoring the menace from the skies. Five-gun Charles de Crab rode down the exact center of the street, looking neither to right nor left, not acknowledging the screams of adulation that poured from the windows. His bare head was up, his mouth was pressed into firm, haughty lines of self-confidence, and even his battle dress of dark green seemed to exude the aura of a competent killer. Five-gun Charles de Crabbe had come to clean up the town of whirlybirds. He stopped his space convertible in front of the white stone building titled City Hall on its facade. The two men waiting to greet him stayed safely under the bullet-shaped marquee as he alighted. He jumped over the side, checked his two holstered needle pistols, slung his explosive pellet rifle over one shoulder, his N-ray flashburn gun over the other shoulder, and picked up his rocket-powered stun gas spray gun in his hands. He strode over to the waiting man. I'm Olson Prince, mayor of Featherton, said the older man, shaking hands with the one de Crab stuck out from under the spray gun. And you are five-gun Charles de Crab? Yes, 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 exclaimed de Crab impatiently in his clipped speech. I'm the mayor's son, introduced the younger man with admiration shining in his eyes. Do you sure look like you're ready to whip those whirlybirds? Yes, 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 exclaimed a crab haughtily. Always dislike long conversations, you know. Supposing you tell me what you know so can exterminate them without further delay. No doubt solution before dusk. Before dusk, asked the mayor, dumbfounded. Oh no, not today, I'm afraid. They've been around too many years to whip in one day. Perhaps shall require two days, then, said Five-Gun Charles de Crabbe graciously. But, damn it, tell me what you know of them. Very well, assented the older man. Perhaps the best place to begin is with their name. When we first occupied this planet a bare twenty years ago, we called them wolfhawk whirlybirds and tigerhawk whirlybirds because they preyed on vicious animals. The whirlybirds were our best friends in those days. The only trouble is that they ran out of tigers and wolves to eat. Presume they are now called people hawk whirlybirds, de Crabbe frowningly asked in his clipped speech. Exactly, answered the older man, although that isn't their full name, from the way they attack. Most important, interrupted Five Gun, give to me in detail. They prefer to attack strollers, although they have attacked on city streets where there is little traffic. They fly with amazing speed, considering they are an untidy ball forty feet in diameter, and they are on top of their victims before the unlucky ones are aware of the menace. Blowing their victims down with a rush of air from their feathers, they grab them up by the heels, carry them high aloft, and drop them on piles of rock outside the town. They are downdrift people, Huck Whirlybirds, then, asked de Crab. That's almost it, agreed the mayor. I have not yet told you of their cries. As they rise in the air with the victim dangling from their talons by his heels, they utter a pleased coo, coo, like a gentle dove. That is why they are called cuckoo downdraft people, Huck Whirlybirds. Approve of adequate names, nodded Five Gun, unbending a trifle. First step toward efficiency. Only one thing haven't made clear. Presumably have shotguns and rifles. Why unable drive off these predators yourselves? The mayor laughed bitterly. It would be easy to tell you just arrived on this planet, although the birds are not well known in the other cities either. They are all concentrated in this area. Yes, our sportsmen tried to shoot down the whirly birds. No luck, of course. Imagine the problems you have when one of these forty-foot balls of commotion comes at you. You try to aim, but you can't hold your arms still because of the swirling wind they raise, and then the dust clouds thicken and you're firing wildly and you can't begin to tell which is body and which is feathers anyway. Very well, accepted Charles de Crabbe mercifully. You've made attempt. My first step, therefore, the attachment of high explosives to booby-trapped mannequins. Brought these with me. Great winds of catastrophe. I'm glad you mentioned it before you did it, exclaimed the mayor. We tried that once. The city was six weeks digging out from under the feathers, and it didn't kill the whirlybird. Aren't you exaggerating difficulties encountered in picking up few feathers? Loftily inquired de Crabbe. How do you think we got the name of Featherton? Before the deluge, we were called West Applebury. Then why haven't you attempted to lure them into booby traps outside town? Could detonate them there without even slight inconvenience of picking up feathers? Believe me, if there were only a few feathers, insisted Mayor Prince, few enough for you to pick up by yourself, we wouldn't mind you blowing up a whirlybird. Wasn't considering picking up any feathers, replied Five Gun with dignity. Had supposed a menial or two could be supplied for that. The mayor shook his head. It would take everybody in town to clean up. 
And as for blowing one up outside the city, one of our orchardists tried it. He blew it to bits all right, but 80 acres of his apple trees were smothered under the debris. Now I anticipate that the extermination of the whirly birds will almost certainly take me up to two days, conceded Five Gun to Crab calmly. However, it will be all the more interesting to defeat them without recourse to large explosives. Gee, what a man, admired the mayor's son. Only two days. If you will now lead me to your city park, we'll begin campaign of extermination at once. It's down that way, said the mayor, pointing. Plainly, he had no intention of leaving the shelter of the Marquis. You can't miss it. As five-gun Charles de Crab leaped back into his craft and started off, the mayor's son called after him. Aren't you scared, going out exposed like that? De Crab turned. An armed young man, he retorted severely. Yeah, but those whirly birds don't pay any attention to guns. Soon will, de Crab replied, unruffled. Slowly, he drove down the center of the empty street, receiving more cheers from heads thrust out of windows. He arrived at the city park and turned in. He unloaded most of his equipment under the roof of the bandstand. A few minutes later, one of the robot mannequins moved slowly around the clearing before the bandstand, its controls set for slow walking to conserve its atomic battery. The predator hunter unlimbered all his guns as he sat under the bandstand roof, waiting. It was an hour before the first whirlybird attacked. His first warning was the rising wind. His gaze moved around the sky until he found the rapidly growing black spot. A few seconds later, it became a universe-engulfing blackness as it spotted the mannequin and came down for it. As soon as the wind-screaming blackness reached the mannequin, the needle guns in his hands emptied their hundreds of anesthetizing needles into the turbulence. But it was as the mayor had said. Where did the bird's body end and the feathers begin? When the needle pistols were empty, he dropped them and snatched up the rocket-powered stun gas weapon. Its immense flare poured into the blackness without visible result. He dropped it and grabbed the N-ray flashburn gun. The 40-foot ball of fury was beginning to rise high with its prey now, as the gun stuttered 50 bolts of the burning lethal radiation into it. He smelled feathers that time. Finally, as the giant bird without faltering rose above the range of the N-ray gun, he took to the explosive pellet rifle. It had only 10 shots. All of these went into the center of the blackness well before the whirly bird had flown beyond range. And as it neared the horizon with its mannequin prey, he heard its sweet song, Coo, coo. How dare it coo after all I did to it, muttered the crab grimly. Shall not coo next time. Half an hour later, a new mannequin stood out in front of the bandstand. Its arms waved ceaselessly, but it stood still. Nestled against its back was a ten-gallon drum of gas, which would be exploded, blanketing most of the park in fumes as soon as the mannequin was moved. Charles de Crab waited, his mask ready, his potent weapon all reloaded. Ninety minutes later, the huge black menace arrived, either the first whirly bird or another forty-foot wind-screaming fury. Flipping his gas mask on, the man waited for the right moment to begin firing. The whirly bird swooped down, the tank exploded in a fog, and the giant wobbled. De Crab emptied all his weapons again. The bird arose, wobbling, its speed greatly impaired, but making its getaway despite all he could do. Damwell didn't coo that time, he said, when the monster had reached the horizon. Next time won't fly, either. But just then, the monstrous bird mocked him in the distance with a loud, sweet, coo, coo. Shortly after lunch, he had it all set up. A new mannequin stood out in front of the bandstand, its arms waving and a pair of slim, gleaming ten-gallon drums of stun gas nearby. It was one o'clock before the third whirlybird struck. Down it sank until it became a huge ebony blot in the afternoon sky. Underneath the bandstand roof, De Crab got ready for his supreme effort. He slipped on his gas mask and made sure his N-ray flashburn gun was ready for instant action, its safety off. He was determined that if he got the bird prostrate, he would climb aboard and fire N-ray bolts into it until something gave. The huge black wind-screaming monster plummeted the last few yards down and grabbed the mannequin. Both tanks of stun gas exploded. The giant whirlybird slumped unconscious and de Crab scrambled aboard. The feverishly hurrying hunter was not long discovering why he had not, and never would, penetrate the bird's feathers with any of his weapons. He burrowed down into the feathers the length of his arm and there were yet more feathers beyond. A feather pillow would stop a rifle bullet, he knew, and this monster had the probable equivalent of a thousand feather pillows protecting it, invulnerable as a battleship. And just then, the man-eater awoke, wobbled into the air, and flew away before de Crab could get off. The following afternoon, as five-gun Charles de Crab made his farewell of the city of Featherton, he once more drove down the center of the street with the bubble of his space convertible slid back. Yet there was a difference this time. The mayor and his son rode beside him on the seat, and all the people were now out of doors, standing along the curb, cheering their deliverer wildly as he passed. "'I can't tell you how much I personally appreciate what you've done for us,' said the mayor humbly. "'Quite, quite, quite,' returned Five-Gun haughtily in his clipped speech, hoping to shut off the man's tendency toward windiness. With awe in his voice, the mayor's son admired. "'So instead of being scared to death, you were all ready for action when you and the whirlybird landed at their Rocky Mountain lair?' 
Yes, yes, yes. Slid off its back, hid between two boulders, waited for the appropriate moment. After bagging that one, waited for other monsters as they landed one by one. Bagged them. Just like that, said the youngster. You just get up close enough for those people hawks to grab you, and then you bag them. Only possible way is my way, flipped to crab immovably. Its eyes couldn't be buried deeply in feathers if they were to be of use. So? So I is proximate to beak and brain, said the hunter with dignity. Where one of its cuckoos came out, one of my Henry bolts went in, and that was that. End of One Whirly Bird's Call by Frank Banta. Recording by Ryan Lohner. The Last Supper by T.D. Ham. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Last Supper by T.D. Ham. Hampered as she was by the child in her arms, the woman was running less fleetly now. A wave of exultation swept over Guldran, drowning out the uneasy feeling of guilt at disobeying orders. The instructions were mandatory and concise. No capture must be attempted individually. In the event of sighting any form of human life, the ship must be notified immediately. All small craft must be back at the landing space not later than one hour before takeoff. Anyone not so reporting will be presumed lost. Goldren thought uneasily of the great seas of snow and ice sweeping inexorably toward each other since the earth had reversed on its axis in the great catastrophe a millennium ago. Now, summer and winter alike brought paralyzing gales and blizzards, heralded by the sleety snow in which the woman's skin-clad feet had left the tracks which led to discovery. His trained anthropologist mind speculated avidly over the little they had gotten from the younger of the two men found nearly a week before, nearly frozen and half-starved. The older man had succumbed almost at once. The other, in the most primitive sign language, had indicated that of several humans living in caves to the west, only he and the other had survived to flee some mysterious terror. Goldren felt a throb of pity for the woman and her child, left behind by the men, no doubt, as a hindrance. But what a stroke of fortune that there should be left a male and female of the race to carry the seed of Terra to another planet. And what a triumph if he, Guldran, should be the one to return at the eleventh hour with the prize. No need of calling for help. This was no armed war party, but the most defenseless being in the universe, a mother burdened with a child. Guldran put on another burst of speed. His previous shouts had served only to spur the woman to greater efforts. Surely there was some magic word that had survived even the centuries of illiteracy, something equivalent to the bread and salt of all illiterate peoples. Cupping his hands to his mouth, he shouted, Food! Food! Ahead of him, the woman turned her head, leapt lightly in mid-stride, and went on, slowing a little, but still running doggedly. Goldren's pulse leapt. He yelled again, Food! The instant that his foot touched the yielding surface of the trap, he knew that he had met defeat. As his body crashed down on the fire-sharpened stakes, he knew, too, the terror from which the last men of the human race had fled. Above him, the woman looked down, her teeth gleaming wolfishly. She pointed down into the pit, spoke exultantly to the child. Food, said the last woman on earth. End of The Last Supper by T.D. Ham. Too Many Eggs by Chris Melville This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cyril Paul Too Many Eggs by Chris Melville Cox, an unusually phlegmatic citizen, came to buy the new refrigerator in the usual fashion. He was looking for a bargain. It was a latest model, fresh from the new production line in Los Angeles, and was marked down considerably below standard. The freezing compartment held 245 pounds of meat. How come so cheap? Cox wanted to know. Frankly, the salesman said, I asked myself that. Usually there's a dent in them or something, when they have that factory tag on them. But I checked it over, and I can't find anything wrong with it. However, she goes as is. At that price, Cox said, I'll take it. It arrived, refinished in a copper colour to his specifications the following Tuesday. It was plugged in and operated perfectly. He checked it out by freezing ice cubes. 
Wednesday evening, when he opened the door to chill some beer, there was a package in the freezing compartment. He took out the package. It was some sort of plastic and appeared to contain fish eggs. Cox had not seen fresh fish eggs, considered by some a delicacy, for a number of years. He chilled the beer and fried the eggs. Both tasted about right. The following Friday, his girlfriend came over to fix dinner for him. And when she looked in the freezing compartment, she said, What is this? Fish eggs, Cox said. How many of them? Two packages. We'll fry them up for breakfast, he said. Saturday morning, there were three packages of eggs in the refrigerator. Where do they come from? His girlfriend wanted to know. They just up here. I ate some and they are very good. She was reluctant, but he talked her into preparing a package. She agreed they were very good. What are you going to do about it? She asked. I don't think there's anything to do about it, he said. I like fish eggs. On Sunday, the package they had eaten Saturday had been replaced. They were coming in at a steady rate of one a day. Cox cooked a package for breakfast and took the other two to his parents. By Tuesday, he was getting tired of the eggs. And by end of the week, he had four more packages. He succeeded in giving two packages to the neighbors. At the end of another week, he had eight packages. He explained to his girlfriend. She suggested they visit all their friends, leaving a package with each of them. At the end of another two weeks, this method of disposing of the eggs had worn thin. They finally managed to give the last two packages to the landlady. At the end of still another week, there were seven more packages. Otherwise, the refrigerator was a good buy. Cox calculated that at the present rate, had he left the packages in the compartment, it would have been filled up by the end of the month. He felt that once that point was reached, the eggs would stop coming. Should this prove to be incorrect, he was prepared to arrange for some method of commercial distribution for the product. On schedule, the eggs stopped coming. He waited two days. No more came. It was over. He ate the last package. The refrigerator worked perfectly and he began to stock it with things freezers are conventionally stocked with. It was almost two weeks after the last package had appeared, early one Sunday morning, when the doorbell rang. At the door was a small, nondescript man with a vaguely and really indefinably unpleasant aspect. His head was bandaged. Mr. Cox, he asked. That's me. May I come in? Come on. The man seated himself. Something terrible has happened, he said. A horrible mistake has been made. I'm sorry to hear that. You look as if you were in an accident. I was. I've been in the hospital for nearly two months. But come to the point, Mr. Cox. I've come about the refrigerator you recently purchased. It was a special refrigerator that was erroneously shipped out of the plant as a second. When it didn't come in, it got shipped out and sold. Good refrigerator, Cox said. Perhaps you've noticed uh, something unusual about it? It runs okay. For a while, there were a bunch of packages of fish eggs in it. Fish eggs? The little man cried in horror. After he had recovered sufficiently, he asked, You do. Of course you do. I'm sure you still have all the little packages. Oh, no, said Cox. No? Oh, my God. What did you do with them, Mr. Cox? Ate them? You... Ate them? Ate? No, you didn't. Not all of them. You couldn't have done that, Mr. Cox. Please tell me you could not have done that. I had to give a lot of them away, and everybody said they were delicious. And really, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh... The little man got unsteadily to his feet. His face was ashen. This is horrible. Horrible. He stumbled to the door. You are a fiend. All our work, all our plans, and you, you... He turned to Cox. I hate you. Oh, I hate you. 
Now see here, Mr. Cox, you'll never realize the enormity of your crime. You've eaten all of us. With that, he slammed the door and was gone. Cox went back to the other room. Who was it, honey? Ah, some nut. Seems he had first claim on the refrigerator. I'll bet it was about the fish eggs. Yeah, he wanted them. Oh dear, do you think he can do anything to us? I don't think so. Not now. It's too late. Cox concluded. We ate them all. End of Too Many Eggs by Chris Melville Recording by Cyril Paul from Mumbai Cellar of the Sky by Dave Dreyfus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Jenkins. Cellar of the Sky by Dave Dreyfus. There have always been the touched, the blesses, God's poor. Such a one was old Arch, Archer Jakes, the wanderer of the plains. They said he was born on earth in 3042 and taken to Mezapa as a child, that he learned pilotage and mining, but that he was injured in a cave-in in Haranti in 3068 or thereabouts, and then his wife died in a landing accident, and his child was taken from him, and adopted by people he never could find. Those things are too far distant in time and space to be verified now, but it is a fact that by 4,000, when my grandfather Hawkington Hammer was growing up in New Oshkosh, Old Archer was a familiar figure in the dome cities of the plains. He looked ancient then, with his deformed back that people touched for luck, in his wild hair and beard and ragged cast-off clothing. On his back he carried a roll of cloth he called his bed, though it looked like no bed any city man had ever seen. In his right hand he carried a staff of wood, unless someone bought it from him and gave him a plastic rod in its place. And in his left he carried what he called a billy can, which was a food container with a loop of wire across the top for a handle and the bottom blackened by what he said was fire. It would have been like no fire any city man had ever seen. Even the water in the can would be poison to a city man. When he came in the airlocks, the guards would make him throw it away. Why the lock? he demanded, coming into a city. Why the lock and why the plastic bubble all over? Why the guards? There's no pollution. Am I not alive? The guards would touch his hump and make circular motions at the sides of their heads, and raise their eyebrows as if to say, Yes, you're alive, but are you not crazy? Still, they would admit him. The only non-resident to walk between the dome cities of the plains, and enter all of them. The only man to pass unharmed through the camps of the outsiders, who lived in the open on the plains, at the heart of the North American continent of Earth. And old Arch would go to the residence buildings, and he'd knock on someone's door, any door, chosen at random. And he'd say, Have you seen the sky? And do you know it's blue? Have you felt the soft kiss of the breezes? I can show you where to breathe fresh air. Maybe the people would say, Phew! Does it smell like you, this fresh air? And slam the door in his face. Or maybe they'd say, Come on around back old man, and we'll find you something to eat. Then old Arch would shoulder his bed and pick up his billy can and his staff and walk down the stairs and go around to the back and walk up the stairs to the rear door. It might be an hour before he appeared there. It might be two. When he did, the people would ask, Why didn't you say something? You should have known they wouldn't let you in the elevator. And twenty flights down and twenty flights up again is too much for a man of your years. Then the next time he came, they would do the same thing again. In the kitchen, he would refuse all the pills and potions and shots and insist on bulky foods. These he would eat neatly, holding aside the long white hair from around his mouth 
and brushing the crumbs from it often. What he couldn't eat right away would go into his blackened billy can. The children would come before he finished. Those of the household and the neighbor's kids, too. First they'd stand shyly and watch him from a doorway. Then they'd press close. By the time he got through, they'd be fighting to sit on his lap. The winner would climb up and sit there proudly. One of the losers, trying to prove he hadn't lost much, might wrinkle up his nose and say, What's that awful stink, old man? And Arch would smile mildly. It's only wood smoke, son. Then the children would ask, What's wood, please, and what's smoke? And he would tell them. He would tell them of the wind and the rain and the snow, of the cattle herds that roamed to the west, and the cities that lay to the east and the stars and the moon they had never seen. He would claim to have been in the endless forests and the treeless plains, and to have tasted the salt ocean and drunk of the freshwater lakes and rivers. The children would have heard, in their lessons from their elders, enough to know what he was talking about. Sometimes they would tire of it and ask him to tell of the distant planets and their far-off suns. But this he would not do. You already hear too much about them, he'd say. I want you to know about Earth, your own country, the one planet on which these plastic-covered cities are unnecessary, where you can actually go out and roll on the grass. Then the children might ask, What's grass? But their fathers would pointedly say, What about the radioactivity, old man? I'm alive, he'd reply. There's no radioactivity out there. But they'd say, How can we be sure? There are individual differences of susceptibility. Probably you are unhurt by dosages that would kill any normal person. And the mothers would say, Eat some more, old man. Eat and go. Bring our baby's dreams, if you like. But don't try to tempt him outside. Even if it isn't radioactive out there. You've admitted it gets hot, and it gets cold, and the wind blows fiercely hard. Our babies were born under shelter. And under shelter they must stay, like us, and our parents before us. So old Arch would brush off his whiskers one last time, and maybe put on an old shirt the father dug up for him, and then go out the back way. In spite of what might have been said, he would have to walk twenty flights down to the ground because he wouldn't be invited to walk through the apartment to the front hall where their elevator was. Sometimes people were hostile when he spoke to their children, and they would have him arrested. Then he was bathed and barbered in the jail and was given new clothes. But they'd always burn his bed, and he'd have trouble getting a new one. And sometimes a jailer might covet the pocket knife he carried, or take away his billy can. On the whole, I think, he preferred not to go to jail, except perhaps in winter, when it was cold outside the city. There are always those ready to talk of asylums, and the need to put him away for his own good but nobody was sure where his legal residence was. So he wasn't really eligible for public hospitalization. He kept to his rounds. My grandfather remembers standing in his mother's kitchen, listening to old Arch. It was like meeting one of Joseph's brethren and being told exactly what the coat looked like. Something exciting out of a dream from the remote past. When all the worlds had had on them, those bright, moist diamonds Arch described as morning dew, my grandfather wanted to see the morning dew, though he knew better than to say so. Old Arch understood. He tried to make the thing possible, but an opportunity to see the morning dew was something he just couldn't give to my grandfather or anybody else. So he decided to sell it. He persuaded a charitable lithographer to make him a batch of stock certificates. They looked very authentic. Each said plainly it was good for one share of blue sky, though the fat, half-draped woman portrayed in three colors stood outside a dome city, pointing not at the sky, but at a distant river, with forested hills behind it. Arch sold his certificates for a stiff price, ten dollars apiece. He could do it, because by this time his wanderings followed a fairly definite route. The people who hated or feared or despised him were pretty well eliminated from it, and most of his calls were at apartments, where he was known and expected, and even respected a little. My grandfather was one of these. 
or rather my great-grandfather's. When Arch first brought his stock certificates, my grandfather was a little fellow. Everybody called Ham, maybe seven years old. He had a sister named Annie, who was five. He'd given me a mental picture of the two of them, standing close together for reassurance, and from an open doorway, shyly watching the old man eat and listening to him talk. When my great-grandfather bought a ten-dollar stock certificate in my grandfather's name, my grandfather took it as a promise, and his little sister Annie was so jealous that the next time old Arch came around, my great-grandfather had to buy a share for her. As they grew to be nine, ten, eleven, twelve, every winter when old Arch would come around, my grandfather and his sister Annie would ask, When are you going to take us to see the sky, Arch? And he would say, When you're older, when your folks say you can go, and when it's summer and not too cold for these old bones. But when my grandfather was fourteen, he followed old Arch out and down the stairs, after the old man had paid his annual call, and he stopped him on a landing to ask, Arch, have you ever taken anyone outside? No, said Arch, sighing. People won't go. I'll go, said my grandfather, and so will my sister Annie. Arch looked at him and put a hand on him and said, I don't want to come between any boy and his parents. Well, said my grandfather, you sold them a share of sky for each of us. Do you really want us to have that? Or you just want to talk about it? Of course I want you to. But I can't take you outside, boy. My grandfather was disgusted. There isn't any sky, he said sadly. It's all talk. The certificates were just for begging. No, said Arch. It's not at all talk, and I'm not a beggar. I'm a guide. But it's hard to see the sky right now because it's winter, and there are clouds all over. Let's see the clouds, then, my grandfather said stubbornly. I've never seen a cloud. The old man sat down on the stairs to consider the matter. I can't do this thing to your parents, he said at last. But you can do it to me and my sister, my grandfather charged wildly. You come to the house year after year and tell us about the sky and the wind and the moon and the dew and the grass and the sun. You can even take money for our share of them. But when it comes time to produce, when we're old enough to go where these things are supposed to be, you think of excuses. I don't believe there are any such things, he shouted. I think you're a liar. I think you ought to be arrested for chipping my dad on the stock deal. And I'm going to turn you in. Don't do that, boy, Art said mildly. Then take us outside, today. It's winter, my boy. We'd freeze. You've said it's pretty in winter. You took the money for the certificates. I suppose you'll grow away from your parents soon, anyhow. I suppose you have to. Get your warmest clothes and meet me at emergency exit four. My grandfather talked it over with his sister Annie. And of course they didn't have any warm clothes. But they'd heard so often from old Arch about the cold that they put on two sets of tights apiece and two pairs of socks and they hunted for the emergency exit. They'd never been there before. They didn't know anyone who had. The signs pointing to it were all worn and defaced. And it was a long way to go. After a while, Annie began to hang back. How do we know the exit will work, she asked. And how will we get back in if we ever do get out? You don't have to come, my grandfather said. But you'll have to find your own way home from here. I'll bet I could, she said. But I'm not going to. I don't think old Arch will even be at the exit. But he was. He looked at them carefully to see how they were dressed. You mean trouble for me, girl, he told Annie. They'll think I took you along to make love to. She had just reached that betwixt and between stage, when she was beginning to look like a woman, but didn't yet think like one. Pooh, she said. I can run faster and hit harder than you can, Arch. You don't worry me a bit. Old Arch sighed and led them through the lock. They stepped out into a raging snowstorm, which soon draped a cloak of invisibility over them. Neither my grandfather nor Annie had ever smelled fresh air before. It threatened to make them drunk. Their nostrils tingled and their eyes misted over and their breath steamed up like bath water. 
for the first time in their lives, they shivered. When the city was out of sight in the storm, they stopped for a moment in the ankle-deep snow and just listened. They held their breaths and heard silence for the first time in their lives. Old Arch reached down and picked up some soft snow and threw it at him. They pelted him back, and then, because he was so old, attacked each other instead, shouting and throwing snowballs and running aimlessly. Old Art soon checked them. Don't get lost, he said. We're walking downhill. Don't forget that. We're going into a draw where there are some trees. He coughed and drew his rags about him. The city is uphill, he said. If you keep walking around it, you'll find a way in. His tone was frightening. And he clung to my grandfather and made him walk close to the old man. It was clear that the old man didn't have enough clothes on. He staggered and leaned hard on my grandfather. They kept moving down the slight grade. They saw no sky and little of anything else. The snow was like a miniature of the city's dome, except that this dome floated over them as they walked. Its edges were only fifty yards off. Where are the outsiders? my grandfather asked. Aren't there people here? They're miles away, Arch told him, and indoors. Only fools and youngsters are out in this blizzard. Fools is right, Annie said tartly. There was supposed to be sky, and there isn't. Old Arch staggered again. To my grandfather, he said, Could you carry my pack? My grandfather took it, and they went on, stumbling blindly through knee-deep drifts, getting more and more chilled and less and less comfortable, till they came to a small clump of trees with a solidly frozen creek running through it. Here, Old Arch made a lean-to shelter of wind-fallen limbs. Annie and my grandfather helped as soon as they understood the design. Arch spread part of his bed over the lean-to, breaking the force of the wind, and put the rest inside. Just outside, on a place scraped bare of snow, he built the first wood fire my grandfather and Annie had ever seen. He chipped ice from the creek and put it in his billy can, and hung the can by its bale over the fire, and in due course they had a little hot tea. The youngsters felt cold but happy. The old man shivered and coughed. He'd kept moving till the tea was made. He sat still to drink it, and couldn't get up. Go to bed, Annie told him. Ham will get on one side of you, and I'll get on the other. We'll keep you warm. Old Arch tried to protest, but he was almost beyond speech. The youngsters didn't know enough to brush the snow off of him or themselves. They helped him roll up in his bedding and crawled under the lean-to after him. They all lay in a heap, getting colder and damper and more miserable, till finally my grandfather couldn't stand it any more. He got up and looked around. The inverted cup of visibility was smaller. Darkness felt like a dye stuff, turning the white snow to gray to black. It was a bitter night, the first he'd ever had outdoors. It was the first Annie ever had the first either had ever spent in the futile task of holding off death. They knew old Arch was dying. As the night wore on, he sank into semi-consciousness. They hugged him and rubbed his lean old limbs. Just before morning, the snow stopped. The old man roused a little, became gradually aware of his surroundings. Go look at the sun, he murmured. Go see the sunrise. They went out to look. Neither had ever seen a sunrise before. It was mauve first then red, then gold, then blue. Venus led the way, and the sun followed. The moon, deep in the west, was like a tombstone to the dead night. A bird chirped. A clot of snow fell from a tree with a soft ruffle of cottony drums. My grandfather held his sister's hand and looked and sniffed at the great earth from which he'd been separated by fear-inspired plastic over his city, so near now, in the clear morning light. He climbed with Annie up the side of the draw and looked out over the snow-covered plains, stretching to a horizon farther away than the longest distance he'd ever imagined. He went back and took old Arch's head up on his knees and said, Is it like this every day? And the old man said, No, each day is different. And my grandfather said, Well, I've seen one anyhow. That's what I've lived for, said old Arch. He smiled and stopped living. Annie and my grandfather left him there and went back to the city and told the guards and their family. A burial party was sent out. Guards in their helmeted spacesuits. People heard about it and followed. 
Everyone was curious, because they'd all seen old Arch and wondered about him. Hundreds of people went out the gate. So many of the guards couldn't stop them. They saw the lean-to, and the open fire, and the woods, and the snow, and the frozen creek. They smelled the air and the smoke. They heard a bird. They tossed snowballs. And then they went back and flung rocks to their city's dome. End of Cellar of the Sky by Dave Dreyfus. Recording by James Jenkins. High Executioner by Ted White and Terry Carr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Jeff Rogers. I Executioner by Ted White and Terry Carr. I always shook when I came out of the arena, but this time the tension wrapped my stomach in painful knots, and salty perspiration stung my neck where I had shaved only a little over an hour earlier. And despite the heavy knot in my stomach, I felt strangely empty. I had never been able to sort out my reactions to an execution. The atmosphere of careful boredom, the strictly business-as-usual air, failed to dull my senses as it did for the others. I could always taste the ozone in the air, mixed with the taste of fear. Whether mine or that of the condemned, I never knew. My nostrils always gave an involuntary twitch at the confined odors, and I felt an almost claustrophobic fear at being packed into the arena with the other 999 citizens on execution duty. I had been expecting my notice for several months before it finally came. I hadn't served execution duty for nearly two years. Usually, it had figured out to every 14 months or so on a rotation, so I'd been ready for it. A little apprehensive, I always am, but ready. At nine o'clock in the morning, still only half awake, I'd purposely slept until the last minute. Vaguely trying to remember the dream I'd had, I waited in front of the arena for the ordeal to begin. The dream had been something about a knife, an operation, but I couldn't remember whether I'd been the doctor or the patient. Our times of arrival had been staggered in our notices, so that a long queue wouldn't tie up traffic, but as usual, the checkers were slow and we backed up a bit. I didn't like waiting. Somehow I have always felt more exposed on the streets, although the brain scanners must be more plentiful in an arena than almost anywhere else. It's only logical that they should be. The scanners are set up to detect unusual patterns of stress in our brain waves as we pass close to them, and thus to pick out as quickly as possible those with incipient or developing neuroses or psychoses, the potential deviates. And where else would such an aberration be as likely to come out as in the arena? I had moved to the front of the short line. I flashed my notification of duty to the checker and was waved on in. I found my proper seat on the aisle in the T section. It was a relief to sink into its plush depths and look the arena over. Once this had been a first-run Broadway theater, first a place where great plays were shown, and then later the more degenerate motion pictures. Those had been times of vicarious escape from reality, times when the populace ruled and yet the masses hid their eyes from the world. Many things had changed since then, with the coming of regulated sanity and the achievement of world peace. Gone now were the black arts of forgetfulness, those media which practiced the enticement of the citizen into irresponsible escape. Now this crowded theater was only a reminder, and a place of execution for those who would have sought escape here. Perhaps thirty people were sitting on the floor of the arena, where once there had been a stage. They sat quietly in chairs, not so different from mine, strapped for the moment into a kind of passive conformity. I looked at them with interest. Strangeness has as much attraction as the familiar at times. As usual, most of them were young, from about ten to the early twenties. But at whatever age, they were rebels. They were potential enemies of society, criminals. Probably some of them hadn't yet realized it but they were on the verge of antisocial insanity, and the brain scanners had singled them out. They were so young. How long does it take a boy to become neurotic, psychotic, dangerous? A flurry of movement at the gates caught my eye. Apparently, at least one of them was a full-fledged rebel. He struggled furiously, 
and the three proctors were having an awkward time carrying him into the arena without hurting him. Then, as they moved into the floodlights, I saw with a faint shock that it was a girl. She was dressed in man's clothing, but betrayed by her neurotic and unsanitary long hair. Long, blonde hair. For a moment I forgot where I was, and allowed myself to revel in this nearly forbidden sight. The soft waves fell halfway down her neck, disarrayed now. The floodlights shined on it, a strangely gentle mockery of sunlight. Something within me stirred, and I almost remembered. Then they were strapping her into one of the chairs, carefully pulling the soft leather straps with their attached metal electrodes around her, pinioning her. One set joined her arms to the armrests, another her legs to the specially devised footrests. Her tunic was opened, and a third set was passed around her chest, the metal plate fastened just under her left breast. And then she was alone. I stared at her, drawn at first to her hair, and then, as my vision focused across the distance, to her eyes. Strange eyes, light blue irises, surrounded by a ring of dark blue and flecked with gold. They were shining. She had been crying. Her eyes seemed to melt, like a pool of clear water growing deeper. I could almost see into them, into the darkness beneath. I was no longer aware of the chair in which I sat, only of her, alone before me, so close. Her eyes widened for just an instant when she recognized me. Bob. Hello, Rosebud. I knew you'd be here. I knew. It's been a long time. I think I was trying to forget. Don't, she said. Don't ever forget. Sun drenched me, and I was rocked back into time. Hey, you pushed me, I shouted at her. Yes, said a faint voice, and then, I'm sorry, the little golden-haired girl said. I sat up. Mother was going to be mad at me again, I knew. I wiped the seat of my pants with my hand, and then stared at the muddy hand with interest. Look, I said to her, and showed her my hand. When she stepped forward to look closely at it, I pushed it at her, and smeared mud onto her face. Then I laughed. My laughter faded, blending with hers. And then, and then we were no longer standing separately in the sun. It was a dark night, the air fresh and cool to my skin, and the leaves of the trees which stretched over us rustled with a faint wind. I laughed again, a soft girlish sound that brought discomfort to the boy's face before me. Your mother says, your father says, don't you ever say anything for yourself, Bob? Look, Rosalie, I'm sorry. Maybe I just don't think the way you do. My father says sex at our age is just another escape from reality. You've got to face yourself as an adult first. He... Your father is a bigger nincompoop than you are, I shouted at him. I thought you said you loved me. I thought you had some feelings buried under that so-called rational mind of yours. Or does your father say you're too young to love somebody? He tried to say something, but I was right. He pressed his lips together and looked away. I was almost enjoying it now. With deliberate coolness, I buttoned up my tunic, feeling the soft fibers on my skin. How long does it take to love somebody? I said, but my voice was beginning to tremble. I turned away from his still figure in the night and began the slow walk back along the path to the house. Tears stung my eyes and spilled onto my cheeks. I started to run through the dark. I slammed the door when I ran in and went directly to my room. At one end of it was a small studio where an easel was lit coldly by a fluorescent light. Almost blindly, I began beating my fists on the still wet canvas, blurring and then ripping the nearly finished portrait of a young man. I was crying quietly when the low, calm voice stopped me on the street. Just a moment, miss. I felt a sudden skip in my heart, which signaled danger, and when I turned, I saw the light green uniform of a proctor in the vague street light. My eyes were still blurred with tears. I couldn't make out his face. I'm sorry, but I'll have to ask you a few questions. Shielding my face from the light, I tried to make my voice calm. I hoped my homesick tears were hidden, that my cheeks wouldn't glisten in the night. I wanted very badly for him not to see I had been crying. Yes? I'll have to know why you're out on the streets at this time of the morning, the proctor said. There's a curfew, you know, 
unless you can show cause. Oh, God, I had completely forgotten the city's curfew. I, I'm sorry, officer. I'm new to the city, and I didn't realize. You're transient? Where are you staying? The Statler Dormitory for Women, I answered meekly. And why are you out at this hour, so far from the dorm? That's down near 34th Street, almost 30 blocks south. I know, I couldn't sleep. His eyes narrowed at that. Had I made a mistake? I plunged on. And I wanted to see Central Park. I didn't realize there was any harm. I guess not this time, miss, but you'd better get back to your dorm. Take this pass. He scribbled a few words on a pad and then detached a slip of green paper for me. You can take a train down to 34th Street. Now. I'd just as soon walk, sir. He stared at me for a moment, and then I turned and started for the nearest subway entrance. It had been horrible those first few days in the dorm. I had never dreamed that a sane society could be so, not cruel, but unthinking. Back home in Woodstock, we were all supposed to be sane too, but neither father nor mother had ever forced any rigid rules on me. They had let me roam the woods, scuffing the dry leaves in autumn, drinking water from the creeks in my cupped hands. They hadn't objected when I was gone for hours. Usually I was just sitting on a log and staring into the sky, and what harm was there in that? They had encouraged my painting. It's supposed to be a sign of escapism, Dad said, but there are a lot worse ways of escaping. He made an easel for me, and I used tubes of house paint, tent colors, and stretched canvas and burlap over frames Dad made. He even gave me a book of reproductions of the old masters that he had saved. Life in Woodstock had been pleasant for me, I realized now, even if it had often seemed lonely. I couldn't have told the proctor that I'd really woken up from a dream about Bob before I'd gone out walking. I'd seen Bob's face so clearly, standing in the night, unable to say anything to me. Suddenly it had seemed that my voice was stopped too, and had woken up gasping. I boarded a local train, not caring that an express would be much faster, and began the trip back to my cubicle at the Statler dorm. If only they hadn't taken my parents. I had succeeded in setting up a makeshift easel in my room at the dorm, and was working on a painting, wearing some of Dad's old clothes, when the proctors broke in. One of them pointed a small indicator at me, glanced at it, and nodded. She's the one. Instability and escapism. And look at the kind of clothes she wears. What are you doing? I whispered. This was how they had taken my parents. You're under detention as a criminal against society, miss, one of the proctors said. We're all sorry. Another one stepped forward and held out a hand to me as one might a child. Come along now. No! I backed away from them, and when they trapped me in the corner, I kicked and screamed at them. Leave me alone! Leave me alone! You're killers! One of them grabbed me and held me around my waist, my arms pinned to my sides. We're not killers, miss, he said and his voice was incredibly calm. We have nothing to do with it. I twisted free and struck at him, tearing skin from his face with my nails. Weren't my parents enough? One of them pointed another device at me, and I blacked out. When I came to, I was being carried by three proctors through a door and down a hall. My head was fuzzy and throbbing. I caught a glimpse of a stenciled sign in the corridor, lettered neatly over an arrow pointing in the direction we were going. The words leaped out at me. Execution Arena Floor. One of the proctors saw that I was conscious and looked down at me pleasantly. No sense struggling now, he said. It'll be over soon. I stared back at him for a moment, not understanding. But then the kindness in his face became clear. He pitied me. The proctors were carrying me as gently as possible as though I were a dog with a broken leg. I felt incredibly sad, and so tired that I was sure I must suddenly weigh twice as much. But they carried me through the door and out onto the floor of the arena, and there were a thousand people up in the dark waiting for me. There were floodlights on the chairs where the others of the condemned were strapped. They sat quietly, dully, as though they were the executioners, and the people above were waiting for them to press the buttons. But it was insane. How could they take it so calmly? Were they dead already? Did they want to die? Or was I really insane? Where was the sanity in this arena? 
I couldn't lie still while they carried me to that chair. I was frightened. I was terrified. They were all so silent, so calm, so kindly, as though nothing at all were happening. Nothing at all. I struggled, trying to fight my way free. I kicked and screamed. I had to make some noise in that black silence. But they held me and strapped me into the chair. And still, there was no sound in the arena. I felt a shock, a tension, and I looked up. There in the audience, sitting before his little panel with the blue light and the red executioner's button, was a young man staring at me. I could feel his stare, like a cool hand touching me. It drew me up into the dimness. I felt my eyes widen with recognition. Bob, I said. His reply sounded deep inside my mind. Hello, Rosebud. I knew you'd be here, I said, and then I drew him close to me. It's been a long time. Don't ever forget, I said, and opened myself to him at last. The lights in the arena dimmed, rose, dimmed again. The first signal I pressed against the straps, but they were firm and unmoving. Yet I, we, leaned forward and watched the panel with its blue light. Our stomach was knotted like tight leather cords. The blue light flashed. I reached out a hand to the small red button. The straps bit into our flesh. The panel was dim, ghostly beneath the glaring lights from the dark above. A thousand hands touched a thousand red buttons. One of them was the first to touch the button, the first to complete the circuit. No one knew who he was. No one even knew if every button was connected. But someone touched a button, and somewhere the circuit was completed. Shock. Pain jerked our body rigid. We screamed. Our skin blistered as hair singed and fell away. And there was a greater shock, a pain somewhere else, as our images cleaved and I fell away from her. I reached out my hand to her and almost felt her touch. But my hand was on the button, and she was slumped in her chair on the floor of the arena. I jerked my hand away from the button as though it were hot electricity. My whole body was moist with perspiration. I stared about me, suddenly and deeply frightened. Which of us had screamed? I had felt it surging up in me, felt it tearing in my throat, bursting from my mouth. But next to me, the others were unconcernedly waiting for me to rise from my seat so that we could file in an orderly fashion from our places in the arena. They had noticed nothing. When I stood up, my legs were trembling. I could still feel where the leather straps had bitten into them. I stepped carefully up the stairs and went out into the morning sunshine. Though the floodlights had been bright in the arena, still the sunlight hurt my eyes. I paused at the door and looked at my ring watch. It was 9.30. Only half an hour had passed. How long does it take to destroy a few spoiled lives? It was over. I forced my breathing into a more normal rate and stepped onto the sidewalk. Don't think about it, I told myself. After all, it had been years earlier that I had really lost her. I had almost made it to the corner when I felt the tap on my shoulder, began to turn, saw the green-sleeved arm extending toward me a familiar black indicator, and heard the proctor say, This is the one, definite case, schizoid condition, latent telepath. We're all sorry, said another of them, and they led me away to face it again. End of I Executioner by Ted White and Terry Carr Recording by Jeff Rogers After the Fire by Lord Dunsinay This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman After the Fire by Lord Dunsinay When that happened, which had been so long in happening, and the world hit a black, uncharted star. Certain tremendous creatures out of some other world came peering among the cinders to see if there was anything there that it were worth while to remember. They spoke of the great things 
that the world was known to have had. They mentioned the mammoth. And presently they saw man's temples, silent and windowless, staring like empty skulls. Some great thing has been here, one said, in these huge places. It was the mammoth, said one. Something greater than he, said another. And then they found that the greatest thing in the world had been the dreams of man. The End of After the Fire by Lord Dunsinay Yesterday's Revenge by H. L. Nichols This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by April Mendes. Yesterday's Revenge by H. L. Nichols. War. Years and decades of slaughter and hate and retrogression, of men against men, machines against machines machines against men in an ever quickening tempo of destruction the world war the war of the wings the war of the rockets the pacifist war the world revolution drowning in the sea of its own blood and at last peace the peace of fear and in this peace cities rose again on the surface of the earth Roads found new ways across the blasted continents. Great ships again safely plied the seas. The skies were burdened with commerce, and everywhere the mighty deserts slowly shrank before the verdancy of nature and the genius of man. But the ground was soaked with blood of the lost generations, marching in endless columns to their sacrifice to hate. The vibrations of the hate were in the very ground beneath the cities. There was bitter hate in the hearts of the men who toiled to build the forms of civilization without its spirit, urged on by the lash, the torture chamber, and the purge. And the focus of all this hatred was the master, protector of the peace, betrayer and dictator of a world. Once he had been the idol of the war-weary millions, as he sent the robots of the pacifist Democrats to victory after brilliant victory, as the regimented subjects of the brigand nations had broken their chains to fight under the banners of the great League of Scientists, who promised peace and freedom and security and as the League itself gave him complete control over the mighty armaments contrived for man's salvation. By the time the last stubborn flame fort had surrendered, he stood upon a dazzling pinnacle of glory, such as men had only dreamed before, and he would not descend to be again a man among men. He refused to return his dread powers to the League when they insisted he imprisoned them, and they escaped to raise his armies and all the peoples against him, shouting the war cries of freedom, so that the whole world seemed to batter against his citadel like a sea of thunder and flame. Yet he alone controlled the robots, and the robots went forth bringing darkness to the sky and fire to the earth. The armies of the people were defeated and scattered, only to fight again from buried strongholds and mountain fastnesses. Then again and again the robots went forth until the continents were shattered deserts and the underground cities great smoking craters open to the sky. While the master's vengeance still flickered through the wastelands, his rebuilding had begun, and now he sat high and secure in his great room of power. It seemed to float as a miraculous companionate of silver above the half-mile peak of the serene tower. There was no sound in this room save the master's breathing, 
but against its outer walls of glass lapped the purr and whisper and whine of millions of horsepower performing their appointed tasks. From the southern port came the drone of a great liner beating its way into the stratosphere, from where the thunder of its released rockets would come to him only as a faint orange streak in a dazzling sky. Through the air also came the hum of hovering taxicopters far below, the muted rumbling of the great moving streets and freightways, and the mutter and the crash and clang of building machines, all dying against this shell of glass. Through the mighty frame of the building itself quivered the vibrations of the giant factories, endlessly fabricating materials for more factories, more cities, more ships of the sky and sea mere power and glory for the master. But these vibrations, too, died in the protections of that tower top. Here, the master assured himself he was safe, safe alike in his life and in his power. For here were the telepathic controls of the ingenious and terrible robots that kept the world securely his. Here, also, were some of the robots themselves, resembling neither machines nor men, as they waited in everlasting patience and vigilance for his activating thought. And lest some danger creep upon him unaware, there were the guard, faithful in their unleashed cruelty and mindless worship, there were the ray screens and thought detectors, and primitive but reassuring. There was the electric lock upon the elevator that was the sole entrance to this room. Only the vibrations of hate beat in. Beat past locks and screens and rays. Beat through glass and steel and plastic. Beat gently, tirelessly, like ripples on a rock. Safe, indeed, was the master, and powerful, beyond all telling, but the master was afraid. On the master's desk, the visiscreen glowed softly into life, and from it, his secretary spoke. Technician Hivecamp, Special Director, Capital Mecho Lab 43, desires an audience in the Room of Power to demonstrate the time visor to your excellency. Has it been inspected by the Director of Precautions? The master's fingers drummed nervously on his desk, and he cast a sidelong glance behind him, although he knew that no human could penetrate the room of power without his orders. No, Your Excellency, it bears a waiver with your signature. No matter, have it inspected and report back at once. The visiscreen faded into lifelessness, and the master returned to his musing. No one in all the history of the world has ever been so powerful as I, he muttered. And yet he knew that in his heart there was a fear, a fear which he had not the courage to face. Again the visiscreen glowed, this time with the image of the director of precautions, who reported, I, Melzit, have inspected the Time Visor Experimental Permit number 445,826 and find it to contain no dangerous elements. It is well, said the master, releasing the elevator lock. Technician Heidkamp may bring it to my presence, accompanied by two of the guard. Remain in communication. A bell rang softly as the elevator rose into view. Technician Heidkamp, a man whose gray-lined face and desolate eyes belied his middle age, gave the salute, then entered wheeling before him a cabinet whose glass panels revealed an intricacy of tubes and wiring in interlacing spirals. Behind him came the giant guards, watchful and impassive. The master watched, smiling secretly as he exulted in his power over Hyde Camp. It was small pleasure to have the right of life and death over the workers who toiled in the depth of the city, 
But here was one of the great minds of all time, whom the master could crush out of existence like an insect. The master's eyes sparkled as he acknowledged the salute of the technician. From the top of the cabinet, Hydecamp lifted the separate eyepiece, its control buttons showing white against the ruby case, and laid it on the master's desk. Again, he saluted. Your Excellency, a year ago you commanded me to construct a machine through which, for your amusement, you could view the past. Night and day I have labored, and now I offer to you the time visor, through which you may view one small segment of the past. That time when the world, long tottering on the brink of disaster, spread too late the wings of war, and hurled itself to its long ruin. From this high place you may see the towers of Manhattan once more piled against the southern sky, in the midst of that vast ancient web of bridges, highways, and villages, with its great harbor filled with the shipping that the War of the Wings has since destroyed. Look downward, and you may follow, hour by hour, the simple life of the old village of Nyack, where our city now stands. Or you may carry it to the ends of the earth, and view the whole crowded world of those other days. The instrument is adjusted to your Excellency's eyes. The lower button regulates the magnification, now set at three diameters. Your Excellency, you have long possessed the present and the future. It is my honor now to offer you the past. Heidkamp paused, his face glowing with the impersonal exultation of the born scientist. The master lifted the instrument toward his eyes, and as he did so, saw on the southern horizon a small cloud, intensely black, and from some forgotten saying there flashed uneasily through his mind the phrase, no larger than a man's hand. But through the eyepiece there was no cloud, but a dawn-cleared sky into which the haphazard towers of the now almost legendary Manhattan lifted their pinnacles. Softened by plumes of drifting smoke and flattered by slanting bars of golden sunlight, long the master looked, and at length, turned the visor directly downward to look through half a mile of empty space at a village sprawled toy-like on a green hill sloping upward from the river. Interested in the town, which had once occupied the land where the serene tower now soared aloft, the master increased the magnification. He had a nightmare sensation of falling with rocket speed, snatched his eyes away and saw that in the south the cloud towered over a third of the horizon, black and ominous. He barked to the watchful image in the visa screen. Tell those fools in the weather department to stop that storm! And again looked down through the visor. He seemed now to be a few feet above a green lawn fronting a trim white house roofed with wooden shingles. On the gravel path stood a girl whose pure young beauty made him catch his breath. She threw back her golden hair and looked directly toward him, her blue eyes wide and fearless. But suddenly the master was jerked back to the present as the floor swayed beneath him, and a fearful crash of thunder entered his eerie, where no outside sound had ever come unbidden. He looked up and saw the great cloud, now overhead, pouring forth torrents of rain which made the companionate seem like a diving bell in a cataract. On the outer surface of the glass was an incessant race of lightning, flashing over the surface in zigzags and spirals, seeking angrily to penetrate the room of power. The visa screen was blank and rimmed with fire, Blue flames and crackling sparks flickered from the machines and the robots, and it seemed to the master that at last his defenses had failed. Now the secret fear which lay hidden at the master's heart grew in power, and he shrank back into his chair while the great negro guards stood like statues of fear, their hair erect and snapping. 
The elements, then, were not wholly under control of the master's mighty science. Nature had broken the chains with which he had thought to bind her. And if the weather control could fail, could not something go wrong, too, with all the master's power and authority? Hydecamp, immobile, watched the master and seemed to guess at his thoughts. Only his eyes betrayed his exultation at the fury of the storm. Only a flicker of the lids, when he looked at the master, shadowed forth a hatred of the man in whose war his only brother had fallen. The man who had negligently said to Hyde Camp, Well, give her to him, man. What's a brown-haired girl? when the master's current favorite had coveted Hydecamp's only daughter. The favorite was dead now, executed at one of the master's whims, and the daughter, too, was dead, refusing to survive her shame and perishing by her own hand. But soon the torrent of rain ceased, the dancing fires vanished, and the lightning thinned and waned. The cloud was breaking under the impact of great rays that lashed out from below, boiling away in harmless beaten puffs, dissolving into the upper air or blowing north like fragments of a vanquished fleet. Belatedly, the weather control operators had reasserted their mastery. Now the master's fear changed to fury. As the visiscreen came on again, he shouted, Intelligence Department at once! Zadol, how did that storm get past our guard screens? Broke them with electric overload? Who calculated the safety factor? Have them executed at once! One of them a woman, no matter. Put the execution on Visa's screen where I can enjoy it. Oh, you hide camp, stand by and see the mildest penalty you technicians can expect. When you fail me. On the visit screen appeared the figures of the shrinking victims, instantly electrocuted by the master's new device which galvanized every separate cell of the human body into a tiny inferno. As the despot's petulant order was executed, he smiled while the guards stood impassive and the murmur of the drenched city drifted through the broken sound screens. Now, Technician Hyde Camp, opener of windows and resurrector of the shattered and the dead, it is your task to prove to me that I saw the real past, not clever trickery. Burdened with the cares of the world, I have forgotten your theories. Explain. With pleasure, Your Excellency. Upon graduation from Midland Technical, I was assigned to vibrochemical work with the London Archaeological Expedition. In Block 44 South, Section 33, we excavated a partially demolished laboratory and library in which we found records of extensive calculations and experiments by which one Dr. Lewis Foster had demonstrated that time is spiral in nature and that the loops of present and past are pressed so closely together that vision and travel from one to the other are theoretically possible. Foster published his findings in 1941, by which time his country was so deep in the agony of the War of the Wings that it was interested in nothing except military science. Dr. Foster hoped to make a time-traveling device to escape the rising tide of slaughter, but before he completed it, cellulant bombs put an end to him and his work. Your Excellency generously condescended to supply me with facilities to investigate these theories. After finding Foster's mechanism to be ineffectual, I experimented with Rodforth rays until I found that the A and F output interlaced at dissonant frequencies and reflected from thionite crystals in matter herd tubes would actually pierce the veil between us and the past. The case upon your desk throws a hollow beam of these dissonances, which it absorbs from the cabinet relays, and within this beam 
Light rays from the adjacent part of the next loop of the time spiral penetrate to the visor, subject to the same laws of optics that hold in our present time. The core of the visor is an ordinarily electrically magnifying binocular with stabilizers. The period of the time coil is 66 years, 105 days, and 9 hours. Therefore, Your Excellency, some minutes ago you were seeing the world as it was at 7 o'clock, May 18th, 1940. For proof that this is indeed so, and not a deception, I can but trust to Your Excellency's own acumen. You speak only of the past, Tide Camp. Can you not show me the loop beyond? The future. The future is not visible, Your Excellency, and I do not believe it yet exists. Through eternity, time stretches backward, and as our instruments grow stronger, it shall yield its secrets. But you are the point at which the spiral builds, and the future waits for your shaping. It is well. Responding to Hyde Camp's subtle flattery, the master's thin lips curled with pleasure as he thought of a future shaped to his will. His hands twisted and twitched as he contemplated his own endless power. Hyde Camp, it is well. The guards will accompany you to the reception chamber. You may go. As the elevator silently started downward, the master returned to the visor, impatiently turning the controls until he again found the white house with the gravel path in the long-forgotten village of Nyack. Long he waited until he could see again the girl to whom he felt so strangely drawn. Darkness fell, and the city became a glory of colored lights around him. But he did not heed as he steadily watched a path that lay sleeping in the afternoon of a beautiful spring day. At last his vigilance was rewarded. A shining four-wheeled roadster stopped before the gravel path and from it alighted the girl and a man. A man who was as tall and blonde and sleepy as the master was small and dark and intense. A man with whom she laughed and talked as they went up the path and into the house. This time, she did not look toward the master at all. The sun of that forgotten day sank behind banks of purple cloud, and as lights glowed throughout the village and from the windows of the house, the watcher from the future remembered from old stories the comfort and intimacy that would be within its walls. He thought of the radiant golden girl whose eyes caressed her companion, the girl whose bearing had the freedom and intelligence which now had almost passed from the women of the world, because like the men they knew themselves absolute slaves of the despot in the tower. The master felt an irrational surge of rage toward the girl, long since dead, whose living body he could behold in the time screen. What right had she to look like that, with open, fearless eyes, oblivious of his power? He slammed the visor down on his desk with a vicious curse. Technician Heidkamp at once! He snarled. In a moment, Heidkamp, gravely saluting, appeared on the visa screen. Heidkamp, you spoke of a time-traveling machine. Can you build me one? That is a far more complex and difficult matter than the building of the visor, Your Excellency. The formulae are not yet complete. In 30 days, you must build me a conveyance to bring a woman to me from 1940, alive and unharmed. But Your Excellency, the formulae, the experiments, the safety factors... Hyde Camp's imperturbability for once was shaken at the master's preposterous demand. The master's breath came fast with rage. Have you forgotten your lesson of this afternoon? If you cannot carry out my instructions, the execution of the weather experts will prove child's play compared to the tortures I shall devise for you. 
Report at 13 tomorrow. He touched the screen into darkness and slept at his desk until the morning sun was high over the city. The rest of the morning, he devoted to conferences with his captains in various parts of the world in regard to their keeping of the peace. His secret police were everywhere and were themselves watched by spies who underwent periodic hypnotic examinations in the master's presence, lest they should be disloyal. So perfect was the organization that nowhere could a man say a word against the master or his peace and be safe from his vengeance. But of late, that vengeance had been withheld as its wielder watched the growth of a revolutionary society, the New Day, whose hope spread among his subjects, swift as fungus through rotting wood. They were building power for his overthrow and for establishment of the democratic world state which he had so falsely promised. And the master was aware that they were the most brilliant and determined antagonists he had known since the establishment of his peace. They had found ways to screen their thoughts against his detectors, but no way to keep his agents out of their organization so that his spies sat in their high councils and betrayed them. So the master deemed himself safe from them, since he would know before they struck, and he leisurely prepared cruel traps for their undoing, and he promised himself that he would make their punishment so fearful that he could count himself safe against another revolt for a generation. But for the while he held his hand. When noon was an hour past, Hyde Camp was ushered into the room of power by the guards. He dared make no further protests, but the muscles of his jaws twitched when the master reiterated his harsh order that the time traveler must be ready within a month and added, This visor has revealed to me a woman whose beauty is worthy of my recognition, and I propose to bring her here for my enjoyment. Mount the instrument on this rangefinder so that I may indicate to you the location of her dwelling. So the observations were made and subsequently checked against plans of the Serene Tower, and it was found that the house and path lay within the impenetrable wall of a vault. In the vault itself, Hyde Camp set up his laboratory, trusting that chance or stratagem would lure the victim to the trap he planned. Here Hyde Camp labored by day and night, seldom stopping even for food. His lean, worn body brought new reserves of strength to the monumental task. It was not fear that drove him on. Hyde Camp was not afraid of death or torture, and after the fate which had befallen his brother and child, he had nothing more to live for. Hyde Camp was driven by hate, hate of the master, for deep in his brain there was a hidden hope that the master, secure and omnipotent beyond the reach of mortal hands or minds in his serene tower, might somehow be vulnerable to contact with the free and dynamic ancient world revealed in the time visor. Had not the storm which had arisen when the master first looked into the visor been perhaps an omen of some ill to befall him through this tampering with time? So the days crept past, while Hyde Camp, in his dungeon laboratory, worked among the giant tubes and shimmering radiances that should open the backward-facing door, and while the master in his eerie brooded darkly over the romance that developed beyond that door, while he waited impotently for the key. For it was spring in Nyack and the girl he sought was clearly and increasingly in love with her virile escort. Hand in hand, they walked the streets of the village, or sped beyond the visor's range in the sleek roadster, while in the high and dreamlike tower, surrounded by miracles of science and of beauty, the master yearned wickedly for the girl who had long been dust, and furiously hated her companion. When but half of the allotted thirty days were passed, he summoned Hyde Camp to the Room of Power for an accounting. Your Excellency, I am pleased to report that I have developed some new plastics in the barrel nickeloid series, which can be charged 
with the Rodforth Matter Herd dissonances so heavily that the rays form a tangible structure in themselves, which takes the shape of the plastic and can be forced into the next loop of time and drawn back again. A cage or cell so composed and charged can be used to entrap your desire and transport her to us, but the apparatus is still primitive and has proved fatal to life and destructive to material. That has been tested. I am working without rest with my assistants to correct the difficulties, but the field is new and progress necessarily slow. We are in hourly hope of finding the right path to success and hope that your excellency will not lose patience with our efforts. Will you be able to move this cage of rays in space as well as time so as to pick her up wherever she may be? No, your excellency. We must set up the plastic mold in our space so as to project the vibration screen to some point upon her lawn. This screen should have no palpable existence in her time. But if she steps within it, we can draw her to us. And now, suddenly, a cunning idea uncoiled itself like a snake in the depths of Hyde Camp's mind. His tone was colorless and submissive as he asked, Perhaps your excellency himself would care to enter the cage and go backward through time in order to invite this woman to enter your world of wonders as your favorite. The master started, and the cords on his forehead bulged with rage. Hey, Camp! Are you a traitor, or are you a fool? You would pay dearly for this treacherous proposal if I did not need your brain to carry forward this work. Hyde Camp's bow was humble. Not your excellency, forgive me. I do not understand. Stupid! shrilled the master. Can you not see that in that old time where all my power is undreamed of, I would be cut off from my robots, my guard, my police, and my armies? In that village, all my power would be naught, and even the mention of it would close me in a madhouse. At the mere thought, the master's voice grew high and thin with terror. Almost, he abandoned the whole project. Yet the thought of the girl with golden hair and fearless eyes returned to him, filling him with eagerness and desire which, jaded by absolute power, he had thought never to feel again. Lure her to the trap, he cried. But if she comes to any harm, you shall repent it in the longest, keenest agony my torturers can devise. Yet the nameless, growing fear grew stronger within the master as the days crept on and Hyde Camp's experiments progressed. The future could not be foreseen. Who could know that the past might not somehow reach darkly toward the master and destroy him? Yet the mad passion inspired by the girl in the time visor gave him no rest. It grew, too, Waxing stronger as Hyde Camp's science gradually placed her nearer to his grasp. And finally, this passion outstripped even the master's fear. Daily, he summoned Hyde Camp to the visa screen, threatened him anew with endless torture if he should fail, and heard with satisfaction Hyde Camp's story of progress. For the genius of the technician, rising to the monstrous demands made upon it by the master, was actually bringing to pass the miracle which he had commanded. When, on the 28th day of the allotted 30, Hyde Camp reported that all was in readiness, the master prepared to leave his lofty haven for the first time in many months. For this expedition, he chose to be accompanied by the robots rather than by the brutal guard. And lest half a mile of steel and glass and air should too much intervene between his thoughts and the telepathic amplifier converter, he had two of the robots carry it between them. These two went into the elevator, but before following them, the master walked slowly around his eerie, appraising what he saw, and beyond that, 
the distances unseen. He had taken over from the pacifist Democrats their plans for the rebirth of a world destroyed by war, and he congratulated himself that he had achieved beyond their dreams. Fair indeed was this great city, rising in miles of mighty windowed ramparts along the western banks of the purple Hudson, and fair indeed were a thousand lesser cities set like jewels around the healing earth. And the vast fruitful farms and terraced orchards dotted with placid lakes and webbed by shining canals stretching to the north to break at last against the desolate shell-torn slopes of the highlands and to the west into the cauldron of the sunset these were things of wonder and beauty too but for all his building and possession of this vast achievement the master knew that nowhere beneath that darkening sky could he count a single friend or any person loyal except through fear or greed and as he turned away he saw the crimson of the west spread over the whole dome of the heavens like a great flame, and the city and the landscape seemed to flow with blood. With a deep foreboding, he shuddered into the elevator, bidding two more robots after him, and rocket-like they plummeted into the depths of the great building, in the safe and familiar light of the phosphine ceiling. Soft as a breath, the swift car came to rest at the level of the upper vaults, and into the blue-lighted corridor issued the strange procession, four strange creatures beyond any man's imaginings, whose very presence made the air electric with menace, two of them bearing the glittering thing that gave them life, the irreplaceable telepath whose structure was known to the master and to no other living man, and within the shelter of their square walked the puissant owner of the world, quick with desire for the woman he hoped to resurrect from the forgotten dead, but still fearful in the memory of the bright flame of the sky and the city drenched in blood. He remembered now that as he had first seen the girl, the heavens had unleashed upon him that great storm, quivering with a concentration of the hate that always subtly beat upon him, and he wondered whether the old gods still lived, and had shown him then a sign, and now another sign. Perhaps, he thought, I should turn back, lest I and my great destiny should be trapped and lost in the dimness of these vaults and the enticements of the past so that I might never again look forth upon the planet that lies crushed beneath my will, or behold the great cold space of twinkling suns that yet may feel my power. But no, this is weakness, for the past is mine as well as the future, and this woman shall be but the first tribute I shall exact. Thus fixed in his determination, he came to the laboratory where Hyde Camp stood alone and tense among the fantastic trappings of his science. In the center of the room was a great cylinder of softly glowing orange, on the warm surface of which danced flecks of silver light. This was the mold into which the whining generators, banked tier on tier in the further shadows, were pouring dissonances to be flung across the incredible emptiness of timelessness to snatch back a living prize. Upon its side, an insulated handle stood out, sharp and black, and around it a faint suggestion of a door showed through the radiance. No spark of hatred showed in Hyde Camp's eyes as he saluted. Your Excellency has arrived within three minutes of the time when the rod first potential will be at maximum. You will observe on the right a visa screen connected through a time visor so as to show the house and its surroundings. Upon the steps sits the girl whom you desire. She is waiting for her escort. I have drawn this black circle upon the screen itself to show where the trap will be sprung. And how will you lure her to the trap? I have taken advantage of your Excellency's authority to obtain from the museums diamonds and other gems that were highly esteemed in her time. Upon the floor of this cylinder, I have placed a heap of these. 
which will be carried backward with the force screed and appear upon her lawn as the trap is set. Unless women were far different then than now, she will come to this glittering bait, penetrating the force screen that will be invisible and harmless while at rest. And then we shall pull the screen and the woman back together so that she shall await the master's pleasure within this glowing cell. The master licked his lips as he watched through the screen the lovely, oblivious face of the girl from bygone ages. Yet there remained a doubt. Hyde Camp, he said abruptly, You have planned well and built skillfully, but I fear that all is not well, and that we perhaps tamper with forces that may rise up and destroy me. If you have any faint doubt of the safety of all this strange machinery, the director Melsit himself cannot entirely vouch for. Speak now, and you may have more time to make sure. But if you are sure, and carry me forward to success, you shall share my power and be heir to all of it. Think well, for this is a price that malice or disloyalty cannot offer. Your Excellency, I am your loyal and careful servant. The potential is at its peak. The bait is within the trap, and I await your word to close the switch that begins the conquest of time itself. Shall I proceed? Close the switch. The whine of the generators died to a whisper. The orange and the silver light sank slowly into the plastics of the cage, as if receding into a measureless depth of water to vanish at last leaving the surface blank and somber. On the screen appeared clearly the image of the beautiful girl from the America of 1940. She was dressed in blue. She rested her chin on her hand as she waited for her lover to appear, and she seemed to be lost in some vague dream. For a minute, she did not look up as, through the magic of Heidkamp's science, there materialized on the lawn the glittering jewels which were to bait the trap. Then she saw them. Her eyes widened. With a smile which bespoke childlike pleasure rather than greed, she jumped up and ran toward the treasure. She came to the edge of the fateful circle, hesitated as if some mystic warning made her pause, and finally stepped within. In the laboratory, Heidkamp and the master watched intently, and as soon as she was well within the trap, Heidkamp swiftly opened the master switch and closed two others. The coruscations of light appeared deep within the cage and expanded until the room was again alive with their radiance. Through the time visor, there appeared upon the screen the house and path and lawn, but the jewels and the girl had vanished, swept forward into time. Hyde Camp, hands shaking as he realized that the miraculous experiment had succeeded, turned the great black handle of the time trap and flung wide the door. Within the cell, the girl huddled against the far wall, hardly knowing what had befallen her, conscious only of the dizzying, sickening shock she had sustained from her transportation into the future. An inarticulate cry of joy burst from the lips of the master. Now his passion for the girl became an avalanche of madness, sweeping away all his fears and cautions. He hurled himself forward into the cage of the time trap, reached blindly for the girl, twisted one hand in her golden hair and pulled her toward him. Blanched and shaking, she held up her hands with a pathetic gesture of pleading horror. Beauty from past ages, cried the master hoarsely and bore down her resistance. He had forgotten Hyde Camp. Quietly, almost reverently, Hyde Camp stepped forward, laid his hand upon the door and closed it. He fingered the master's switch, and as he did so, remembered the forces of the new day, ready to take over power and build at last a true democracy, including all the mechanical glories of the civilization which the master had erected, with the added crown of peace and freedom and happiness for every man on earth. 
This he remembered, and he closed the switch. The light died back within the cage, and in the circle on the time screen appeared the master, so forgetful of all else in his struggles to win the lips of the girl that he was not even aware that he was trapped by time. In his arms, the girl struggled desperately, her feet scattering the wondrous gems upon the grass. A roadster stopped before the house with an abrupt jerk, and the girl's giant lover hurled himself from the driver's seat and laid a violent hand upon the shoulder of the master. For one long, ecstatic instant, Heidkamp could see in the time visor the eyes of the master, stark with his abrupt, dreadful realization. Slowly, Heidkamp picked up a long bar of heavy iron and methodically destroyed the time traveler. First, the long spirals of glowing tubes, then the frail and lifeless structure of the empty cage, and last, the idling generators, their whispers crashing into silence. He ignored the robots, waiting in vigilance for the commands of the master, commands that now would never come, their frantic urgency lost in time. End of Yesterday's Revenge Shandy by Ron Goulart. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Shandy by Ron Goulart. Shandy was a teddy bear, a lion, an ape, a rival for Nancy Tanner's affections, but what else was he? Holman came down out of the forest of giant orange woods and trudged across the plain toward the place where Nancy Tanner lived. It was late afternoon and the woods beyond Nancy's home were already growing dark and dim. The door of the old spaceship was open and a dark flowered rug hung over the rail of the gangway. Late sun glazed the round window near the door, but Holman thought he had seen Nancy behind the strawberry pattern curtains. Wearing a pale blue cotton dress, tan and slender, Nancy came out of the ship and into the low-trimmed grass. She held up one arm and waved once, smiling. Ken, she said, and turned to roll up the rug. Holman said, how you been, as he came near, walking at his usual pace. Setting the rug carefully on the bottom step, Nancy looked up at him. Fine, yourself? Not bad, had a cold last week. Holman put his suitcase down next to the neatly rolled rug. Nancy frowned. You still don't eat enough greens, that's why. Holman kissed her, his hands gentle on her back. Well, here I am, he said. Well, come in and we'll talk. She stepped slowly away from him and went up into the ship. Holman gathered up his suitcase and the rolled rug and followed her. He looked in and all around the kitchen before he entered. Nancy watched him over her shoulder while she got two china cups. She grinned at him as he stepped into the room. I left the rug and my grip in the hole, Holman said, and sat down in a straight-backed chair. Stooping to retie his hiking shoes, he glanced under the table. Made it from the settlement in under four hours, of course, I took big steps. Would you like rum or whiskey or something like that in your coffee? Nancy asked, touching the handle of the coffee pot. School teachers don't drink before sundown. You're on vacation. I'll wait. You go ahead, though. Nancy set a cup in front of him and backed away. You really have a tent in that little suitcase? You're not trying to get me to put you up in here? It's one of those monofilm ones. He pulled the cup closer to him and it rattled in the saucer. I told you my intentions in my letter, and you said okay, so here I am to court you. Holman started to rise. Nancy nodded him down. I suppose it will be all right. I don't know. She went back to the stove. Holman stood and started toward Nancy. He was distracted by a clicking sound in the hallway outside. As he turned to the entranceway, a large tan lion came in, its black-tipped tail swishing slowly. Holman stopped as the lion crossed the kitchen between him and Nancy. Don't panic, Nancy, he said in a calm voice. If nobody moves, it will go away. Nancy smiled. Why should he go away? It's only Shandy. 
The lion nuzzled his head over the backs of Nancy's knees and made a growling, purring sound. The tip of his tail flipped against the smooth white stove. Holman frowned at the lion and dropped back into his chair. Shandy, the last time I saw him he was a St. Bernard dog. Nancy rumpled the lion's mane. Well, you know how Shandy is, he doesn't stay one thing for long. He saw a picture of a lion on a sack of meal last week and off he went. When you're through fondling him, I'd like my coffee, and where's the rum? Gently pushing the leaning lion away from her legs, Nancy said, I'll get it, Ken. She patted Shandy on the back. Go outside and play, Shandy. That's a nice boy. Without looking at Holman, the lion left the kitchen. That's ridiculous, Holman said, turning from the empty doorway. Done it, Ken. He's my pet and I like it. The rum bowl made a hard, flat sound as she put it in front of Holman. You might try to accept him. He's a very nice pet. Holman unscrewed the bottle cap. Love me, love my whatever the hell he is. For somebody who came by to court me, you're not being very pleasant. She poured out two cups of coffee. Looking at the red bowl cap, Holman said, Okay, I'm sorry. You know, Shandy's been with me since I was just ten or so, and since Dad died, Shandy's been a real help. You don't have to live out here. Holman poured some rum into his coffee, just because your father was a naturalist and all. We don't have to talk about my father. I like living here. We've always lived here, since we came out to Enoch. All right, he paused to look across the table at her. You want to keep arguing, or will you let me propose now? Nancy shook her head. Don't know, Ken. Later sometime. You do know, though, that I want you, and you know I want you with me at the settlement. Nancy folded her hands on the white tablecloth. Oh, yes. Holman drank the hot coffee fast, and really, Nancy, I don't see how we could keep something like Shandy in the settlement. Come and have dinner with me tonight, and we'll talk then. Putting down his empty cup, Holman said, I'll go set up my tent at the safe distance. Outside, it was nearly night. A few yards from the ship, the lion was rolling on his back in a patch of yellow flowers and growling to himself. Holman kept his back to the lion while he assembled his tent, and when he had it finished, he went inside and didn't come out until Nancy called him for dinner. The sky, up through the yellow-green leaves, was clear. The afternoon was warm, with a slight feel of coming rain. Homo locked his hands behind his head and half closed his eyes. Living alone by the woods is dangerous, he said. Nancy laughed. You've just eaten lunch in it. Holman closed his eyes, and how do you know what Chandy is? Maybe his boy this place had a bad name in the first place. He's a harmless pet. I'm very fond of him. Didn't your father have any ideas about him? Dad couldn't figure Shandy out. He made all kinds of tests. Shandy's the only one of his kind we ever saw. But see, Dad wasn't sure what he was originally. He's a mimic, an overdone chameleon. I don't know, I like him. Sitting up, Holman said, Okay, he touched Nancy's shoulder. Look, we've known each other, what, over a year now? Since you made that ridiculous field trip with your pupils and trampled all over everything. She tucked her legs under her and leaned toward him. Yeah, so let's not argue or anything, but really, Nancy, I would sort of like to marry you. I know. Have you any idea if you're nearing a decision? Oh, yes. And, well, I think we can. Marry? Mm-hmm. Fine. After he'd kissed Nancy, Holman became aware of a shambling off in the trees beyond their picnic spot. Twigs crackled and a medium-sized gorilla crashed into the open. Holman let go of Nancy and asked her, Shandy? The gorilla was carrying a large book in one paw. Yes, Nancy said, smiling. He's been noising through the storeroom again, must have been in any one of my old picture books. The gorilla came up near their picnic basket and held out the book. He wants me to read to him, Ken. He gets that way now and then. Nancy took the book and opened it to the title page. Earth Fairy Tales. This is one of your favorites, huh, Shandy? Bobbing his gorilla head, Shandy squatted down amongst the fallen leaves and smacked his paws together. Is he intelligent? Ken asked incredulously. His skull began to crawl. Oh no, well, let's start at the very beginning again, Nancy said. 
Chandi rested its head on one clenched paw. Once upon a time, Nancy started. Holman stood and grabbed up his windbreaker. I've heard this one before. I'll drop by your place in the evening. Be finished by then? Nancy half closed the book with her finger as a marker. You're angry? His coat seemed jammed and Holman decided to wear the coat open. No, he walked away into the woods. He was only a few steps into the trees when Nancy started the story again. The fire flared up, brightening the ground around Holman's tent. Nancy hugged her knees up close to her and rested her head on them. He would be out of place at the settlement, she said. Holman dropped a log on the campfire and came back to sit beside the girl. He'd probably be happier running around out here in the woods. Nancy nodded slowly. Probably. The stairs out of the old ship rattled once off in the darkness. Holman looked away from the fire and toward the ship. Coming across the grass toward them was a giant teddy bear. Laughing, Nancy rose. It's Shandy. She glanced at Holman. Be nice to him. Holman watched Shandy approach and didn't answer. The teddy bear sat down like a dropped rag doll next to Nancy. He rubbed his fuzzy brown paws over his black nose and blinked his button eyes at her. Nice old Shandy, said Nancy, pulling one of Shandy's round ears. She smiled at Holman. This is what he was being when Dad and I first found him. Holman, tilting forward, flipped a flat stone into the fire and scattered sparks. That's a coincidence. I was just, you know, about ten, Nancy said, patting Shandy's head. What had happened was I'd been playing in the woods, and anyway, I left my own teddy bear out there, lost it, and I told Dad because it was almost night when I remembered. Well, he found it, and right beside it, there was big old Shandy. Dad and I both decided after looking at him for a while that his name should be Shandy. Shandy blinked his eyes and clapped his paws. Holman's left heel jammed hard against the ground as he shot up. God damn, Nancy, will you knock off all this maudlin banal boy and his dog stuff? We're not taking that monster away anywhere. I know, I know, Ken, don't talk about it now. She kept patting the teddy bear gently. Nice, Shandy. And you, Shandy, Holman shouted. I'm doing the courting around here. Go hibernate or something, damn it. Shandy's eyes stopped blinking. Nancy's hand slipped from his head and trailed down his woolly black as he rolled over and away. Without turning, Shandy started off for the ship, slowly, on all fours. Finally, Nancy looked at Holman. That wasn't nice, Ken. Holman knew that. He could find nothing to say back to Nancy. He frowned and went into his tent, slamming the flap behind him. After closing the storeroom, Holman carried the two old suitcases down the bright corridor to Nancy's kitchen. Nancy smiled at him and then at the brown, scuffed luggage. Oh, sure, those will do, she said. I guess the movers will be able to take care of the heavy stuff. Holman agreed and picked up his half-finished cup of coffee. And we can't leave lots of the stuff here if we're going to use this as a sort of a summer place. I don't think we'll have to worry about vandals. From the doorway, Nancy said, not many girls bring a spaceship as a dowry. Holman took her shoulders and turned her back into the room. We can't make Shandy sort of a watchdog if he ever comes back. It's only little more than a day he's been gone. You were unkind to him. I know. I'm sorry. Nancy edged around him and went to stand by the stove. More coffee? Okay. Holman was halfway to her when the knock sounded on the spaceship door. Maybe it's Shandy, Nancy said, partly surprised, partly relieved. Maybe, I'll get it. When Holman opened the door, a tall, slender young man wearing a conservative suit stepped out of the darkness and into the light of the corridor. He had a neat black mustache and was carrying a big bunch of red and gold forest flowers. Is Miss Nancy at home? Who are you? The young man was standing close to him, but Holman didn't move back. The young man bowed slightly and smiled. Tell Miss Nancy it's Shandy, or better, Mr. Shandy. Christ, said Holman, backing now. Shandy bowed again politely and walked up to the door of the kitchen, knocking on the wall before he entered. Holman jerked himself together when he heard Nancy gasp and ran back to her. 
Chandi was sitting in a kitchen chair, his legs crossed. It's a rather interesting story, Miss Nancy, he said, smiling evenly. Nancy reached out and turned off the stove. I imagine, Shandy brushed each side of his moustache. Well, to begin then, I was in the wood and suddenly I tripped carelessly over a fallen log and was knocked unconscious. When I recovered, I found myself in this state. He paused to rub his head and, of course, I remembered. Looking straight at him, Nancy said, You had amnesia. Yes, you see, Miss Nancy, many years ago, I'm not sure how many, my people lived here and I was quite a prominent member of the ruling class, but I incurred, unfortunately, the wrath of an evil scientist. And, asked Holman, for somebody who'd recently been a teddy bear, Shandy looked pretty dapper. Shandy smiled, she put a spell on me which caused me to change shape and also made me forget what I had originally been. Nancy laughed softly, well, it's good to have you back. With a faint flourish, Shandy held out the wild flowers. For you, Miss Nancy. Why, thank you, Shandy. Holman leaned against the wall under the clock and eyed Shandy. You back to stay? Well, Shandy said, I've known Miss Nancy quite a while and I'm really quite fond of her. I hate to see her go. He looked at the flowers Nancy held against her chest. I have come to ask Miss Nancy to allow me to court her. With all due respects to Mr. Holman. Damn it to hell, Holman said, straightening. Nancy placed the flowers on the table and smiled at Shandy. He stood as she approached him. Nancy laughed and put her arms around the young man. With her head against Shandy's chest, Nancy said, Poor Shandy, poor Shandy. She made him sit down again, then she patted him fondly on the head. Stay right there, Shandy. Nancy hurried from the room. Holman followed her. Listen, are you sure he isn't intelligent? Because, my God, the scientist down on the settlement. Nancy said, Oh, no, Ken, he just copies things he's heard people say. Wait a minute. She disappeared into the storeroom. When she returned, she was holding a dusty album in her hand. Holman followed her back into the kitchen. Shandy looked at the album for a moment and then smiled. I meant well, he said. I knew I recognized you, Nancy said, turning a third through the book. My uncle Maxwell, when he graduated from Mars Yale, she slid the picture out and held it toward Holman, but he didn't take it. Shandy said, hated to see you go. Come to think of it, Holman thought, he does just repeat things people are always saying. Setting the book beside the flowers, Nancy said, what are you really, Shandy? I've never had a chance to talk to you before, except in a one-sided sort of way. Shandy folded his hands and uncrossed his legs. I don't remember just now, Miss Nancy. I used to know. I don't think there are many of us left now. He touched his moustache again, soothing. Maybe in the mountains there are some more. I don't remember. Nancy patted his head. I'm going to marry Ken, Shandy, and live in the settlement. You'll enjoy that. You think you'll stay this way? Holman asked. I might. I don't know. Holman held out his hand to Shandy. Anyway, we want you to stay here and keep a watch over things. Shandy hesitated and then shook hands. I might as well. Holman and Nancy left for the settlement the next morning with the suitcases. Shandy, still in the shape of Uncle Maxwell, they left on the front steps of the ship. He waved goodbye to them. When they were gone, he changed slowly into a large teddy bear. Then, with a moist gleam in his eye, he went back to reading the thick red leather picture encyclopedia in his lap. End of Shandy by Ron Goulart The Piebald Hippogriff by Karen Anderson this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Piebald Hippogriff by Karen Anderson The edge of the world is fenced off stoutly enough, but the fence isn't made that will stop a boy. Johnny tossed his pack and coil of rope over it and started climbing. The top three strands were barbed wire, he caught his shirt as he went over and had to stop for a moment to ease himself off. Then he dropped lightly to the grass on the other side. 
The pack had landed in a clump of white clover. A cloud of disturbed bees hung above, and he snatched it away quickly, lest they should notice the honeycomb inside. For a minute he stood still, looking out over the edge. This was different from looking through the fence, and when he moved it was slowly. He eased himself to the ground, where a corner of rock rose clear of the thick larkspur, and lay on his belly, the stone hard and cool under his chin, and looked down. The granite cliff curved away out of sight, and he couldn't see if it had a foot. He saw only endless blue, beyond, below, and on both sides. Clouds passed slowly. Directly beneath him there was a ledge covered with long grass where clusters of stars bloomed on tall, slender stalks. He uncoiled his rope and found a stout beech tree, not too close to the edge. Doubling the rope around the bowl, he tied one end around his waist, slung the pack on his back, and belayed himself down the cliff. Pebbles clattered, saxifrage brushed his arms, and tickled his ears. Once he groped for a hold with his face in a patch of rustling ferns. The climb was hard, but not too much. Less than half an hour later he was stretched out on the grass with stars nodding about him. They had a sharp, gingery smell. He lay in the cool shadow of the world's edge for a while, eating apples and honeycomb from his pack. When he was finished he licked the honey off his fingers and threw the apple cores over, watching them fall into the blue. Little islands floated along, rocking gently in air eddies. Sunlight flashed on glossy leaves of bushes growing there. When an island drifted into the shadow of the cliff, the blossoming stars shone out. Beyond the shadows, deep in the light-filled gulf, he saw the hippogriffs at play. There were dozens of them, frisking and cavorting in the air. He gazed at them full of wonder. They pretended to fight, stooped at one another, soared off in long spirals to stoop and soar and stoop again. One flashed by him, a golden palomino that shone like polished wood. The wind whistled in its wings. Away to the left, the cliff fell back in a wide crescent, and nearly opposite him a river tumbled over the edge. A pool on a ledge beneath caught most of the water, and there were hippogriffs drinking. One side of the broad pool was notched. The overflow fell sheer in a white plume blown sideways by the wind. As the sun grew hotter, the hippogriffs began to saddle and browse on the islands that floated past. Not far below, he noticed a dozen or so stood drowsily on an island that was floating through the cliff's shadow toward his ledge. It would pass directly below him. With a sudden resolution, Johnny jerked his rope down from the tree above and tied the end to a projecting knob on the cliff. Slinging on his pack again, he slid over the edge and down the rope. The island was already passing. The end of the rope trailed through the grass. He slithered down and cut a piece off his line. It was barely long enough after he had tied a noose in the end. He looked around at the hippogriffs. They had shied away when he dropped onto the island, but now they stood still, watching him warily. Johnny started to take an apple out of his pack, then changed his mind and took a piece of honeycomb. He broke off one corner and tossed it toward them. They fluttered their wings and backed off a few steps, then stood still again. Johnny sat down to wait. They were mostly chestnuts and blacks, and some had white stockings. One was piebald. That was the one which, after a while, began edging closer to where the honeycomb had fallen. Johnny sat very still. The piebald sniffed at the honeycomb, then jerked up its head to watch him suspiciously. He didn't move. After a moment, it took the honeycomb. When he threw another bit, the piebald hippogriff wheeled away, but returned almost at once and ate it. Johnny tossed a third piece, only a few yards from where he was sitting. It was bigger than the others, and the hippogriff had to bite it in two. When the hippogriff bent its head to take the rest, Johnny was on his feet instantly, swinging his lariat. He dropped the noose over the hippogriff's head. For a moment, the animal was too startled to do anything. Then Johnny was on its back, clinging tight. The piebald hippogriff leaped into the air, and Johnny clamped his legs about convulsed muscles. Pinions whipped against his knees, and wind blasted his eyes. The world tilted. They were rushing downward. His knees pressed the sockets of the enormous wings. 
the distant ramparts of the world swung madly, and he seemed to fall upward, away from the sun that suddenly glared under the hippogriff's talons. He forced his knees under the roots of the beating wings, and dug heels into prickling hair. A sob caught his breath, and he clenched his teeth. The universe righted itself about him for a moment, and he pulled breath into his lungs. Then they plunged again. Wind searched under his shirt. Once he looked down. After that he kept his eyes on the flutter of the feather mane. A jolt sent him sliding backward. He clutched the rope with slippery fingers. The wings missed a beat, and the hippogriff shook its head as the rope momentarily checked its breath. It tried to fly straight up, lost way, and fell stiff-winged. The long muscles stretched under him as it arched its back, then bunched when it kicked straight out behind. The violence loosened his knees, and he trembled with fatigue, but he wound the rope around his wrists and pressed his forehead against whitened knuckles. Another kick and another. Johnny dragged at the rope. The tense wings flailed, caught air, and brought the hippogriff upright again. The rope slackened, and he heard huge gasps. Sunlight was hot on him again, and a drop of sweat crawled down his temple. It tickled. He loosened one hand to dab at the annoyance. A new twist sent him sliding, and he grabbed the rope. The tickle continued until he nearly screamed. He no longer dared let go. Another tickle developed beside the first. He scrubbed his face against the coarse fiber of the rope. The relief was like a world conquered. Then they glided in a steady spiral that carried them upward with scarcely a feather's motion. When the next plunge came, Johnny was ready for it, and leaned back until the hippogriff arched its neck, trying to free itself from the pressure on its windpipe. Half choked, it glided again, and Johnny gave it breath. They landed on one of the little islands. The hippogriff drooped his head and wings, trembling. He took another piece of honeycomb from his back and tossed it to the ground, where the hippogriff could reach it easily. While it ate, he stroked it and talked to it, and when he dismounted, the hippogriff took honeycomb from his hand. He stroked its neck, breathing the sweet, warm, feathery smell, and laughed aloud when it snuffled the back of his neck. Tying the rope into a sort of hackamore, he mounted again and rode the hippogriff to the pool below the thunder and cold spray of the waterfall. He took care that it did not drink too much. When he ate some apples for his lunch, the hippogriff ate the cores. Afterward he rode to one of the drifting islands and let his mount graze. For a while he kept by its side, making much of it. With his fingers he combed out the soft flowing plumes of its mane, and examined its hoofs and the sickle-like talons of the forelegs. He saw how the smooth feathers on its forequarters became finer and finer until he could scarcely see where the hair on the hindquarters began. Delicate feathers covered its head. The island glided further and further away from the cliffs, and he watched the waterfall dwindle away to a streak and disappear. After a while he fell asleep. He woke with a start, suddenly cold. The setting sun was below his island. The feathery odor was still on his hands. He looked around for the hippogriff and saw it sniffing at his pack. When it saw him move, it trotted up to him with an expectant air. He threw his arms around the great flat-muscled neck and pressed his face against the warm feathers, with a faint sense of embarrassment at feeling tears in his eyes. "'Good old Patch,' he said, and got his pack. He shared the last piece of honeycomb with his hippogriff and watched the sun sink still further. The clouds were turning red. "'Let's go see those clouds,' Johnny said. He mounted the piebald hippogriff, and they flew off, up through the golden air to the sunset clouds. There they stopped, and Johnny dismounted on the highest cloud of all, stood there as it turned slowly gray, and looked into dimming depths. When he turned to look at the world, he saw only a wide smudge of darkness spread in the distance. The cloud they were standing on turned silver. Johnny glanced up and saw the moon, a crescent shore far above. He ate an apple and gave one to his hippogriff. While he chewed, he gazed back at the world. When he finished his apple, he was about to toss the core to the hippogriff, but stopped himself and carefully took out the seeds first. With the seeds in his pocket, he mounted again. He took a deep breath. "'Come on, Patch,' he said. "'Let's homestead the moon.'" End of the Piebald Hippogriff by Karen Anderson
The Cuckoo Clock by Wesley Barefoot. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Cuckoo Clock by Wesley Barefoot. Death wore the seeming of a battered Chevrolet. The child's scream and the screech of rubber on concrete knifed through two seconds of time before snapping, like a celery stalk of sound, into aching silence. The silence of limbo, called into being for the space of a slow heartbeat. Then the thud of running feet, the rising hubbub of many voices. Give her air. Keep back. Don't try to move her. Somebody call an ambulance. Yeah, and somebody call a cop, too. I couldn't help it. It was the driver of the ramshackle Chevy. She fell off the curb right in front of me. Honest to God, it wasn't my fault. Got to report these things right away, said the gray-haired man beside him. No cause to worry if you ain't to blame. Probably no brakes, said a heavily accented voice, and another spoke as if on cue. Probably no insurance, neither. Let me through. Oh, please. The woman's voice was on the edge of hysteria. She came through the crowd like an automaton, not seeing the people she shoved and elbowed aside. D.O.A., said the woman heavily. Her face was no longer twisted with shock, and she was almost pretty again. D.O.A. Dead on arrival, it means. Oh, Jim, I never knew they said that. Suddenly, there were tears in her blue eyes. There had been many tears now. Take it easy, Jean, honey. Jim Blair hoisted his lank six feet out of the old rocker and crossed the room, running a nervous hand through his corn shuck hair. She's only thirty, he thought and I'm three years older. That's awfully young to have bred three kids and lost them. He took her in his arms. I know how tough it is. It's bad enough for me, and probably worse for you, but at least we're sure they'll never be bomb fodder, and we still have Joanna. She twisted away from him, her voice suddenly bitter. Don't give me that Pollyanna stuff, Jim. Goody, goody, only a broken leg. It might have been your back. There's no use trying to whitewash it. Our kids, our own kids, all gone, dead, she began to sob. I wish I were too. Jean, Jean, I don't care. I mean it. Everything bad has happened since Joanna came to live with us. Darling, you can't blame the child for a series of accidents. I know, she raised her tear-stained face. But after all, Michael drowned. Then Steve, falling off the water tower. Now it's Marion. Her fingers gripped his arm tightly. Jim, each of them was playing alone with Joanna when it happened. Accidents, just accidents, he said. It wasn't like Jean, this talk. Almost, his mind shied away from the word and circled back. Almost paranoid. But Jean was stable, rational, always had been. Still, maybe a little chat with Dr. Holland would be a good idea. Breakdowns do happen. They both turned at the slamming of the screen door. Then came the patter of childish feet on the kitchen linoleum, and Joanna burst into the room. Mommy, I want to play with Marion. Why can't I play with Marion? Jean put her arm around the girl's thin shoulder. Darling, you won't be able to play with Marion for quite a while. You mustn't worry about it now. Mommy, she looked just like she was asleep. Then they came and took her away. Her lips trembled. I'm frightened, Mommy. Jim looked down at the dark eyes, misted now, the straight brown hair, and the little snub nose with its dusting of freckles. She's all we have left, poor kid, and not even ours, really. Helen's baby. He looked up as the battered cuckoo clock on the mantel clicked warningly. Time for little girls to be in bed, Joanna. Run along now like a good girl and get washed. Even as he spoke, the miniature doors flew open and the caricature of a bird popped out shrilly announcing the hour. It cuckooed eight times, then bounced back inside. Joanna watched, entranced. Bedtime, darling, said Jean gently. School tomorrow, remember? And don't forget to brush your teeth. I won't. Good night, Mommy. Good night, Daddy. She turned up her face to be kissed, smiled at them, and was gone. They listened to her footsteps on the stairs. Jim, I'm sorry about the things I said. Jean's voice was hesitant, a little ashamed. It is hard, though. You know it is. Jim, aren't you listening? 
After all, you don't have to watch the clock now. Her smile was as labored as the joke. He smiled back. I think I'll take a walk, honey. Some fresh air would do me good. Jim, don't go. I'd rather not be alone just now. Well, he looked at her, keeping his expression blank. All right, dear. How about some coffee? I could stand another cup. And he thought, tomorrow I'll go. I'll talk to Holland tomorrow. Let me get this straight, Jim. Holland's pudgy face was sober, his eyes serious. You started out by thinking Jean was showing paranoid tendencies, and offhand I'm inclined to agree with you. Overnight, you changed your mind and began thinking that maybe, just maybe, she might be right. Honestly, don't you suspect your own reasons for such a quick switch? Sure I do, Bob, Blair said wordly. Do you think I haven't beaten out my brains over it? I know the idea is monstrous, but just suppose there was a branch of humanity, if you could call it human, living off us unsuspected, a branch that knows how to eliminate competition, almost by instinct. Now hold on a minute, Jim. You've taken Jean's reaction to this last death, plus a random association with a cuckoo clock, and here you are with a perfectly wild hypothesis. You've always been rational and analytical, old man. Surely you can realize that a perfectly normal urge to rationalize Jean's conclusions is making you concur with them against your better judgment. Bob, I'm not through, Jim. Just consider how fantastic the whole idea is. Because of a series of accidents, you can't accuse a child of planned murder, nor can you further hypothesize that all orphans are changelings imbued with an instinct to polish off their foster siblings. Not all orphans, Bob. Not planned murder, either. Take it easy. Just some of them. A few of them. Different. Growing up. Placing their young with well-to-do families somehow, and then dropping unobtrusively out of the picture. And the young growing up, and always the natural children dying off in one way or another. The changeling inherits, and the process repeated, step by step. Can you say it's impossible? Do you know it's impossible? I wouldn't say impossible, Jim, but I would say that your thesis has a remarkably low index of probability. Why don't others suspect, besides you? Jim spread his hands hopelessly. I don't know. Maybe they do. Maybe these creatures, if they do exist, have some means of protection we don't know about. You need more than maybes, Jim. What about Joanna Simmons' mother? According to your theories, she should have been well off, was she? No, she wasn't, Jim admitted reluctantly. She came here and took a job with my outfit, said she was divorced and had lived in New York, then she quit to take a position in California, and we agreed to board Joanna until she got settled. Warrenburg was the town. She was killed there quite horribly, in a terrible auto accident. Have you any reason for suspecting skullduggery, honestly, Jim, or for labeling her one of your human, uh, cuckoos? Only my hunch. We had a newspaper clipping and a letter from the coroner. We even sent the money for her funeral. But those things could be faked, Bob. Give me some evidence that they were faked, and I'll be happy to reinspect your views. Holland levered his avoir du poids out of his chair. In the meantime, relax. Take a trip if you can. Try not to worry. Jim grinned humorlessly. Mustn't let myself get excited, eh? Okay, Bob. But if I get hold of any evidence that I think you might accept, I'll be back. The last laugh and all that. Pending developments, you take it easy, too. Don't let yourself get overworked. Stay out of the sun. So long now. So long, Jim. It was cool in the Warrenburg City Hall, though outside the streets were sizzling. Sorry, Mr. Blair, said the stout motherly woman with the horn-rimmed glasses. We've no record of a Helen Simmons. Nothing whatever. She closed the file with resolute finality. Jim stared at her. Are you sure? There must be something. Mightn't there be a special file for accident cases? She was here in Warrenburg. She died here. The woman thinned her lips, shook her head. If we had any information, it'd be right where I looked. There isn't a thing. Have you tried her last address? Maybe they could tell you something. We can't. I'll try that next. Thanks a lot. Sorry we couldn't help you. He went out slowly. 872 Maple was a rambling frame house 
dozing on a wide, flower-bordered lot. There was nothing sleepy about the diminutive woman who opened the door to Jim's knock. Snapping black eyes peered at him from a maze of wrinkles. A veined hand moved swiftly to smooth down the white hair that framed her face. Looking for someone, young man? Just information, Mrs. Collins, and it's Miss. Don't give out information about guests. You a bill collector? No, Miss Collins. As a matter of fact, I'm trying to check up on an old friend I lost track of. Helen Simmons. She lived at this address for a while. Sure did. Well, come on in, mind you. I don't usually do this, Mr. Blair. Without any fanfare, a bill changed hands. Mr. Blair, well, I can't tell you much. Try that green chair for size. What do you want to know? Jim studied the toe of his right shoe. His eyes were veiled. I heard she was hurt and hard up, and I was worried. My wife and I were friends of hers back east. Hurt? Hard up? Humph. Not likely. Spending all her time driving that English car around, taking trips. I'm not saying she didn't mind her manners, though. Did she have any close friends? She was chummy with Edith Walton, the girl that works for Doc Mendel. He's county coroner in his spare time. No men. Didn't fool around at all. I'd have known. Behind Jim's stony eyes, the pattern took clearer form, as if a mosaic approached completion, a mosaic of carefully planned events that totaled horror. He shivered as the outlines of his hunch filled in. Helen, what creatures were these? Helen, not dead, not poor, carefully planting ostensible proof of her death and going on to a new role, a new life, in London or Paris or Rome, a free, untrammeled life, and her child, if child was the word, in his home, repeating the pattern, eliminating competition as her mother undoubtedly had done. The competition, his and Jean's children, changeling, changeling, no, not that, incubus. He shivered again. Rabbits on your grave, Mr. Blair? He looked up slowly. Sorry, I, I was just wondering, did Miss Simmons have a job while she was here? No, she didn't. One thing she did do was rent a place. Used to be Bland's Hardware. Paid a month's rent, too. Said some friends of hers were planning to open a mortuary. Seemed like a funny way for people to do business, but then, no affair of mine. Funny? No, not funny at all, but icily, eerily logical. There had to be an undertaking parlor where he could send the funeral expenses. He wondered if Helen had laughed when she opened the letter everyone his or her own undertaker, and the carefully cultivated friend in the coroner's office for stationery. He got to his feet. Thanks a lot, Miss Collins. You've been a great deal of help. He almost smiled as he asked. I don't suppose she left a forwarding address. The old head shook decisively. Not a thing. Just packed and left one Monday morning. All the loose ends tied up tight on a Monday morning. Nothing to cause suspicion. Nothing to worry about, only a woman's almost paranoid hysteria and a glance at a clock. Not very much to unmask, Incubus. And what could he do? What could he do? Start talking and land at an institution? Well, there was one thing. Thanks again, Miss Collins. He went out. Swanson didn't look like the general conception of a small-town newspaper man. One knew instinctively that his beard wouldn't have been tobacco-stained even if he'd cared to grow one, and he didn't have a bottle of bourbon in the file marked miscellaneous, or if he did, he didn't bring it out. That never came from my paper, he said precisely. He handed the clipping back to Jim. We don't use that type, for one thing. For another, Miss Simmons, so far as I know, wasn't killed here or anywhere else. You knew her? I knew of her. I never met her. What about this report of her death? Swanson shrugged. Tented manicured fingers. It's a hoax. Any job printing shop with a linotype could do it. In all likelihood, it was some place in San Francisco. That's closest. It would be very difficult to check. His curiosity was showing. I see. Well, thanks for your time and trouble, Mr. Swanson. Not at all. Sorry I couldn't be of more help. One thing to do. One thing that must be done. Motors over the mountains and riding with them the numb resolve. Motors over the salt pans, the wheat lands, the corn belt. 
The stewardess stops again. Coffee, sir? A sandwich, perhaps? I beg your... Oh, no, no thanks. She watches him covertly, uneasily, longing for the end of the run. Motors in the night, and the dull determination growing, strengthening. The airport, baggage, the ancient taxi with the piston slap, and at last the dark, familiar street. Jim, you're back, oh Jim, darling. Next time they send you west, I'm going too. I am. Okay, Jean, sure. Why not? What's the matter, dear? Oh, you're tired, of course. I should have known. Sit down, Jim. Let me get you a drink. In a minute, Jean. Do it now. 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 Where's Joanna? She's in bed, hours ago. Jim, has something... Nothing, dear. I just want to look in on her. And freshen up a bit, of course. Jim. He smoothed away the worried frown with his forefinger. In a minute, dear. She smiled uncertainly. Hurry back, Jim. The stairs unwind irrevocably, slow motion in a nightmare. The bedroom door opens, the hall light dim on the bed and the child's face, incubus in the half-dark. For a moment, Jim remembered wondering somewhere, sometime, what strange powers of protection might be implicit in such a creature. As the thought came into his mind, Joanna stirred. She opened her eyes and looked at him. He took one step toward the bed. The little girl eyes, over their dusting of freckles, slitted. Then they opened wide, became two glowing golden lakes that grew and grew. There was the feeling of a great soundless explosion in his mind, waves of cool burning in his brain, churning and bubbling in every unknown corner, every cranny. Here and there a cell or a group of cells blanked out, the complex molecules reverting, becoming new again ready for fresh punch marks. Synapses shorted with soundless cold fire and waited in timeless stasis for rechanneling. The waves frothed, became ripples, were gone. He stood, unmoving. What was it he was supposed to do? Let's see. Tuck Joanna's blanket around her? But she was covered up snugly, sleeping soundly, too. And for a few seconds, he'd thought she was awake. And Jean was waiting downstairs, Jean and a cool drink. Oh, yes, stop in the bathroom. The stairs wind up again. It is good to be with one's family, relaxed in the well-known chair. Not a worry in the world. He sat there, his mind at ease, not caring much about anything. He didn't even look up when the clock on the mantel whirred and the ridiculous bird popped out of its nest to herald a new day. End of The Cuckoo Clock by Wesley Barefoot Max by William Logan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Max by William Logan. Perhaps it was just as well that I did not tell them what I was. What they called me, that was what started it. I'm as good an American as the next fellow and maybe a little bit better than men like that. Big men drinking in a bar who can't find anything better to do than to spit on a man and call him Mex. As if a Mexican is something to hide or to be ashamed of. We have our own heroes and our own strength, and we don't have to bend down to men like that or any other men. But when they called me that, I saw Red and called them names back. Mex kid, one of the men said, a big, red-haired, bully with his sleeves rolled back and muscles like ropes on the big hairy arms. Snot-nosed little Mex brat. I called him a name. He only laughed back at me and turned his back, waving a hand for the bartender. Maybe in a big city in the north it would be different, and probably it would not. This toleration we hear about is no more good than an open fight and there must be understanding instead. But here, near the border, just on the American side of the border, a Mexican is called fair game, and a 17-year-old like me is less than nothing to them, to the white ones who go to the big bars. 
I thought carefully about what to do, and finally, I had made my mind up. I went for him and tried to hit him, but other men held me back, and I was kicking and shouting with my legs off the ground. When I stopped, they put me down, so I started for the big red-haired man again, and they stopped me again. The red-haired man was laughing all this time. I wanted to run back to my own family in their little house, and yet running would have been wrong. I was too angry to run, so I stayed. My sister, I said, my sister is a witch, and I will get her to put a curse on you. I was very angry. You must understand this. And of course, they had no idea that my sister is a real witch, and her curses are real. And only last year, Manuel Valdez had died from the effects of her curse. Of all people, sometimes I wish I were my sister most of all, to curse people and see them shrivel and sicken and choke and die. Go ahead, half pint. One of the other men yelled, "Get your sister to put a curse on me. I bet she knows who I am. I've been with every Mex girl, this side of the border." This made me see red. My sister is pure and must be pure since she is a witch, and she is not like some of the others. Even aside from that, I have heard her talk about them, and I know. I called him a name and ran up to him and hit him. My fist against his solid side felt good, but some other men pulled me off again. Yet it was impossible to leave. This was wrong for me, and I had to make it right. I shall get my father to fight you, since he is a giant ten feet tall. The men laughed at me, not knowing, of course, that my father is a giant ten feet tall in truth. And my mother, a sweet siren, like those in the books, the old books, with spells in her eyes and a strange power. They did not know I was not a daydreaming child, but a man who told truth. And they laughed. I grew angry again and told them many things, calling them names in Spanish, which they did not understand. That only made them laugh the more. Finally, I left. It was necessary for me to leave since I was not wanted, but it was necessary too for me to make things right. Nights later, they were dead for what they had said and done, for I tell the truth always, and I had told them about my sister and my father and my mother. But one thing I had not told them: I am sorry they could never know I was the winged thing that frightened and killed them, one by one. End of Mex by William Logan. Ultimatum by Roger D. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. In a dingy little Indiana hotel room, the fate of three worlds suddenly hung in precarious balance. Ultimatum by Roger D. Wyatt followed the lanky sheriff down the jail corridor, past rows of empty, plank-walled cells, and drew a sharp breath of relief when they found the last cubicle still tenanted. That's Uncle Ivor, all right, Wyant said. Sorry he caused you so much trouble, Sheriff, and I'll be glad to pay his fine. What's the charge against him? The Sheriff rubbed a palm across his drooping mustache and looked doubtfully at the old man who sat on the edge of the cell bunk, the bald dome of his head cradled dejectedly in his hands. You couldn't rightly say there is a charge, mister, he admitted. Your uncle popped into Ben Stewart's drop-in restaurant night before last with a little black box under his arm, naked as a jaybird, and talking like a crazy man. I'm a visitor from Mars, he said. Take me to your president, and quick. Ben thought he was crazy or drunk, and ran him out with a meat cleaver. And the old duck went down to the Warner Hotel and pulled the same goofy act. Pop Warner called me, and I went down and threw the old coot into the cooler. 
I knew right off that he was cracked, because I even had to show him how to put on the clothes I bought him. And the wingding he pitched when I took the black box away from him. Wow! Wyant shook his head. Poor Uncle Ivor, he said commiseratively. The last time he got away from us, he thought he was Mahatma Gandhi and tried to buy a bus ticket from Cincinnati to New Delhi, India. I found him, finally, in Evanston, Indiana. It's amazing how he got this far south. But then, a mentally unbalanced person can do surprising things sometimes. The sheriff snorted. Unbalanced hell, he said. The old coot's crazy as a bedbug. Just got in from Mars, he said and he wants the President of the United States, on the double. He unlocked the door, and Wyant went inside. It's all right now, Uncle Ivor, he said gently. The old man raised a wrinkled, leathery face, and stared at him uncomprehendingly. Let's go over to my hotel and get a meal and a hot bath, Wyant urged. Then we'll go home again. Ready now? A few minutes later in the jail office, the sheriff pocketed the bill Wyatt gave him and handed over a small lacquered metal box that was surprisingly heavy for its size. Here's your uncle's radio, he said. New fangled model, I reckon. I can't make heads nor tail of it, so I just left it alone. Wyatt lifted the hinge cover and looked inside the box at the neat array of tiny meters and knobs that covered the control panel. A wise decision, Sheriff, he said dryly. Wiser, perhaps, than you'll ever know. The old man stood in the center of Wyant's hotel room, the Sheriff's ill-fitting denims hanging on his slight frame like the cast-off clothing of a scarecrow. The box, he said. His voice, after talking for so long, was a hoarse, rasping croak. Give me the box. Wyant sat in the decrepit wicker chair, holding the box in his lap, his eyes missing no detail of the old man's shrunken figure, with its bald, dome-like head and wrinkled parchment face. I'll give you the box when you tell me something that makes sense, he said. What you've just told me is nothing but a rehash of the story you told the sheriff. That your name is Yardana, and that you are an envoy from Mars, sent to Earth to help scientific authorities develop safe atomic power. Look, I'm a news writer, down here to investigate the rumors of a blue meteorite landing in the hills just north of here, and to check up on the comic accounts I read of your appearance. I went to a lot of trouble and some risk to get you out of jail, and I want a reasonable story for my trouble. What about it now? The old man wrung his hands. Give me the box! Give me the box! Later, Wyant promised. When you give me the real story behind this thing, I'll not only give you back your box, I'll give you a lift out of this burg as well. He looked at the old man sharply. How could a Martian speak the kind of English you've been using? Why should a Martian look so much like an ordinary human being? It doesn't add up. We are of the same rootstock, Yandana said. Intelligent life follows the same evolutionary pattern no matter where it develops, so long as conditions are the same. As for the language, my people have followed your experiments with electromagnetics since their beginning. We know every language of Earth, intimately, through long study of your radio programs. Wyant laughed. Maybe the sheriff was right at that, he said. It's a goofy story, too fantastic for belief. He shrugged and handed the old man the black box. Here's your toy, he said resignedly. I guess that's all I'm going to get for my trouble, just enough misinformation for another tongue-in-cheek article for the Sunday supplements. He picked up his briefcase from the floor and laid it on the corner of the writing table at his elbow. The lift I promise you still goes, if you want it, but it'll have to wait until tomorrow. The old man took the black box eagerly and threw back the cover. 
His fingers flickered over the controls with practiced familiarity. I shall not need your assistance now, he said. His pale eyes met Wyatt's triumphantly. Now that I have the bubble again, I have the means of returning to my ship better than any earthly conveyance could offer. Watch. From the black box swelled a pulsing radiance, a misty, rose-tinted sphere that grew swiftly until it enveloped Yardana in a six-foot bubble of iridescent light. Through its wavering envelope, the old man's face showed taunt and purposeful, its pleading replaced with grim determination. From the black box swelled a pulsing bubble of iridescent light. Print your story, he said. Tell your people about Yardana and his mission. Tell them, too, that their days are numbered from this minute, for in their savage perversion of natural principle into warlike uses, they have forged a menace that threatens the peace of the solar system, and eventually the universe itself. He moved toward the window. The rosy bubble glowed about him. Wyant turned his chair slightly, watching, but he did not rise. My people knew the secrets of the atom, Yardana said, before your own learned to use fire. We built great cities and telescopes when your ancestors were troglodytes, living in caves and eating uncooked meat. We expected no dangerous intelligence to arise on your planet for thousands of years yet, and we paid little attention to your progress until recently, when we learned through your radio broadcasts that you had cracked the atom. We knew then that something was dangerously wrong, that we must investigate quickly before your sudden wisdom put you upon equal footing with us. Today, when you only should be learning to compound gunpowder, we find you applying electromagnetic principles which you cannot possibly understand, and harnessing the atom for the sole purpose of killing greater numbers of your fellow beings. I came here not to aid your scientists in developing the rudiments of the atomic power they have discovered, but to find the reason behind the sudden, freakish intelligence they are displaying. I have discovered that reason. The scientific and political powers of Earth are under the domination and guidance of alien intelligences, enemies bent upon developing a race of Earthmen so warlike and so technically proficient in the waging of war that it must endanger our own Martian culture. Wyatt sat unmoved, his eyes not leaving the Martian's wrinkled face. The bubble hissed audibly, its tiny assertion suddenly loud in the room. Therefore I shall recommend in my report that the human race be completely destroyed, Dardana said. Alone it could not offer a serious threat against us for ages, but led and instructed by these outside intelligences, it must soon surpass our own scientific development. And we must destroy you before you learn the secret of space travel, or we shall be too late to save ourselves. We fought with the peoples of Venus once in ages past for the same reason, and reduced them to inconsequence, if not to extinction, for no sign of intelligent life has been detected upon their world since we blasted it three thousand years ago. When I have made my report, the Council of Elders will recommend the blasting of Earth, and the solar system will be safe again, for our superior Martian civilization, this time forever. When you have made your report, Wyant said, his smile was edged with a sudden secret amusement. But suppose these alien entities prevent your return? He opened the briefcase on the table and put a hand inside it. The Martian laughed harshly. No missile can penetrate a bubble, you fool, he said contemptuously. It is impervious to any earthly weapon. Wyatt laughed in turn, his lips pressed back, flat against his teeth. The repressed hatred of three thousand years spoke in his voice, added pressure to the thrust of his thumb on the stud of the little silver tube in his hand. 
Of course it is, he said, as the sudden crimson ray from the tube disintegrated Martian, box, and bubble alike in a breath. That's why I came prepared, with a Venusian weapon. The End of Ultimatum by Roger D. The Gun by Philip K. Dick This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arthur Trinchera The Gun by Philip K. Dick The captain peered into the eyepiece of the telescope. He adjusted the focus quickly. It was an atomic fission we saw, all right, he said presently. He sighed and pushed the eyepiece away. Any of you who wants to look may do so, but it's not a pretty sight. Let me look, Tance the archaeologist said. He bent down to look, squinting. Good Lord, he leaped violently back, knocking against Doral, the chief navigator. Why did we come all this way, Doral asked looking around at the other men. There's no point even landing. Let's go back at once. Perhaps he's right, the biologist murmured, but I'd like to look for myself, if I may. He pushed past Tance and peered into the site. He saw a vast expanse, an endless surface of gray stretching to the edge of the planet. At first he thought it was water, but after a moment he realized it was slag pitted, fused slag, broken only by hills of rock jutting up at intervals. Nothing moved or stirred. Everything was silent, dead. I see, Fomar said, backing away from the eyepiece. Well, I won't find any legumes there. He tried to smile, but his lips stayed unmoved. He stepped away and stood by himself, staring past the others. I wonder what the atmospheric sample will show, Tant said. I think I can guess, the captain answered. Most of the atmosphere is poisoned, but didn't we expect all this? I don't see why we're so surprised. I think I can guess, the captain answered. Most of the atmosphere is poisoned, but didn't we expect all this? I don't see why we're so surprised. A fission visible as far away as our system must be a terrible thing. He strode off down the corridor, dignified and expressionless. They watched him disappear into the control room. As the captain closed the door, the young woman turned. What did the telescope show, good or bad? Bad. No life could possibly exist. Atmosphere poisoned, water vaporized, all the land fused. Could they have gone underground? The captain slid back the port window so that the surface of the planet under them was visible. The two of them stared down, silent and disturbed. Mile after mile of unbroken ruin stretched out, blackened slag, pitted and scarred, and occasional heaps of rock. Suddenly Nasha jumped. Look, over there at the edge, do you see it? They stared. Something rose up, not rock not an accidental formation. It was round, a circle of dots, white pellets on the dead skin of the planet. A city? Buildings of some kind? Please turn the ship, Nasha said excitingly. She pushed her dark hair from her face. Turn the ship and let's see what it is. The ship turned, changing its course. As they came over the white dots, the captain lowered the ship dropping it down as much as he dared. Piers, he said. Piers of some sort of stone. Perhaps poured artificial stone. The remains of a city. Oh dear, Nasha murmured. How awful. She watched the ruins disappear behind them. In a half circle, the white squares jutted up from the slag, chipped and cracked, like broken teeth. There is nothing alive the captain said at last. I think we'll go back now. I know most of the crew want to. 
get the government receiving station on the sender and tell them what we found and that we... E staggered. The first atomic shell had struck the ship, spinning it around. The captain fell to the floor, crashing into the control table. Papers and instruments rained down on him. As he started to his feet, the second shell struck. The ceiling cracked open, struts and girders twisted, and he bent. The ship shuddered, falling suddenly down, then righting itself as automatic controls took over. The captain lay on the floor by the smashed control board. In the corner, Nasha struggled to free herself from the debris. Outside, the men were already sealing the gaping leaks in the side of the ship, through which the precious air was rushing, dissipating into the void beyond. Help me, Doral was shouting. Fire over here, wiring ignited. Two men came running. Tance watched helplessly, his eyeglasses broken and bent. So there is life here after all, he said, half to himself. But how could... Give us a hand, Fomar said, hurrying past. Give us a hand, we've got to land the ship. It was night. A few stars glinted above them, winking through the drifting silt that blew across the surface of the planet. Doral peered out, frowning. What a place to be stuck in. He was wearing a pressure suit. There were still many small leaks and radioactive particles from the atmosphere that had already found their way into the ship. Nasha and Fomar were sitting at the table in the control room, pale and solemn, studying the inventory lists. Low on carbohydrates, Fomar said. We can break down the stored fats if we want to, but... I wonder if we could find anything outside. Nasha went to the window. How uninviting it looks. She paced back and forth, very slender and small, her face dark with fatigue. What do you suppose an exploring party would find? Fomar shrugged. Not much. Maybe a few weeds growing in cracks here and there. Nothing we could use. Anything that would adapt to this environment would be toxic, lethal. Nasha paused, rubbing her cheek. There was a deep scratch there, still red and swollen. Then how do you explain it? According to your theory, the inhabitants must have died in their skins fried like yams. But who fired on us? Somebody detected us, made a decision, aimed a gun. Engaged distance, the captain said feebly from the cot in the corner. He turned toward them. That's the part that worries me. The first shell put us out of commission. The second almost destroyed us. They were well aimed. Perfectly aimed. We're not such an easy target. True, Fomar nodded. Well, perhaps we'll know the answer before we leave here. What a strange situation. All our reasoning tells us that no life could exist. The whole planet burned dry. The atmosphere itself gone, completely poisoned. The gun that fired the projectile survived, Nasha said. Why not the people? It's not the same. Metal doesn't need air to breathe. Metal doesn't get leukemia from radioactive particles. Metal doesn't need food and water. There was silence. A paradox, Nasha said. Anyhow, in the morning, I think we should send out a search party. And meanwhile, we should keep on trying to get the ship in condition for the trip back. It'll be days before we can take off, Fomar said. We should keep every man working here. We can't afford to send out a party. Nasha smiled a little. We'll send you in the first party. Maybe you can discover what it was you're so interested in. Legumes. Edible legumes. Maybe you can find some of them only... Only what? Only watch out. They fired on us once without even knowing who we were or what we came for. Do you suppose that they fought with each other? Perhaps they couldn't imagine anyone being friendly under any circumstances. What a strange evolutionary trait. Interspecies warfare. Fighting within the race. We'll know in the morning, Fomar said. Let's get some sleep. The sun came up chill and austere. The three people, two men and a woman, stepped through the port, 
dropping down on the hard ground below. What a day, Doral said grumpily. I said how glad I'd be to walk on firm ground again, but... Come on, Nasha said, up beside me. I want to say something to you. Will you excuse us, Tance? Tance nodded gloomily. Doral caught up with Nasha. They walked together, their metal shoes crunching the ground underfoot. Nasha glanced at him. Listen, the captain is dying. No one knows except the two of us. By the end of the day period of this planet, he'll be dead. The shock did something to his heart. He was almost sixty, you know. Doral nodded. That's bad. I have a great deal of respect for him. You will be captain in his place, of course, since you're vice-captain now. No, I prefer to see someone else lead. Perhaps you or Fomar. I've been thinking over the situation, and it seems to me that I should declare myself mated to one of you, whichever of one of you wants to be captain. Then I could devolve the responsibility. Well, I don't want to be captain. Let Fomar do it. Nasha studied him, tall and blonde, striding along beside her in his pressure suit. I'm rather partial to you, she said. We might try it for a time, at least. But do as you like. Look, we're coming to something. They stopped walking, letting Tance catch up. In front of them was some sort of a ruined building. Doral stared around thoughtfully. Do you see? This whole place is a natural bowl, a huge valley. See how the rock formations rise up on all sides, protecting the floor? Maybe some of the great blast was deflected here. They wandered around the ruins, picking up rocks and fragments. I think this was a farm, Tant said, examining a piece of wood. This was part of a tower windmill. Really? Nasha took the stick and turned it over. Interesting. But let's go. We don't have much time. Look, Doral said suddenly. Off there, a long way off. Isn't that something? He pointed. Nasha sucked in her breath. The white stones. What? Nasha looked up at Doral. The white stones. The great broken teeth. We saw them. The captain and I, from the control room. She touched Doral's arm gently. That's where they fired from. I didn't think we had landed so close. What is it? Tant said, coming up to them. I'm almost blind without my glasses. What do you see? The city, where they fired from. Oh. All three of them stood together. Well, let's go, Tant said. There's no telling what we'll find there. Doral frowned at him. Wait. We don't know what we would be getting into. They must have patrols. They probably have seen us already, for that matter. They probably have seen the ship itself, Tant said. They probably know right now where they can find it, where they can blow it up. So what difference does it make whether we go closer or not? That's true, Nasha said. If they really want to get us, we haven't a chance. We have no armaments at all, you know that. I have a hand weapon, Doral said. Well, let's go on then. I suppose you're right, Tance. But let's stay together, Tance said nervously. Nasha, you're going too fast. Nasha looked back. She laughed. If we expect to get there by nightfall, we must go fast. They reached the outskirts of the city at about the middle of the afternoon. The sun, cold and yellow, hung above them in the colorless sky. Doral stopped at the top of a ridge overlooking the city. Well, there it is, what's left of it. There was not much left. The huge concrete piers, which they had noticed were not piers at all, but the ruined foundations of buildings. They had been baked by the searing heat, baked and charred almost to the ground. Nothing else remained. Only this irregular circle of white squares, perhaps four miles in diameter. Doral spat in disgust. More wasted time. A dead skeleton of a city, that's all. But it was from here that the firing came, Tance murmured. Don't forget that. And by someone with a good eye and a great deal of experience, Nasha added. Let's go. 
They walked into the city between the ruined buildings. No one spoke. They walked in silence, listening to the echo of their footsteps. It's macabre, Doral muttered. I've seen ruined cities before, but they died of old age. Old age and fatigue. This was killed, seared to death. This city didn't die. It was murdered. I wonder what the city was called, Nasha said. She turned aside, going up to the remains of a stairway from one of the foundations. Do you think we might find a signpost? Some kind of plaque? She peered into the ruins. There's nothing there, Doral said impatiently. Come on. Wait. Nasha bent down, touching a concrete stone. There's something inscribed on this. What is it? Tance hurried up. He squatted in the dust, running his gloved fingers over the surface of the stone. Letters, all right. He took a writing stick from the pocket of his pressure suit and copied the inscription on a bit of paper. Doro glanced over his shoulder. The inscription was, Franklin Apartments. That's the city, Nasha said softly. That was its name. Tance put the paper in his pocket, and they went on. After a time, Doral said, Nasha, you know, I think we're being watched. But don't look around. The woman stiffened. Oh? Why do you say that? Do you see something? No. I can feel it, though, don't you? Nasha smiled a little. I feel nothing, but perhaps I'm more used to being stared at. She turned her head slightly. Oh. Doral reached for his hand weapon. What is it? What do you see? Tance had stopped dead in his tracks, his mouth half open. The gun, Nasha said. It's the gun. Look at the size of it. The size of the thing. Doral unfastened his hand weapon slowly. That's it, all right. The gun was huge. Stark and immense, it pointed up at the sky a mass of steel and glass set in a huge slab of concrete. Even as they watched, the gun moved on its swivel base, whirring underneath. A slim vein turned with the wind, a network of rods atop a high pole. It's alive, Nasha whispered. It's listening to us, watching us. The gun moved again, this time clockwise. It was mounted so that it could make a full circle. The barrel lowered a trifle, then resumed its original position. But who fires it, Tant said. Doral laughed. No one. No one fires it. They stared at him. What do you mean? It fires itself. They couldn't believe him. Nasha came close to him, frowning, looking up at him. I don't understand. What do you mean it fires itself? Watch, I'll show you. Don't move. Doral picked up a rock from the ground. He hesitated a moment and then tossed the rock high in the air. The rock passed in front of the gun. Instantly the great barrel moved, the veins contracted. The rock fell to the ground. The gun paused, then resumed its calm swivel, its slow circling. You see, Doral said. It noticed the rock as soon as I threw it up in the air. It's alert to anything that flies or moves above ground level. Probably it detected us as soon as we entered the gravitational field of the planet. It probably had a bead on us from the start. We don't have a chance. It knows all about the ship. It's just waiting for us to take off again. I understand about the rock, Nasha said, nodding. The gun noticed it, but not us since we're on the ground, not above. It's only designed to combat objects in the sky. The ship is safe until it takes off again, then the end will come. But what's this gun for? Tance put in. There's no one alive here. Everyone is dead. It's a machine, Doral said. A machine that was made to do a job, and it's doing the job. How it survived the blast, I don't know. On it goes, waiting for the enemy, Probably they came by air in some sort of projectiles. The enemy, Nasha said, their own race. 
It's hard to believe that they really bombed themselves, fired at themselves. Well, it's over with, except right here where we're standing. This one gun, still alert, ready to kill. It'll go on until it wears out. And by that time we'll be dead, Nasha said bitterly. There must have been hundreds of guns like this, Doral murmured. They must have been used to the site. Guns, weapons, uniforms. Probably they accepted as a natural thing, part of their lives, like eating and sleeping. An institution like the church and the state. Men trained to fight, to lead armies, a regular profession. Honored, respected. Tance was walking slowly toward the gun, peering nearsightedly up at it. Quite complex, isn't it? All those veins and tubes. I suppose this is some sort of a telescopic sight. His gloved hand touched the end of a long tube. Instantly the gun shifted, the barrel reacting. It swung. Don't move, Doro cried. The barrel swung past them as they stood rigid and still. For one terrible moment it hesitated over their heads, clicking and whirring settling into position. Then the sounds died out, and the gun became silent. Tant smiled foolishly inside his helmet. I must have put my finger over the lens. I'll be more careful. He made his way up onto the circular slab, stepping gingerly behind the body of the gun. He disappeared from view. Where did he go? Nasha said irritably. He'll get us all killed. Tance, come back, Doral shouted. What's the matter with you? In a minute. There was a long silence. At last the archaeologist appeared. I think I've found something. Come up, I'll show you. What is it? Doral, you said the gun was here to keep the enemy off. I think I know why they wanted to keep the enemy off. They were puzzled. I think I've found what the gun is supposed to guard. Come and give me a hand. All right, Doral said abruptly. Let's go. He seized Nasha's hand. Come on, let's see what he's found. I thought something like this might happen when I saw the gun was... Like what? Nasha pulled her hand away. What are you talking about? You act as if you know what he's found. I do, Doral smiled down at her. Do you remember the legend that all races have? The myth of the buried treasure, the dragon, the serpent that watches it, guards it, keeping everyone away? She nodded. Well? Doral pointed up at the gun. That, he said, is the dragon. Come on. Between the three of them, they managed to pull up the steel cover and lay it to one side. Doral was wet with perspiration when they finished. It isn't worth it, he grunted. He stared into the dark, yawning hole. Where is it? Nasha clicked on her hand lamp, shining the beam down the stairs. The steps were thick with dust and rubble. At the bottom was a steel door. Come on, Tance said excitedly. He started down the stairs. They watched him reach the door and pull hopefully on it without success. Give a hand. All right. They came gingerly after him. Doral examined the door. It was bolted shut, locked. There was an inscription on the door, but he could not read it. Now what? Nasha said. Doral took out his hand weapon. Stand back. I can't think of any other way. He pressed the switch. The bottom of the door glowed red. Presently it began to crumble. Doral clipped the weapon off. I think we can get through. Let's try. The door came apart easily. In a few minutes they had carried it away in pieces and stacked the pieces on the first step. Then they went on, flashing the light ahead of them. They were in a vault. Dust lay everywhere, on everything, inches thick. Wood crates lined the walls, huge boxes, and crates, packages and containers. Tance looked around curiously, his eyes bright. What exactly are all these, he murmured. Something valuable, I would think. He picked up a round drum and opened it. 
A spool fell to the floor, unwinding a black ribbon. He examined it, holding it up to the light. Look at this. They came around him. Pictures, Nasha said, tiny pictures. Records of some kind. Tance closed the spool up in the drum again. Look, hundreds of drums. He flashed the light around. And those crates, let's open one. Doral was already prying at the wood. The wood had turned brittle and dry. He managed to pull a section away. It was a picture. A boy in a blue garment, smiling pleasantly, staring ahead, young and handsome. He seemed almost alive, ready to move toward them in the light of the hand lamp. It was one of them, one of the ruined race, the race that had perished. For a long time they stared at the picture. At last Doral replaced the board. All these other crates, Nasha said. More pictures and these drums. What are in the boxes? This is their treasure, Tance said almost to himself. Here are the pictures, their records. Probably all their literature is here, their stories, their myths, their ideas about the universe. And their history, Nasha said. We'll be able to trace their development and find out what it was that made them become what they were. Doral was wandering around the vault. Odd, he murmured. Even at the end, even after they had begun to fight, they still knew, someplace down inside them, that their real treasure was this, their books and pictures, their myths. Even after their big cities and buildings and industries were destroyed, they probably hoped to come back and find this, after everything else was gone. When we get back home, we can agitate for a mission to come here, Tant said. All this can be loaded up and taken back. We'll be leaving about... He stopped. Yes, Doral said dryly. We'll be leaving about three day periods from now. We'll fix the ship, then take off. Soon we'll be home, that is. If nothing happens, like being shot down by that... Oh, stop it, Nasha said impatiently. Leave him alone. He's right. All this must be taken back home sooner or later. We'll have to solve the problem of the gun. We have no choice. Doral nodded. What's your solution, then? As soon as we leave the ground, we'll be shot down. His face twisted bitterly. They've guarded their treasure too well. Instead of being preserved, it'll lie here until it rots. It serves them right. How? Don't you see? This was the only way they knew building a gun and setting it up to shoot anything that came along by. They were so certain that everything was hostile, the enemy coming to take their possessions away from them. Well, they can keep them. Nasha was in deep thought, her mind far away. Suddenly she gasped. Doral, she said, what's the matter with us? We have no problem. The gun is no menace at all. The two men stared at her. No menace, Doral said. It's already shot us down once. Don't you see? Nasha began to laugh. The poor foolish gun, it's completely harmless. Even I could deal with it alone. You? Her eyes were flashing. With a crowbar, with a hammer or a stick of wood. Let's go back to the ship and load up. Of course we're at its mercy in the air. That's the way it was made. It can fire into the sky shoot down anything that flies, but that's all. Against something on the ground, it has no defenses. Isn't that right? Doral nodded slowly. The soft underbelly of the dragon. In the legend, the dragon's armor doesn't cover its stomach. He began to laugh. That's right. That's perfectly right. Let's go then, Nasha said. Let's get back to the ship. We have work to do here. It was early the next morning when they reached the ship. During the night the captain had died, and the crew had ignited his body, according to custom. They had stood solemnly around it until the last ember died. As they were going back to their work, the woman and the two men appeared, dirty and tired, still excited, and presently from the ship a line of people came, 
each carrying something in his hands. The line marched across the gray slag, the eternal expanse of fused metal. When they reached the weapon, they all fell on the gun at once, with crowbars, hammers, anything that was heavy and hard. The telescopic sights shattered into bits. The wiring was pulled out, torn to shreds. The delicate gears were smashed, dented. Finally, the warheads themselves were carried off and the firing pins removed. The gun was smashed, the great weapon destroyed. The people went down into the vault and examined the treasure. With its metal-armored guardian dead, there was no danger any longer. They studied the pictures, the films, the crates of books, the jeweled crowns, the cups, the statues. At last, as the sun was dipping into the gray mist that drifted across the planet, they came back to the stairs again. For a moment they stood around the wrecked gun, looking at the unmoving outline of it. Then they started back to the ship. There was still much work to be done. The ship had been badly hurt. Much had been damaged and lost. The important thing was to repair it as quickly as possible and get into the air. With all of them working together, it took just five more days to make it spaceworthy. Nasha stood in the control room, watching the planet fall away behind them. She folded her arms, sitting down on the edge of the table. What are you thinking? Doral said. I... nothing. Are you sure? I was thinking that there must have been a time when this planet was quite different, when there was life on it. I suppose there was. It's unfortunate that no ships from our system came this far, but then we had no reason to suspect intelligent life until we saw the fission glow in the sky. And then it was too late. Not quite too late. After all, their possessions, their music, books, their pictures, all of that will survive. We'll take them home and study them, and they'll change us. We won't be the same afterwards. Their sculpturing especially. Did you see the one of the great winged creature, without a head or arms? Broken off, I suppose, but those wings have looked very old. It will change us a great deal. When we come back, we won't find the gun waiting for us, Nasha said. Next time it won't be there to shoot us down. We can land and take the treasure, as you call it. She smiled up at Doro. You'll lead us back here, as a good captain should. Captain? Doro grinned. Then you've decided. Nasha shrugged. Fomar argues too much with me. I think all in all, I really prefer you. Then let's go, Doral said. Let's get back home. The ship roared up, flying over the ruins of the city. It turned in a huge arc and then shot off beyond the horizon, heading into outer space. Down below, in the center of the ruined city, a single half-broken detector vane moved slightly catching the roar of the ship. The base of the great gun throbbed painfully, straining to turn. After a moment, a red warning light flashed on down inside its destroyed works. And a long way off, a hundred miles from the city, another warning light flashed on, far underground. Automatic relays flew into action. On the ground above, a section of metal slag slipped back. A ramp appeared. A moment later, a small cart rushed to the surface. The cart turned toward the city. A second cart appeared behind it. It was loaded with wiring cables. Behind it, a third cart came, loaded with telescopic tube sights. And behind came more carts, some with relays, some with firing controls, some with tools and parts, screws and bolts, pins and nuts. The final one contained atomic warheads. The carts lined up behind the first one, the lead cart. The lead cart started off across the frozen ground, bumping calmly along, followed by the others, moving toward the city, to the damaged gun. End of The Gun by Philip K. Dick Read by Arthur Trinchera